Section 32 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Discourse 9, On the Dolores of Mary. Mary was queen of martyrs, because her martyrdom was longer and greater than that of all the martyrs. Who can have a heart so hard that it will not melt on hearing a most lamentable event, which once happened in the world? There was a noble and holy mother, who had but one only son, and he was the most amiable that could be imagined, innocent, virtuous, beautiful, and most loving towards his mother, so much so, that he never had caused her the least displeasure, but had always showed her all respect, obedience, and affection. Hence the mother had placed on this son all her earthly affections. Now what happened? It happened that this son, through envy, was falsely accused by his enemies, and the judge, although he knew and confessed his innocence, yet that he might not offend his enemies, condemned him to an infamous death, precisely as they had requested him to do. And this poor mother had to suffer the affliction of seeing that amiable and beloved son, so unjustly taken from her, in the flower of his age, by a barbarous death for he was made to die in torment, drained of his blood before her own eyes, in a public place, upon an infamous gibbet. Devout souls, what do you say? Is this case and this unhappy mother worthy of compassion? Already you know of whom I speak. This son so cruelly slain was our loving Redeemer, Jesus, and his mother was the Blessed Virgin Mary, who for love of us was willing to see him offered up, to divine justice, by the barbarity of men. This great pain, then, which Mary suffered for us, a pain which was more than a thousand deaths, merits our compassion and gratitude. And if we can return nothing else for so much love, at least let us for a little time today stop to consider the severity of the suffering by which Mary became queen of martyrs, for her great martyrdom exceeded in suffering that of all the martyrs. Being in the first place, the longest martyrdom, and in the second place, the greatest martyrdom. First point. As Jesus is called King of Sorrows and King of Martyrs, because he suffered in his life more than all the other martyrs, so is also Mary called, with reason, Queen of the Martyrs, having merited this title by suffering the greatest martyrdom that could be suffered, next to that of her son. Hensley she was justly named by Richard of St. Lawrence, the martyr of martyrs, martyr martyrum, and to her may be applied what Isaiah said, He will crown thee with the crown of tribulation, coronans coronabit te tribulatium, for that suffering itself, which exceeded the suffering of all the other martyrs united, was the crown by which she was shown to be the queen of martyrs. That Mary was a true martyr cannot be doubted, as is proved by the Carthusian, Palbart, Carthanus, and others, for it is an established opinion that suffering sufficient to cause death constitutes martyrdom, although death may not then take place. St. John the Evangelist is revered as a martyr, although he did not die in the cauldron of boiling oil, but came out more sound than he went in. Vegetior exiverit, quam interverit. It is sufficient to procure the glory of martyrdom, says St. Thomas, that any one should be obedient even to offer himself to death. Mary was a martyr, says St. Bernard, not by the sword of the executioner, but by the bitter sorrow of her heart. If her body was not wounded by the hand of the executioner, yet her blessed heart was pierced by grief at the passion of her son, a grief sufficient to cause her not only one, but a thousand deaths. And from this we shall see that Mary was not only a true martyr, but that her martyrdom surpassed that of all the other martyrs, for it was a longer martyrdom, and, if I may thus express it, all her life was a long death. The passion of Jesus commenced with his birth, as St. Bernard says, and Mary also, in all things like unto her son, suffered her martyrdom through her whole life. The name of Mary, among its other significations, as the blessed Albertus Magnus affirms, signifies a bitter sea. Mare amarum. Wherefore to her is applied the passage of Jeremiah's. 
great as the sea is thy destruction. Magna est, enim velut mare, contritio tua. For as the sea is all salt and bitter, thus the life of Mary was always full of bitterness, at the sight of the passion of the Redeemer, which was ever present to her. It cannot be doubted that being more enlightened by the Holy Spirit than all the prophets, she better comprehended than they the predictions concerning the Messiah, which they recorded in their holy scriptures. Precisely this the angel revealed to St. Bridget. Whence, as the same angel declared, the virgin knowing how much the incarnate word was to suffer for the salvation of men, even before she became his mother, and compassionating this innocent Savior, who was to be so cruelly put to death for crimes not his own, she commenced, from that time, her great martyrdom. Her grief afterwards increased immeasurably when she was made mother of this Savior, so that at the painful thought of all the sufferings which her poor son was to endure, she indeed experienced, says Rupert the abbot, a long martyrdom, a martyrdom continued through her whole life. And exactly this was signified by the vision which St. Bridget had at Rome, in the church of St. Mary Major, where the Blessed Virgin appeared to her with St. Simeon, and an angel, having a sword which was very long and red with blood, by which was prefigured the long and bitter grief that pierced the heart of Mary during her whole life. Whence the above name Rupert puts into the mouth of Mary the following words. O oh, redeemed souls, and my beloved children, do not pity me only for that hour in which I saw my dear Jesus dying in my presence. For the sword of sorrow, predicted to me by Simeon, pierced my soul during my whole life, when I was giving suck to my son, when I was warming him in my arms, I already saw the bitter death that awaited him. Consider then what long and cruel sorrows I must have endured. Wherefore Mary might truly say in the words of David, My life is wasted with grief, and my years in sighs. My sorrow is continually before me. Dolor meus in conspectu meo semper. My life was wholly passed in grief and tears, for my grief, which was compassion for my beloved son, never departed from before my eyes, seeing, as I did, continually the sufferings and death that he was one day to endure. The Divine Mother herself revealed to St. Bridget that even after the death and ascension of her son into heaven, the memory of his passion, whether she ate or worked, was deeply impressed and ever recent in her tender heart. Tolaris, therefore, says, that Mary passed her whole life in perpetual sorrow, for her heart was always occupied with thoughts of sadness and suffering. So that time, which usually mitigates the sorrows of the afflicted, did not relieve Mary. Nay, time itself increased her sorrow, for as Jesus increased in years, on the one hand, he continually showed himself more lovely and amiable, and on the other, the time of his death was ever drawing nearer, and grief at having to lose him on this earth continually increased in the heart of Mary. As the rose grows up among thorns, said the angel to St. Bridget, so the mother of God advanced in years in the midst of sufferings, and as the thorns increase with the growth of the rose, thus this rose, selected by the Lord, Mary, as she increased in age, was so much more pierced by the thorns of her dolors. Having considered the length of this suffering, let us now pass on to the second point, namely, the consideration of its greatness. Second point. Ah, Mary, was not only queen of the martyrs, because her martyrdom was longer than that of all others, but also because it was the greatest of all. But who can measure its greatness? Jeremiah appears to be unable to find anyone with whom he may compare this mother of sorrows, when considering her great suffering at the death of her son. To what shall I compare thee, or to what shall I liken thee, O daughter of Jerusalem? For great as the sea is thy destruction, who shall heal thee? Wherefore Cardinal Hugo, commenting on these words, says, O blessed virgin, as the bitterness of the sea exceeds all other bitterness, so thy grief surpasses all other griefs. Hence St. Anselm affirms that if God, by a special miracle, had not preserved the life of Mary, her grief would have been sufficient to cause her death at each moment of her life. 
and St. Bernardine of Siena even says, that the grief of Mary was so great, that if it were divided among all men, it would be enough to cause their immediate death. But let us consider the reasons why the martyrdom of Mary was greater than that of all the martyrs. In the first place, it must be remembered that the martyrs suffered their martyrdom in the body by means of fire or steel. Mary suffered martyrdom in her soul, as St. Simeon had before prophesied, and thy own soul a sword shall pierce et tuum ipsius animum per transibit glaudius, as if the holy old man had said to her, O holy virgin, the bodies of the other martyrs will be torn with iron, but thou wilt be pierced and martyred in thy soul by the passion of thy own son. Now as the soul is more noble than the body, so much greater was the suffering of Mary than that of all the martyrs, as Jesus Christ himself said to St. Catherine of Siena, there is no comparison between the sufferings of the soul and the body. Inter dolorum anime et corpus, nulla est comparatio. Whence the holy abbot, Arnold Carnotensis, says, that whoever had been present on Calvary at the great sacrifice of the Immaculate Lamb when he was dying on the cross, would have there beheld two great altars, one in the body of Jesus, the other in the heart of Mary. For there, at the same time that the Son sacrificed his body in death, Mary sacrificed her soul in compassion. Moreover, while the other martyrs, St. Antonius says, suffered by sacrificing their own lives, the Blessed Virgin suffered by sacrificing the life of her Son, whom she loved far more than her own life, so that she not only suffered in spirit all that her son suffered in body, but moreover the sight of the sufferings of her son brought more grief to her heart than if she had endured them all in her own person. There can be no doubt that Mary suffered in her heart all the tortures by which she saw her beloved Jesus tormented. Every one knows that the sufferings of children are also the sufferings of their mothers when they are the witnesses of them. St. Augustine, considering the anguish that the mother of the Maccabees experienced in witnessing the tortures which her sons endured, says, She suffered in them all, because she loved them all, and endured with her eyes what they all endured in the flesh. Thus also was it with Mary. All those scourgings, torments, thorns, nails, and the cross, which tortured the innocent flesh of Jesus, entered at the same time into the heart of Mary to complete her martyrdom. He in the flesh, she in the heart suffered, writes St. Amadeus. Ile carne, ila corde passa est. So that as St. Lawrence Justinian says, the heart of Mary became as it were a mirror of the agonies of her son, in which were seen the spitting, the scourging, the wounds, and all that Jesus suffered. And St. Bonaventure remarks, that these wounds which were scattered all over the body of Jesus were all united in one heart of Mary. The virgin, then through compassion for her son, was scourged, crowned with thorns, insulted, and nailed to the cross. Whence the same saint considering Mary on Mount Calvary, where she was present with her dying son, asks of her, O oh lady, tell me where you then stood, perhaps only at the foot of the cross, might I not rather say, Thou wast on the cross itself, crucified with thy son? And Richard, remarking on the words of the Redeemer, which he spoke by the mouth of Isaiah, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the Gentiles there is not a man with me, adds, O Lord, thou dost rightly say that in the work of human redemption thou didst suffer alone, and there was no man that could pity thee sufficiently, but there was a woman with thee, thy own mother, who suffered in her heart whatever thou didst suffer in thy body. But all this is saying too little of the sorrows of Mary, for as I have before said, she suffered more in seeing her beloved Jesus suffer than if in her own person she had endured all the tortures and the death of her son. Erasmus has written, speaking of parents generally, that they feel the sufferings of their children more than their own, but this is not always true. It was no doubt true of Mary, for she certainly loved her son and his life far more than herself and a thousand lives of her own. Therefore St. Amadeus well declares that the afflicted mother, at the sorrowful sight of the agony of her beloved Jesus, suffered much more than if she herself 
had endured his whole passion. The reason is plain, since, as St. Bernard says, the soul is more where it loves than where it lives. Anima magis est ubi amat, quam ubi animat. And the Savior himself had before said that our heart is where our treasure is. If Mary then, through love, lived more in her son than in herself, in much greater grief did she suffer at the death of her son than if the most cruel death in the world had been inflicted on her. And here it is to be considered that the other circumstance that renders the martyrdom of Mary far greater than the sufferings of all the martyrs, for in the passion of Jesus she suffered much, and she suffered without alleviation. The martyrs suffered under the torments which their tyrants inflicted upon them, but love to Jesus rendered their pains sweet and delightful. A St. Vincent suffered in his martyrdom. He was tortured on the rack, torn with hooks, burnt with red-hot iron plates. But St. Augustine says, One seemed to suffer, and another to speak. Alius vidabatur pati, alius loqui. The saint addressed the tyrant with such power, and with such contempt of his torments, that it seemed as if one Vincent suffered and another Vincent spoke, so greatly did his God, with the sweetness of his love, comfort him in the midst of his sufferings. A St. Boniface suffered, his body was torn with irons, sharp pointed reeds were thrust between his nails and flesh, melted lead was poured into his mouth, and at the same time he could not often enough repeat, I give thanks to thee, O Jesus Christ. Gratias tibi ago, Domine Jesu Christi. A Saint Mark and a Saint Marcellinus suffered. They were bound to a stake, their feet pierced by nails, and the tyrant appealed to them, saying, Miserable beings, look at your condition, and save yourselves from these torments. And they answered, What torments? What pain do you speak of? We have never feasted with more joy than now, when we are suffering with pleasure for the love of Jesus Christ. A St. Lawrence suffered, but while he was burning on the gridiron, the interior flames of love, as St. Leo says, was more powerful to cheer his soul than the flames without were to torture his body. Hence love made him so strong that he even braved the tyrant by saying to him, Tyrant, if you wish to feed on my flesh, a part is sufficiently cooked, turn and eat. Asatum es yam, versa et manduka. But in such torture and lingering death, how could the saint thus exult? Ah, St. Augustine answers, because, intoxicated with the wine of divine love, he felt neither torments nor death. For the holy martyrs, the more they loved Jesus, the less they felt torments and death, and the sight alone of the sufferings of a crucified God was sufficient to console them. But was not our afflicted mother also thus consoled by love for her son and the sight of his sufferings? No, for this very son who suffered was the whole cause of her grief, and the love she bore him was her only and too cruel executioner, for the whole martyrdom of Mary consisted in seeing and pitying her innocent and beloved son, who suffered so much. Therefore the more she loved him, the more bitter and inconsolable was her sorrow. Great as the sea is thy destruction, who shall heal thee? Ah, queen of heaven, love hath alleviated the sufferings of other martyrs, and has healed their wounds. But who has ever soothed thy great sorrow? Who has ever healed the cruel wounds of thy heart? Who will heal thee? Quis medibitur tui? If that same son, who could give thee consolation, was by his sufferings the sole cause of thy sorrows, and the love that thou didst bear him, caused all thy martyrdom. Therefore, whilst the other martyrs, as Diaz remarks, are all represented with the instruments of their passion, St. Paul with the sword, St. Andrew with the cross, St. Lawrence with the gridiron, Mary is represented with her dead son in her arms, because Jesus himself alone was the instrument of her martyrdom, by reason of the love which she bore him. In a few words, St. Bernard confirms all I have said. With the other martyrs, their great love soothed the anguish of their martyrdom. But the more the Blessed Virgin loved, so much the more she suffered, and so much more cruel was her martyrdom. It is certain that the greater is our love for a thing, the greater pain we feel in losing it. 
The loss of a brother certainly afflicts us more than the loss of a beast of burden, and the death of a son more than that of a friend. Now Cornelius Alapide says that to comprehend how great was the grief of Mary at the death of her son, we should comprehend how great was the love she bore him. But who can measure that love? The blessed Amadeus says that in the heart of Mary, two kinds of love to her Jesus were united the supernatural love with which she loved him as her god and the natural love with which she loved him as her son so that of these two loves one only was formed but a love so immense that william of paris even said that the blessed virgin loved jesus to such a degree that a pure creature could not love him more and richard of st lawrence says as there was no love like her love so there was no grief like her grief if, therefore, the love of Mary for her son was immense, immense also must have been her grief in losing him by death. Where love is greatest, says blessed Albertus Magnus, their grief is greatest. Ubi sumus amor, ibi sumus dolor. Let us imagine, then, that the Divine Mother, standing near her son dying upon the cross, and justly applying to herself the words of Jeremiah, says to us, O oh, all ye that pass by the way, attend, and see if there be any sorrow like to my sorrow. O oh, ye that are passing your lives upon this earth, and have no pity for me, stop a while to look upon me, now that I behold that beloved son dying before my eyes, and then see if among all who are afflicted and tormented there be sorrow like to my sorrow. No, answers St. Bonaventure, there can be found no sorrow, O afflicted mother, more bitter than thine, for no son can be found more dear than thine. Ah, there has never been in the world, says St. Lawrence Justinian, a son more worthy of love than Jesus, nor a mother who loved her son more than Mary. If, then, there has never been in the world a love like the love of Mary, how can there be a grief like the grief of Mary? Therefore, St. Ildelphinus does not hesitate to affirm that it was little to say that the sufferings of the Virgin exceeded all the torments of the martyrs, even were they united together. And St. Anselm adds that the most cruel tortures inflicted upon the holy martyrs were light or nothing in comparison with the martyrdom of Mary. St. Basil likewise writes that as the sun surpasses in splendor all the other planets, so Mary in her sufferings exceeded the sufferings of all the other martyrs. A certain learned author concludes with an admirable sentiment, saying, that so great was the sorrow which this tender mother suffered in the passion of Jesus, that she alone could worthily compassionate the death of a God-made man. But St. Bonaventure, addressing the Blessed Virgin, says, O oh lady, why hast thou wished to go and sacrifice thyself also on Calvary? Was not a crucified God sufficient to redeem us, that thou, his mother, wouldest be crucified also? Indeed, the death of Jesus was more than enough to save the world, and also an infinity of worlds. But this good mother wished, for the love she bore us, likewise to aid the cause of our salvation with the merits of sorrows which she offered for us on Calvary. And therefore, says the blessed Albertus Magnus, as we are indebted to Jesus for what he suffered for love of us, we are also to Mary for the martyrdom which she, in the death of her son, voluntarily suffered for our salvation. I have added voluntarily, since, as the angel revealed to St. Bridget, this our so merciful and kind mother was willing to suffer any pain, rather than to see souls unredeemed or left in their former perdition. It may be said that this was the only consolation of Mary in the midst of her great sorrow at the passion of her son, to see the lost world redeemed by his death, and men, who were his enemies, reconciled with God. Grieving, she rejoiced, says Simon da Cassia, because the sacrifice was offered for the redemption of all, by which wrath was appeased. Such love as that of Mary merits our gratitude, and let us show our gratitude by meditating upon and compassionating her sorrows. But of this she complained to St. Bridget, that very few pitied her, and most lived forgetful of her sorrows. I look around upon all who are in the world, if perchance there may be any to pity me, and meditate upon my sorrows, and truly I find very few. 
Therefore, my daughter, though I am forgotten by many, at least do not thou forget me. Behold my anguish, and imitate, as far as thou canst, my grief. In order to understand how much the Virgin is pleased by our remembrance of her dolors, it is sufficient to relate that in the year 1239 she appeared to seven of her servants, who then became the founders of the order of the servants of Mary, with a black garment in her hand, and told them that if they wished to please her, they should often meditate upon her dolors, and therefore she wished, in memory of them, that they would hereafter wear that garment of mourning. And Jesus Christ himself revealed to the blessed Veronica Benasco, that he takes more pleasure, as it were, in seeing his mother compassionated than himself, for thus he addressed her. My daughter, the tears shed for my passion are dear to me, but loving with so great love, my mother Mary, the meditation of the dolors which she suffered at my death, is more dear to me. Wherefore the graces are very great, which Jesus promises to those who are devoted to the dolors of Mary. Pelbart relates that it was revealed to St. Elizabeth, that St. John the Evangelist, after the Blessed Virgin was assumed into heaven, desired to see her again. This favor was granted him. His dear mother appeared to him, and Jesus Christ with her. And he then heard Mary asking of her son some peculiar grace for those who were devoted to her dolors. And Jesus promised her for them the four following special graces. First, that those who invoke the Divine Mother by her sorrows before death will merit to obtain true repentance of all their sins. Second, that he will protect such in their tribulations, especially at the hour of death. Third, that he will impress upon them the memory of his passion, and that they shall have their reward for it in heaven. Fourth, that he will commit such devout servants to the hands of Mary, that she may dispose of them according to her pleasure, and obtain for them all the graces she desires. In proof of this, let us see in the following example how devotion to the dolors of Mary may aid our eternal salvation. Example We read in the revelations of St. Bridget that there was once a Lord as noble by birth as he was low and sinful in his habits. He had given himself by an express compact as a slave to the devil and had served him for sixty successive years, leading such a life as may easily be imagined, and never approaching the sacraments. Now this prince was about to die, and Jesus Christ, in his compassion, commanded St. Bridget to tell his confessor to visit him, and exhort him to make his confession. The confessor went, and the sick man told him that he had no need of a confessor, for that he had often made his confession. The confessor visited him a second time, and that poor slave of hell persevered in his obstinate determination not to make his confession. Jesus again directed the saint to tell the confessor to go to him again. He obeyed, and this third time related to him the revelation made to the saint, and that he had returned so many times because the Lord, who desired to show him mercy, had directed him to do so. On hearing this, the dying man was moved and began to weep. But how, he exclaimed, can I be pardoned, when for sixty years I have served the devil, made myself his slave, and have laden my soul with innumerable sins? Son, answered the father, encouraging him, do not doubt. If you repent of them in the name of God, I promise you pardon. Then beginning to gain confidence, he said to the confessor, Father, I believed myself lost and despaired of salvation, but now I feel a sorrow for my sins, which encourages me to trust, and as God has not yet abandoned me, I wish to make my confession. And in fact, on that day, he made his confession four times with great sorrow. The next day he received communion, and on the sixth he died, contrite and entirely resigned. After his death, Jesus Christ further revealed to St. Bridget, that this sinner was saved and was in purgatory, and that he had been saved by the intercession of the Virgin, his mother. For the deceased, although he had led so sinful a life, yet had always preserved devotion to her dolors. Whenever he remembered them, he pitied her. Prayer O oh, my afflicted mother, queen of martyrs and of sorrows, thou hast shed so many tears for thy son, who died for my salvation, 
And yet, what will thy tears avail me, if I am lost? By the merits, then, of thy dolors, obtain for me a true sorrow for my sins, and a true amendment of life, with a perpetual and tender compassion for the passion of Jesus and thy own sufferings. And if Jesus and thou, being so innocent, have suffered so much for me, obtain for me that I, who am deserving of hell, may also suffer something for love of you. O oh, lady, I will say to thee with St. Bonaventure, If I have offended thee, wound my heart in punishment. If I have served thee, now I beg to be wounded as a reward. It is a shameful thing to see our Lord Jesus wounded, and thee wounded with him, and I uninjured. Finally, O oh my mother, by the grief thou didst experience on seeing thy son before thy eyes, bow his head and expire upon the cross. I entreat of thee to obtain for me a good death. Ah, do not cease, O oh advocate of sinners, to assist my afflicted and struggling soul in that great passage that it has to make into eternity. And because at that time it may easily be the case that I shall have lost the use of speech, with which to invoke thy name, and that of Jesus, who are all my hope. Therefore I now invoke thy son and thee, to succor me at that last moment, and I say, Jesus and Mary, to you I commend my soul. Amen. End of section 32「Section 33 of the Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reflections on each of the seven Dolores of Mary in particular. On the first Dolor of St. Simeon's Prophecy. In this valley of tears every man is born to weep, and every one must suffer those afflictions that daily befall him. But how much more miserable would life be if every one knew also the future evils which are to afflict him? Too unhappy would he be, says Seneca, whose fate was such. The Lord exercises his compassion towards us, namely, that he does not make known to us the crosses that await us, that if we are to suffer them, at least we may suffer them only once. But he did not exercise this compassion with Mary who, because God wished her to be the queen of Dolores, and in all things like his son, and to see always before her eyes, and to suffer continually all the sorrows that awaited her. And those were the sufferings of the passion and death of her beloved Jesus. For St. Simeon in the temple, after having received the divine child in his arms, predicted to her that this child was to be the mark for all the opposition and persecution of men set for a sign which shall be contradicted, and that therefore the sword of sorrow should pierce her soul, and thy own soul a sword shall pierce. The Holy Virgin herself said to St. Matilda that at the announcement of St. Simeon all her joy was changed into sorrow. For, as it was revealed to St. Teresa, the Blessed Mother, although she knew before this that the life of her son would be sacrificed for the salvation of the world, Yet she then learned more particularly and distinctly the sufferings and cruel death that awaited her poor son. She knew that he would be contradicted in all things, contradicted in doctrine, for instead of being believed, he would be esteemed a blasphemer for teaching that he was the son of God, as the impious Caiaphas declared him to be, saying, He hath blasphemed, he is guilty of death. Contradicted in his reputation, for he was noble, of royal lineage, and was despised as a peasant. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? He was wisdom itself, and was treated as an ignorant man. How doth this man know letters, having never learned? As a false prophet. And they blindfolded him and smote his face, saying, Prophesy who is this that struck thee? He was treated as a madman. He is mad, why hear you him? As a wine-biber, a glutton, and a friend of sinners. Behold a man that is a glutton and a drinker of wine, a friend of publicans and sinners. As a sorcerer. 
By the prince of devils he casteth out devils, as a heretic and possessed person. Do we not say well of thee, that thou art a Samaritan, and hast a devil? In a word, Jesus was considered as so bad and notorious a man, that no trial was necessary to condemn him, as the Jews said to Pilate. If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up to thee. He was contradicted in his soul, for even his eternal father, in order to give place to the divine justice, contradicted him by not wishing to hear him, when he prayed to him, saying, Father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me, and abandon him to fear, weariness, and sadness, so that our afflicted Lord said, My soul is sorrowful even unto death. His interior suffering even caused him to sweat blood, contradicted and persecuted, in a word, in his body and in his life, for he was tortured in all his sacred members, in his hands, in his feet, in his face, and in his head, in his whole body, till, drained of the last drop of his blood, he died an ignominious death on the cross. When David, in the midst of all his pleasures and royal grandeur, heard from Nathan the prophet that his son should die, the child that is born to thee shall surely die, he could find no peace, but wept, fasted, and slept upon the ground. Mary received with the greatest calmness the announcement that her son should die, and peacefully continued to submit to it, but what grief she must have continually suffered, seeing this amiable son always near her, hearing from him words of eternal life, and beholding his holy demeanor. Abraham suffered great affliction during the three days he passed with his beloved Isaac, after he knew that he was to lose him. O oh God, not for three days, but for thirty-three years, Mary had to endure a like sorrow. Like, do I say? A sorrow as much greater as the son of Mary was more lovely than the son of Abraham. The Blessed Virgin herself revealed to St. Bridget that while she lived on the earth, there was not an hour when this grief did not pierce her soul. As often, she continued, as I looked upon my son, as often as I wrapped him in his swaddling clothes, as often as I saw his hands and his feet, so often was my soul overwhelmed, as it were, with a fresh sorrow, because I considered how he would be crucified. Rupert the abbot, contemplating Mary, while she was suckling her son, imagines her addressing him in these words. A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me, he shall abide between my breasts. Ah, my son, I clasp thee in my arms, because thou art so dear to me, but the dearer thou art to me, the more thou dost become to me a bundle of myrrh and of sorrow, when I think of thy sufferings. Mary, says St. Bernardine of Siena, considered that the strength of the saints was to pass through death, the beauty of paradise to be deformed, the Lord of the universe to be bound as a criminal, the creator of all things to be livid with stripes, the judge of all to be condemned, the glory of heaven despised, the king of kings to be crowned with thorns, and treated as a mock king. Father Englegrave writes that it was revealed to the same St. Bridget, that the afflicted mother, knowing all that her son would have to suffer, suckling him, thought of the gall and vinegar, when she swathed him, of the cords with which he was to be bound, when she bore him in her arms, she thought of him being nailed to the cross, and when he slept, she thought of his death. As often as she put on him his clothes, she reflected that they would one day be torn from him, that he might be crucified. And when she beheld his sacred hands and feet, and thought of the nails that were to pierce them, as Mary said to St. Bridget, My eyes filled with tears, and my heart was tortured with grief. The evangelist says, that as Jesus Christ advanced in years, so also he advanced in wisdom and in grace with God and men. That is, he advanced in wisdom and in grace before men or in their estimation, and before God, according to St. Thomas, inasmuch as all his works would continually have availed to increase his merit, if from the beginning grace in its complete fullness had not been conferred on him by virtue of the hypostatic union. 
but if jesus advanced in the esteem and love of others how much more did he advance in mary's love but o oh god as love increased in her the more increased in her the grief of having to lose him by a death so cruel and the nearer the time of the passion of her son approached with so much greater pain did that sword of sorrow predicted by saint simeon pierce the heart of the mother precisely this the angel revealed to saint bridget saying that the sword of sorrow was every hour drawing nearer to the virgin as the time for the passion of her son drew nearer if then jesus our king and his most holy mother did not refuse for love of us to suffer during their whole life such cruel pains there is no reason that we should complain if we suffer a little jesus crucified once appeared to sister magdalene orsini a dominican nun when she had been long suffering a great trial and encouraged her to remain with him on the cross with that sorrow that was afflicting her sister magdalene answered him complaining o oh lord thou dost suffer on the cross only three hours but it is more than three years that i have been suffering this cross then the redeemer replied ah ignorant soul what dost thou say i from the first moment i was conceived suffered in heart what i afterwards suffered on the cross if then we too suffer any affliction and complain let us imagine that jesus and his mother mary are saying to us the same words example father roviglioni of the company of jesus relates that a certain youth practiced the devotion of visiting every day an image of the sorrowful mary in which she was represented with seven swords piercing her heart one night the unhappy youth fell into mortal sin going next morning to visit the image he saw in the heart of the blessed virgin not only seven but eight swords as he stood gazing at this he heard a voice saying to him that this sin had added the eighth sword to the heart of mary this softened his hard heart he went immediately to confession and through the intercession of his advocate recovered the divine grace prayer o oh, my blessed mother not one sword only but as many swords as i have committed sins have i added to those seven in thy heart ah my lady thy sorrows are not due to thee who art innocent but to me who am guilty but since thou hast wished to suffer so much for thee ah uh, by thy merits obtain for me great sorrow for my sins and patience under the trials of this life which will always be light in comparison with my demerits for i have often merited hell amen end of section thirty three Section 34 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reflections on the Second Dolor of the Flight of Jesus into Egypt. As the stag, wounded by an arrow, carries the pain with him wherever he goes, because he carries with him the arrow that wounded him, thus the Divine Mother, after the prophecy of St. Simeon, as we saw in our consideration of the first grief, always carried her sorrow with her, by the continual remembrance of the passion of her son. Eogrin, explaining this passage of the Canticles, The hairs of thy head, as the purple of the king, bound in the channel, says, These hairs of Mary were her continual thoughts of the passion of Jesus, which kept always before her eyes the blood which was one day to flow from his wounds thy mind o mary and thy thoughts tinged in the blood of the passion of our lord were always moved with sorrow as if they actually saw the blood flowing from his wounds thus her son himself was that arrow in the heart of mary who the more worthy of love he showed himself to her always wounded her the more with the sorrowful thought that she should lose him by so cruel a death let us now pass to the consideration of the second sword of sorrow which wounded mary in the flight of her infant jesus into egypt from the persecution of herod herod having heard that the expected messiah was born foolishly feared that the new-born king would deprive him of his kingdom 
Hence St. Fulgentius, reproving him for his folly, thus says, Why, O Herod, art thou thus disturbed? This king who is born has not come to conquer kings by arms, but to subjugate them, in a wonderful manner, by his death. The impious Herod, therefore, waited to learn from the holy Magi where the king was born, that he might take from him his life. But finding himself deceived by the Magi, he ordered all the infants that could be found in the neighborhood of Bethlehem to be put to death. But an angel appeared in a dream to St. Joseph and said to him, Arise and take the child and his mother and fly into Egypt. According to Gerson, immediately on that very night, Joseph made this command known to Mary, and taking the infant Jesus, they commenced their journey, as it seems clearly from the gospel itself who arose and took the child and his mother by night and retired into Egypt. O oh God, as blessed Albertus Magnus says in the name of Mary, must he then, who came to save men, flee from men? Debet fugere, qui salvator es mundi. And then the afflicted Mary knew that already the prophecy of Simeon regarding her son was beginning to be verified. He is set for a sign which shall be contradicted. Seeing that scarcely is he born when he is persecuted to death. What suffering it must have been to the heart of Mary, writes St. John Chrysostom, to hear the tidings of that cruel exile of herself with her son. Fleeing from thy friends to strangers, from the holy temple of the only true God, to the temples of demons. What greater tribulation than that a newborn child, clinging to its mother's bosom, should be forced to fly with the mother herself? Every one can imagine how much Mary must have suffered on this journey. It was a long distance to Egypt. Authors generally agree with Barada that it was four hundred miles, so that at least it was a journey of thirty days. The way, as St. Bonaventure describes it, was rough, unknown, through woods, and little frequented. The season was winter, and therefore they had to travel in snow, rain, wind, and storms, and through bad and difficult roads. Mary was then fifteen years of age, a delicate virgin, unaccustomed to such journeys. They had no servant to attend them. Joseph and Mary, says St. Peter Chrysologus, had no manservant nor maidservant, they were themselves both masters and servants. O oh God, how piteous a spectacle it was to see that tender virgin with that newly born infant in her arms wandering through this world. St. Bonaventure asks, Where did they obtain food? Where did they rest at night? How were they lodged? What other food could they have than a piece of hard bread which Joseph brought with him or begged in charity? Where could they have slept particularly in the two hundred miles of desert through which they traveled, where, as authors relate, there were neither houses nor inns, except on the sand or under some tree in the wood, in the open air, exposed to robbers, or those wild beasts with which Egypt abounded. Ah, if any one had met these three greatest personages of the world, what would he have believed them to be but three poor roving beggars? They lived in Egypt, according to Brocard and Jensenius, in a district called Mature, though, according to St. Anselm, they dwelt in Heliopolis, first called Memphis, and now Cairo. And here let us consider the great poverty they must have suffered for the seven years they were there, as St. Antonius, St. Thomas, and others assert. They were foreigners, unknown, without revenues, without money, without kindred. Hardly were they able to support themselves by their humble labors. As they were destitute, says St. Basil, it is manifest what effort they must have made to obtain there the necessaries of life. Moreover, Landoff of Saxony has written, and let it be repeated for the consolation of the poor, that so great was the poverty of Mary there, that sometimes she had not so much a morsel of bread, when her son, forced by hunger, asked it of her. St. Matthew also relates that when Herod was dead, the angel again appeared, in a dream, to St. Joseph, and directed him to return to Judea. St. Bonaventure, speaking of his return, 
considers the greater pain of the Blessed Virgin, on account of the sufferings which Jesus must have endured in that journey, having arrived at about the age of seven years. An age, says the saint, when he was so large that he could not be carried, and so small that he could not go without assistance. The sight, then, of Jesus and Mary, wandering like fugitives through this world, teaches us that we should also live as pilgrims on the earth, detached from the goods which the world offers us, as having soon to leave them and go to eternity. We have not here a lasting city, but seek one that is to come. To which St. Augustine adds, Thou art a stranger, thou givest a look, and then passest on. Hopus es, vides et transis. It also teaches us to embrace crosses, for we cannot live in this world without a cross. The blessed Veronica da Binasco, an Augustinian nun, was carried in spirit to accompany Mary and the infant Jesus in this journey to Egypt, and at the end of it, the Divine Mother said to her, Child, hast thou seen through what difficulties we have reached this place? Now learn that no one receives graces without suffering. He who wishes to feel least the sufferings of this life must take Jesus and Mary with him. Et chape puerum et matrum eus. For him who lovingly bears in his heart this son and this mother, all sufferings become light and even sweet and dear. Let us then love them. Let us console Mary by receiving her son within our hearts, whom, even now, men continue to persecute with their sins. Example One day the Most Holy Mary appeared to the Blessed Coletta, a Franciscan nun, and showed her the infant Jesus in a basin, torn in pieces, and then said to her, Thus sinners continually treat my son, renewing his death and my sorrows. O oh, my daughter, pray for them that they may be converted. Similar to this is that other vision, which appeared to the Venerable Sister Jane, of Jesus and Mary, also a Franciscan nun, as she was one day meditating on the infant Jesus, persecuted by Herod, she heard a great noise, as of armed people, who were pursuing someone, and then appeared before her a most beautiful child, who was fleeing in great distress, and cried to her, My Jane, help me, hide me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, I am flying from sinners who wish to kill me, and who persecute me as Herod did, do thou save me. Prayer Then, O Mary, even after thy son hath died by the hands of men, who persecuted him unto death, have not these ungrateful men yet ceased from persecuting him with their sins, and continuing to afflict thee, O mother of sorrows? And I also, O God, have been one of these. Ah, my most sweet mother, obtain for me tears to weep for such ingratitude, and then, by the sufferings thou didst experience in the journey to Egypt, assist me in the journey that I am making to eternity, that at length I may go to unite with thee, in loving my persecuted Savior, in the country of the blessed. Amen. End of section 34《セクション35》of the Glories of Mary by Saint Alphonsus Liguori. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reflections on the Third Dolor of the Loss of Jesus in the Temple. Saint James the Apostle has said that our perfection consists in the virtue of patience. And patience hath a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, failing in nothing. The Lord having then given us the Virgin Mary as an example of perfection, it was necessary that she should be laden with sorrows, that in her we might admire and imitate her heroic patience. The dolor that we are this day to consider is one of the greatest which our Divine Mother suffered during her life, namely, the loss of her son in the temple. He who is born blind is little sensible of the pain of being deprived of the light of day, but to him who has once had sight and enjoyed the light, it is a great sorrow to find himself deprived of it by blindness. And thus it is with those unhappy souls who, being blinded by the mire of this earth, have but little knowledge of God, 
and therefore scarcely feel pain at not finding him on the contrary the man who illuminated with celestial light has been made worthy to find by love the sweet presence of the highest good o oh god how he mourns when he finds himself deprived of it from this we can judge how painful it must have been to mary who was accustomed to enjoy constantly the sweet presence of jesus that third sword which wounded her when she lost him in jerusalem and was separated from him for three days in the second chapter of st luke we read that the blessed virgin being accustomed to visit the temple every year at the paschal season with joseph her spouse and jesus once went when he was about twelve years old and jesus remained in jerusalem though she was not aware of it for she thought he was in company with others when she reached Nazareth, she inquired for her son, and not finding him there, she returned immediately to Jerusalem to seek him, but did not succeed until after three days. Now let us imagine what distress that afflicted mother must have experienced in those three days in which she was searching everywhere for her son, with the spouse in the canticles. Have you seen him whom my soul loveth? But she could hear no tidings of him, Oh, with how much greater tenderness must Mary, overcome with fatigue, and yet not having found her beloved son, have repeated those words of Reuben, concerning his brother Joseph. The boy doth not appear, and whither shall I go? Puer non comparet, et ego quo ebo. My Jesus doth not appear, and I know not what to do, that I may find him. But where shall I go without my treasure? Weeping continually, she repeated during these three days with David, My tears have been my bread day and night, whilst it is said to me daily, Where is thy God? Wherefore Pelbart with reason says, That during those nights the afflicted mother had no rest, but wept and prayed without ceasing to God, that he would enable her to find her son. And, according to St. Bernard, Often during that time did she repeat to her son himself the words of the spouse. Show me where thou feedest, where thou liest in the midday, lest I begin to wander. My son, tell me where thou art, that I may no longer wander, seeking thee in vain. Some writers assert, and not without reason, that this dolor was not only one of the greatest, but that it was the greatest and most painful of all. For in the first place, Mary in her other dolors had Jesus with her. She suffered when St. Simeon uttered the prophecy in the temple. She suffered in the flight to Egypt, but always with Jesus. But in this dolor, she suffered at a distance from Jesus, without knowing where he was. And the light of my eyes itself is not with me. Thus with tears, she then exclaimed, Ah, the light of my eyes, my dear Jesus, is no more with me. He is far from me. I know not where he is. Origen says that though the love which this holy mother bore her son, she suffered more at this loss of Jesus than any martyr ever suffered at death. Ah, uh, how long were these three days for Mary? They appeared three ages. Very bitter days, for there was none to comfort her. And who, she exclaimed with Jeremiah's, who can console me, if he who could console me is far from me? And therefore my eyes were not satisfied with weeping. Therefore do I weep, and my eyes run down with water, because the comforter is far from me. And with Tobias she repeated, What manner of joy shall be to me who sit in darkness and not see the light of heaven? Secondly, Mary well understood the cause and end of the other dolors, namely, the redemption of the world, the divine will. But in this, she did not know the cause of the absence of her son. The sorrowful mother was grieved to find Jesus withdrawn from her, for her humility, says Lansburgius, made her consider herself unworthy to remain with him any longer, and attend upon him on earth, and have the care of such a treasure. And perhaps, she may have thought within herself, I have not served him as I ought. Perhaps I have been guilty of some neglect, and therefore he has lost me. They sought him, lest he perchance had left them, as Origen has said. Certainly there is no greater grief for a soul that loves God than the fear of having displeased him. 
and therefore mary never complained in any other sorrow but this lovingly expostulating with jesus after she found him son why hast thou done so to us thy father and i have sought thee sorrowing by these words she did not wish to reprove jesus as the heretics blasphemously assert but only to make known to him the grief she had experienced during his absence from her on account of the love she bore him it was not a rebuke says blessed denis the carthusian but a loving complaint non erat in crepatio sed amorosa conquestio finally this sword so cruelly pierced the heart of the virgin that the blessed benvenuta desiring one day to share the pain of the holy mother in this dolor and praying her to obtain for her this grace mary appeared to her with the infant jesus in her arms but while benvenuta was enjoying the sight of that most beautiful child in one moment she was deprived of it so great was her sorrow that she had recourse to mary to implore her pity that it should not make her die of grief the holy virgin appeared to her again three days after and said to her now learn o oh my daughter that thy sorrow is but a small portion of that which i suffered when i lost my son this sorrow of mary ought in the first place to serve as a comfort to those souls who are desolate and do not enjoy the sweet presence they once enjoyed of their lord they may weep but let them weep in peace as mary wept in the absence of her son let them take courage and not fear that on this account they have lost the divine favor for god himself said to saint teresa no one is lost without knowing it and no one is deceived without wishing to be deceived if the lord departs from the sight of that soul who loves him he does not therefore depart from the heart he often hides himself that she may seek him with greater desire and love but those who would find jesus must seek him not amid the delights and pleasures of the world but amid crosses and mortifications as mary sought him we sought thee sorrowing as she said to her son dolentes querabamus te learn from mary to seek jesus says origen disque a marie querere jesum moreover in this world we should seek no other good than jesus job was not unhappy when he lost all that he possessed on earth riches children health and honors and even descended from a throne to a dunghill but because he had god with him even then he was happy st augustine speaking of him says he had lost all that god had given him but he had god himself perdiderat ila quae dederit deus sed habebat ipsum deum unhappy and truly wretched are those souls who have lost god if mary wept for the absence of her son for three days how ought sinners to weep who have lost divine grace to whom god says you are not my people and i will not be yours for sin does this namely it separates the soul from god your iniquities have divided between you and your god hence if even sinners possess all the goods of earth and have lost god everything on earth becomes vanity and affliction to them as solomon confessed behold all is vanity and vexation of spirit but as saint augustine says the greatest misfortune of these poor blind souls is that if they lose an ox they do not fail to go in search of it if they lose a sheep they use all diligence to find it if they lose a beast of burden they cannot rest but they lose the greatest good which is god and yet they eat and drink and take their rest example we read in the annual letters of the society of jesus that in india a young man who was just leaving his apartment in order to commit sin heard a voice saying stop where are you going he turned round and saw an image in relief of the sorrowful mary who drew out the sword which was in her breast and said to him take this dagger and pierce my heart rather than wound my son with this sin at the sound of these words the youth prostrated himself on the ground and with deep contrition burst into tears he asked and obtained from god and the virgin pardon of his sin prayer o oh, blessed virgin 
Why art thou afflicted, seeking thy lost son? Is it because thou dost not know where he is? But dost thou not know that he is in thy heart? Dost thou not see that he is feeding among the lilies? Thou thyself hast said it, My beloved to me and I, to him who feedeth among the lilies. These, thy humble, pure, and holy thoughts and affections, are all lilies, that invite the divine spouse to dwell with thee. Ah, Mary, dost thou sigh after Jesus, thou who lovest none but Jesus? Leave sighing to me and so many other sinners, who do not love him, and who have lost him by offending him. My most amiable mother, if through my fault thy son has not yet returned to my soul, wilt thou obtain for me that I may find him? I know well that he allows himself to be found by all who seek him. The Lord is good to the soul that seeketh him. Bonus est dominus, anime querenti illum. Make me to seek him as I ought to seek him. Thou art the gate through which all find Jesus. Through thee I too hope to find him. End of section 35section thirty six of the glories of mary by st alphonsus liguri this librivox recording is in the public domain reflections on the fourth dolor of the meeting of mary with jesus when he went to death st bernardine says that to form an idea of the grief of mary in losing her jesus by death it is necessary to consider the love that this mother bore to this her son all mothers feel the sufferings of their children as their own. Hence the woman of Canaan, when she prayed the Savior to deliver her daughter from the devil that tormented her, said to him that he should have pity on the mother rather than on the daughter. Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously troubled by a devil. But what mother ever loved a child so much as Mary loved Jesus? He was her only child, reared amidst so many troubles and pains, a most amiable child, and most loving to his mother, a son who was at the same time her son and her God, who came on earth to kindle in the hearts of all the holy fire of divine love, as he himself declared. I am come to cast fire on the earth, and what will I but that it be kindled? Let us consider how he must have inflamed that pure heart of his holy mother, so free from every earthly affection. In a word, the Blessed Virgin herself said to St. Bridget, that through love, her heart and the heart of her son was one. Unum erat cor meum, et cor filii mei. That blending of handmaid and mother, of son and God, kindled in the heart of Mary, a fire composed of a thousand flames. But afterwards, at the time of the Passion, this flame of love was changed into a sea of sorrow. Hence St. Bernardine says, All the sorrows of the world united would not be equal to the sorrow of the glorious Mary. Yes, because this mother, as St. Lawrence Justinian writes, The more tenderly she loved, was the more deeply wounded. The greater the tenderness with which she loved him, the greater was her grief at the sight of his sufferings, especially when she met her son, after he had already been condemned, going to death at the place of punishment, bearing the cross. And this is the fourth sword of sorrow, which today we have to consider. The Blessed Virgin revealed to St. Bridget, that at the time when the passion of our Lord was drawing nigh, her eyes were always filled with tears, as she thought of her beloved son, whom she was about to lose on this earth. Therefore, as she also said, a cold sweat covered her body from the fear that seized her at the prospect of approaching suffering. Behold, the appointed day at length arrived, and Jesus came in tears to take leave of his mother before he went to death. St. Bonaventure, contemplating Mary on that night, says, Thou didst spend it without sleep, and while others slept, thou didst remain watching. Morning having arrived, the disciples of Jesus Christ came to this afflicted mother, one, to bring her this tidings, another, that, but all the tidings of sorrow, for in her, were then verified the words of Jeremiah's. Weeping, she hath wept in the night, and her tears are on her cheeks. There is none to comfort her of all them, that were dear to her. 
one came to relate to her the cruel treatment of her son in the house of caiaphas another the insults received by him from herod finally for i omit the rest to come to my point st john came and announced to mary that the most unjust pilate had already condemned him to death upon the cross i say the most unjust for as st leo remarks this unjust judge condemned him to death with the same lips with which he had pronounced him innocent ah sorrowful mother said st john to her thy son has already been condemned to death he is already on his way bearing himself his cross on his way to calvary as he afterwards related in his gospel and bearing his own cross he went forth to that place which is called calvary come if thou dost desire to see him and bid him a last farewell in some of the streets through which he is to pass mary goes with st john and she perceives by the blood with which the way was sprinkled that her son had already passed there this she revealed to st bridget by the footsteps of my son i traced his course for along the way by which he had passed the ground was sprinkled with blood st bonaventure imagines the afflicted mother taking a shorter way and placing herself at the corner of the street to meet her afflicted son as he passed by this most afflicted mother met her most afflicted son mestissima mater mestissimo filio occurrit said st bernard while mary stopped in that place how much she must have heard said against her son by the jews who knew her and perhaps also words in mockery of herself alas what a commencement of sorrows was then before her eyes when she saw the nails the hammers the cords the fatal instruments of the death of her son borne before him and what a sword pierced her heart when she heard the trumpet proclaiming along the way the sentence pronounced against her son but behold now after the instruments the trumpet and the ministers of justice had passed she raises her eyes and sees she sees o oh god a young man covered with blood and wounds from head to foot with a crown of thorns on his head and two heavy beams on his shoulders she looks at him and hardly knows him saying then with isaiah and we have seen him and there was no sightlessness yes for the wounds the bruises and clotted blood made him look like a leper we have thought him as it were a leper so that he could no longer be recognized and his look was as it were hidden and despised whereupon we esteemed him not but at length love recognizes him and as soon as she knows him ah what was then as saint peter of alcantara says in his meditations the love and fear of the heart of mary on the one hand she desired to see him on the other hand she could not endure to look upon so pitiable a sight but at length they look at each other the sun wipes from his eyes the clotted blood which prevented him from seeing as was revealed to st bridget and looks upon the mother the mother looks upon the son ah looks of sorrow which pierced as with so many arrows those two holy and loving souls when margaret the daughter of st thomas more met her father on his way to the scaffold she could utter only two words o oh, father o oh, father and fell fainting at his feet at the sight of her son going to calvary mary fainted not no because it was not fitting that his mother should lose the use of her reason as father suarez remarks neither did she die for god reserved her for a greater grief but if she did not die she suffered sorrow enough to cause her a thousand deaths the mother wished to embrace him as saint anselm says but the officers of justice thrust her aside loading her with insults and urge onward our afflicted lord mary follows ah holy virgin where art thou going to calvary and canst thou trust thyself to see him who is thy life hanging from a cross and thy life shall be as it were hanging before thee et erit vita tua quasi pendens ante te ah my mother stop says st lawrence justinian as if the son himself had then spoken to her where dost thou hasten where art thou going if thou comest where i go thou wilt be tortured with my sufferings 
and I with thine. But although the sight of her dying Jesus must have cost her such cruel anguish, the loving Mary will not leave him. The son goes before, and the mother follows, that she may be crucified with her son, as William the abbot says. The mother took up her cross, and followed him, that she might be crucified with him. We even pity the wild beasts, Ferrarum etiam miseramor, as St. John Chrysostom has said. If we should see a lioness following her whelp, as he was led to death, even this wild beast would call forth our compassion. And shall we not feel compassion to see Mary following her immaculate lamb, as they were leading him to death? Let us then pity her, and endeavor also ourselves to accompany her son and herself, bearing with patience the cross which the Lord imposes upon us. Why did Jesus Christ, asked St. John Chrysostom, desire to be alone in his other sufferings, but in bearing the cross, wish to be helped by the Cyrenian? And he answers, that thou mayest understand that the cross of Christ is not sufficient without thine. The cross alone of Jesus is not enough to save us, if we do not bear with resignation also our own, even unto death. Example The Savior appeared one day to Sister Diomira, a nun in Florence, and said to her, Think of me, and love me, and I will think of thee, and love thee. And at the same time, he presented her with a bunch of flowers and a cross, signifying to her by this, that the consolations of the saints on this earth are always to be accompanied by the cross. The cross unites souls to God. Blessed Jerome Emilian, when he was a soldier, and leading a very sinful life, was shut up by his enemies in a tower. There, feeling deeply his misfortune, and enlightened by God to amend his life, he had recourse to the Most Holy Mary, and then with the help of this Divine Mother, he began to live the life of a saint. By this he merited to see once in heaven the high place which God had prepared for him. He became founder of the Order of Somaski, died a saint, and has been lately beatified by the Holy Church. Prayer My sorrowful mother, by the merit of that grief which thou didst feel at seeing thy beloved Jesus led to death, obtain for me the grace also to bear with patience those crosses which God sends me, Happy me, if I also shall know how to accompany thee, with my cross until death. Thou and Jesus, both innocent, have borne a heavy cross, and shall I, a sinner, who have merited hell, refuse mine? Ah, immaculate virgin, I hope that thou wilt help me to bear my crosses with patience. Amen. End of section 36 Section 37 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reflections on the Fifth Dolor of the Death of Jesus And now we have to admire a new sort of martyrdom, a mother condemned to see an innocent son, whom she loved with all the affection of her heart, put to death before her eyes by the most barbarous tortures. There stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. Stabat autem juxta crucem, mater eus. There is nothing more to be said, says St. John, of the martyrdom of Mary. Behold her at the foot of the cross, looking on her dying son, and then see if there is grief like her grief. Let us stop then also today on Calvary, to consider this fifth sword that pierced the heart of Mary, namely, the death of Jesus. As soon as our afflicted Redeemer had ascended the hill of Calvary, the executioners stripped him of his garments, and piercing his sacred hands and feet with nails, not sharp, but blunt. Non acutis, sed obtusis, as St. Bernard says, and to torture him more, they fastened him to the cross. When they had crucified him, they planted the cross, and thus left him to die. The executioners abandon him, but Mary does not abandon him. She then draws nearer to the cross, in order to assist at his death. I did not leave him, thus the Blessed Virgin revealed to St. Bridget. 
and stood nearer to his cross. But what did it avail, O lady, says St. Bonaventure, to go to Calvary to witness there the death of this son? Shame should have prevented thee, for his disgrace was also thine, because thou wast his mother. Or, at least, the horror of such a crime as that of seeing a God crucified by his own creatures should have prevented thee. But the saint himself answers, Thy heart did not consider the horror, but the suffering. Non considerabat cortuum horrorem, said dolorem. Ah, thy heart did not then care for its own sorrow, but for the suffering and death of thy dear son, and therefore thou thyself did wish to be near him, at least to compassionate him. Ah, true mother, says William the Abbot, loving mother, for not even the terror of death could separate thee from thy beloved son. But, O oh God, what a spectacle of sorrow, to see this son then in agony upon the cross, and under the cross, this mother in agony, who was suffering all the pain that her son was suffering. Behold the words in which Mary revealed to St. Bridget, the pitiable state of her dying son, as she saw him on the cross. My dear Jesus was on the cross, in grief and in agony. His eyes were sunken, half-closed, and lifeless, the lips hanging and the mouth open, the cheeks hollow and attached to the teeth, the face lengthened, the nose sharp, the countenance sad, the head had fallen upon his breast, the hair black with blood, the stomach collapsed, the arms and legs stiff, and the whole body covered with wounds and blood. Mary also suffered all these pains of Jesus. Every torture inflicted on the body of Jesus, says St. Jerome, was a wound in the heart of the mother. Any one of us who should then have been on Mount Calvary would have seen two altars, says St. John Chrysostom, on which two great sacrifices were consummating, one in the body of Jesus, the other in the heart of Mary. But rather would I see there, with St. Bonaventure, one altar only, namely, the cross alone of the Son, on which, with the victim, this divine Lamb, the mother also was sacrificed. Therefore the saint interrogates her in these words, O oh lady, where art thou? Near the cross? Nay, on the cross, thou art crucified with thy son. St. Augustine also says the same thing. The cross and nails of the son were also the cross and nails of the mother. Christ being crucified, the mother was also crucified. Yes, because, as St. Bernard says, love inflicted on the heart of Mary, the same suffering that the nails caused in the body of Jesus. Therefore, at the same time that the son was sacrificing his body, the mother, as St. Bernadine says, was sacrificing her soul. Mothers fly from the presence of their dying children, but if a mother is ever obliged to witness the death of a child, she procures for him all possible relief. She arranges the bed, that his posture may be more easy. She administers refreshments to him, and thus the poor mother relieves her own sorrows. Ah, mother, the most afflicted of all mothers. O oh, Mary, it was decreed that thou shouldest be present at the death of Jesus, but it was not given to thee to afford him any relief. Mary heard her son say, I thirst. Sitio. But it was not permitted her to give him a little water to quench his great thirst. She could only say to him, as St. Vincent Ferrer remarks, My son, I have only the water of my tears. Filii, non habeo, nisi aquam lacrimarum. She saw that her son, suspended by three nails to that bed of sorrow, could find no rest. She wished to clasp him to her heart, that she might give him relief, or at least, that he might expire in her arms, but she could not. She only saw that her poor son in a sea of sorrow, seeking one who could console him, as he had predicted by the mouth of the prophet, I have trodden the winepress alone. I looked about, and there was none to help me. I sought, and there was none to give aid. But who was there among men to console him, if all were his enemies? Even on the cross, they cursed and mocked him on every side. And they that passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads. Some said to him, If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Some exclaimed, he saved others, himself he cannot save. 
Others said, If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross. The blessed virgin herself said to St. Bridget, I heard some call my son a thief. I heard others call him an impostor. Others said that no one deserved death more than he, and every word was to me a new sword of sorrow. But what increased most the sorrows which Mary suffered through compassion for her son was to hear him complain on the cross that even the eternal father had abandoned him. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Words which, as the divine mother herself said to St. Bridget, could never depart from her mind during her whole life. Thus the afflicted mother saw her Jesus suffering on every side. She desired to comfort him, but could not. And what caused her the greatest sorrow was to see that, by her presence and her grief, she increased the sufferings of her son. The sorrow itself, says St. Bernard, that filled the heart of Mary, increased the bitterness of sorrow in the heart of Jesus. St. Bernard also says that Jesus on the cross suffered more from compassion for his mother than from his own pains. He thus speaks in the name of the Virgin. I stood and looked upon him, and he looked upon me, and he suffered more for me than for himself. The same saint also, speaking of Mary beside her dying son, says, that she lived dying without being able to die. Near the cross stood his mother speechless. Living she died, dying she lived. Neither could she die, because she was dead, being yet alive. Passino writes that Jesus Christ himself, speaking one day to the blessed Baptista Verona of Camerino, said to her that he was so afflicted on the cross at the sight of his mother in such anguish at his feet, that compassion for his mother caused him to die without consolation. So that the blessed Baptista, being enlightened to know this suffering of Jesus, exclaimed, O oh my Lord, tell me no more of this thy sorrow, for I cannot bear it. Men were astonished, says Simon of Cassia, when they saw this mother then keep silence, without uttering a complaint in this great suffering. But if the lips of Mary were silent, her heart was not so for she did not cease offering to divine justice the life of her son for our salvation. Therefore we know by the merits of her dolors, she cooperated with Christ in bringing us forth to the life of grace, and therefore we are children of her sorrows. Christ, says Lanspergius, wished her whom he had appointed for our mother to cooperate with him in our redemption, for she herself at the foot of the cross was to bring us forth as her children. And if ever any consolation entered into that sea of bitterness, namely, the heart of Mary, it was this only one, namely, the knowledge that by means of her sorrows she was bringing us to eternal salvation, as Jesus himself revealed to St. Bridget. My mother Mary, on account of her compassion and charity, was made mother of all in heaven and on earth. And indeed, these were the last words with which Jesus took leave of her before his death. This was his last remembrance, leaving us to her for her children in the person of John, when he said to her, Woman, behold thy son, Mulier ecce filius tuus. And from that time Mary began to perform for us this office of a good mother. For, as St. Peter Damian declares, the penitent thief, through the prayers of Mary, was then converted and saved. Therefore the good thief repented, because the blessed virgin, standing between the cross of her son and that of the thief, prayed her son for him, thus rewarding by this favor his former service. For as other authors also relate, this thief, in the journey to Egypt with the infant Jesus, showed them kindness, and this same office the Blessed Virgin has ever continued, and still continues to perform. Example A young man in Perugia once promised the devil that if he would help him to commit a sinful act which he desired to do, he would give him his soul, and he gave him a writing to that effect, signed with his blood. The evil deed was committed, and the devil demanded the performance of the promise. He led the young man to a well, and threatened to take him body and soul to hell, if he would not cast himself into it. The wretched youth, thinking that it would be impossible for him to escape from his enemy, 
climbed the well-side in order to cast himself into it. But terrified at the thought of death, he said to the devil that he had not the courage to throw himself in, and that, if he wished to see him dead, he himself should thrust him in. The young man wore about his neck the scapular of the sorrowing Mary, and the devil said to him, Take off that scapular, and I will thrust you in. But the youth, seeing the protection which the Divine Mother still gave him through that scapular, refused to take it off, and after a great deal of altercation, the devil departed in confusion. The sinner repented, and grateful to his sorrowful mother, went to thank her, and presented a picture of this case as an offering at her altar in the new church of Santa Maria in Perugia. Prayer Ah, mother, the most afflicted of all mothers, thy son, then, is dead, thy son so amiable, and who loved thee so much. Weep, for thou hast reason to weep. Who can ever console thee? Nothing can console thee but the thought that Jesus, by his death, hath conquered hell, hath opened paradise which was closed to men, and hath gained so many souls. From that throne of the cross he was to reign over so many hearts, which, conquered by his love, would serve him with love. Do not disdain, O my mother, to keep me near to weep with thee, for I have more reason than thou to weep for the offenses that I have committed against thy son. Ah, mother of mercy, I hope for pardon and my eternal salvation, first through the death of my Redeemer, and then through the merits of thy dolors. Amen. End of section 37《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》
oh how many through you shall receive the pardon of their sins and then through you shall be inflamed to love the sovereign good that the joy of the following paschal sabbath should not be disturbed the jews wished the body of jesus to be taken down from the cross but because they could not take down a criminal until he was dead they came with iron mallets to break his legs as they have already done to the two thieves crucified with him and mary while she remains weeping at the death of her son sees those armed men coming towards her jesus at this sight she first trembled with fear and then she said ah my son is already dead cease to maltreat him and cease to torture me a poor mother longer she implored them not to break his legs oravit eus ne frangerit crura as st bonaventure writes but while she is thus speaking o oh god she sees a soldier with violence brandishing a spear and pierces the side of jesus one of the soldiers with a spear opened his side and immediately there came out blood and water the cross shook at the stroke of the spear and as was revealed to saint bridget the heart of jesus was divided ita ut ambe partes essent divise there came out blood and water for only a few drops of blood remained and those also the saviour wished to shed in order to show that he had no more blood to give us the injury of that stroke was offered to jesus but the pain was inflicted on mary christ says the devout lanspergius shared with his mother the infliction of that wound for he received the insult and his mother the pain the holy fathers explain this to be the very sword predicted to the virgin by saint simeon a sword not of iron but of grief which pierced through her blessed soul in the heart of jesus where it always dwelt thus among others saint bernard says the spear which opened his side passed through the soul of the virgin which could not be torn from the heart of jesus and the divine mother herself revealed the same to saint bridget saying when the spear was drawn out the point appeared red with blood then i felt as if my heart were pierced when i saw the heart of my most dear son pierced the angel told saint bridget that such were the sufferings of mary that she was saved from death only by the miraculous power of god in her other dolors she at least had her son to compassionate her and now she had not even him to take pity on her the afflicted mother, still fearing that other injuries might be inflicted on her son, entreats Joseph of Arimathea to obtain from Pilate the body of her Jesus, that at least after his death she may be able to guard it and protect it from injuries. Joseph went to Pilate and made known to him the sorrow and the wish of this afflicted mother, and St. Anselm thinks that the compassion for the mother softened the heart of Pilate and moved him to grant her the body of the Savior and now jesus is taken from the cross o most holy virgin after thou with so great love hadst given thy son to the world for our salvation behold the world returns him to thee again but o oh my god how dost thou return him to me said mary to the world my son was white and ruddy delectus meus candidus et rubicundus but thou hast returned him to me blackened with bruises and red not with a ruddy color but with the wounds thou hast inflicted upon him he was beautiful now there is no more beauty in him he is all deformity all were enamored with his aspect now he excites horror in all who look upon him oh how many swords says st bonaventure pierced the soul of this mother when she received the body of her son after it was taken from the cross o oh, quat gladii anima matris per transierunt let us consider what anguish it would cause any mother to receive the lifeless body of a son it was revealed to saint bridget that to take down the body of jesus three ladders were placed against the cross those holy disciples first drew out the nails from the hands and feet and according to metaphrastes gave them in charge to mary then one supported the upper part of the body of jesus the other the lower and thus took it down from the cross bernardine de bustis describes the afflicted mother as raising herself and extending her arms to meet her dear son she embraces him and then sits down at the foot of the cross she sees his mouth open his eyes shut 
She examines the lacerated flesh and those exposed bones. She takes off the crown and sees the cruel injury made by those thorns in that sacred head. She looks upon those pierced hands and feet and says, Ah, my son, to what has the love thou despair to men reduced thee? But what evil hast thou done to them, that they have treated thee so cruelly? Thou wast my father, Bernadine de Bustis imagines her to say, My brother, my spouse, my delight, my glory, my all. O oh, my son, behold how I am afflicted. Look upon me and console me. But thou dost look upon me no more. Speak, speak to me but one word and console me. But thou dost speak no more for thou art dead. Then turning to those barbarous instruments, she said, O cruel thorns, O nails, O merciless spear, how could you thus torture your creator? But what thorns, what nails? Alas, sinners, she exclaimed, it is you who have thus cruelly treated my son. Thus Mary spoke and complained of us, but if now she were capable of suffering, what would she say? What grief would she feel to see that men after the death of her son continue to torment and crucify him by their sins? Let us no longer give pain to this sorrowful mother, and if we also have hither to grieve her by our sins, let us now do what she directs. She says to us, Return, ye transgressors, to the heart. Redite prevaricatores ad cor. Sinners, return to the wounded heart of my Jesus. Return as penitents, for he will receive you. Flee from him to him, she continues to say with Jeric the abbot, from the judge to the redeemer, from the tribunal to the cross. The virgin herself revealed to St. Bridget that she closed the eyes of her son when he was taken down from the cross, but she could not close his arms. Eus brachia flectere non potui. Jesus Christ giving us to understand by this, that he desired to remain with open arms, to receive all penitent sinners who return to him. O world, continues Mary, behold then, thy time is the time of lovers. Et ecce tempus tuum, tempus amantium. Now that my son, O world, has died to save thee, this is no longer for thee a time of fear, but of love. A time to love him who has desired to suffer so much, in order to show thee the love he bore thee. Therefore, says St. Bernard, is the heart of Jesus wounded, that through the visible wound, the invisible wound of love, may be seen. If then, concludes Mary, in the words of the abbot of Chellis, my son had wished his side to be open that he might give thee his heart. It is right, O man, that thou shouldest give him thy heart. And if you wish, O children of Mary, to find a place in the heart of Jesus, without fear of being cast out. Go, says Ubertino of Casale, go with Mary, for she will obtain grace for you, and in the following example we have a beautiful proof of this. Example The disciple relates that there was once a poor sinner who, among other crimes, had killed his father and a brother, and therefore became a fugitive. Happening to hear one day during Lent a sermon upon the divine mercy, he went to the preacher himself to make his confession. The confessor, having heard his crimes, sent him to an altar of the sorrowful mother to pray that she might obtain for him compunction and pardon of his sins. The sinner obeyed and began to pray, when, behold, suddenly overpowered by contrition, he falls down dead. On the following day, when the priest recommended to the people to pray for the deceased, a white dove appeared in the church, and let fall a card at the feet of the priest. He took it up, and found these words written on it. The soul of the dead, when it left the body, immediately went to paradise, and do you continue to preach the infinite mercy of God. Prayer O afflicted virgin, O soul, great in virtues and great also in sorrows, for both arise from that great fire of love thou hast for God, thou whose heart can love nothing but God, Ah, mother, have pity on me, for I have not loved God, and I have so much offended him. Thy sorrows give me great confidence to hope for pardon, but this is not enough. I wish to love my Lord, and who can better obtain this for me than thou, thou who art the mother of fair love? 
Ah, Mary, thou dost console all. Comfort me also. Amen. End of section 38. Section 39 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reflections on the Seventh Dolor, the Burial of the Body of Jesus. When a mother is by the side of a suffering and dying child, she no doubt then feels and suffers all his pains. But when the afflicted child is really dead and about to be buried, and the sorrowful mother takes her last leave of him, O oh God, the thought that she is to see him no more is a sorrow that exceeds all other sorrows. Behold the last sword of sorrow, which we are to consider, when Mary, after being present at the death of her son upon the cross, after having embraced his lifeless body, was finally to leave him in the sepulchre, never more to enjoy his beloved presence. But that we may better understand this last dolor, let us return to Calvary, again to look upon the afflicted mother, who still holds, clasped in her arms, the lifeless body of her son. O oh, my son, she seems then to continue to say, in the words of Job, My son, thou art changed to be cruel towards me. Mutatus es, mihi in crudelem. Yes, for all thy beauty, grace, virtue, and loveliness, all the signs of special love thou hast shown me, the peculiar favors thou hast bestowed on me, are all changed into so many darts of sorrow, which the more they have inflamed my love for thee, so much the more cause me cruelly to feel the pain of having lost thee. Ah, my beloved son, in losing thee I have lost all. Thus St. Bernard speaks in her name. O oh, truly begotten of God, thou wast to be a father, a son, a spouse, thou wast my life now i am deprived of my father my spouse and my son for with my son whom i have lost i lost all things thus mary clinging to her son was dissolved in grief but those holy disciples fearing lest this poor mother would expire there through agony went to take the body of her son from her arms to bear it away for burial therefore with reverential force they took him from her arms and having embalmed him, wrapped him in a linen cloth already prepared, upon which our Lord wished to leave to the world his image impressed, as may be seen at the present day in Turin. And now they bear him to the sepulchre. The sorrowful funeral train sets forth. The disciples place him on their shoulders. Hosts of angels from heaven accompany him. Those holy women follow him, and the afflicted mother follows in their company her son to the grave. When they had reached the appointed place, how gladly would Mary have buried herself, there alive with her son. Oh, how willingly, said the virgin to St. Bridget, would I have remained there alive with my son, if it had been his will. But since this was not the divine will, the authors relate that she herself accompanied the sacred body of Jesus into the sepulchre, where, as Baronius narrates, they deposited the nails and the crown of thorns. In raising the stone to close the sepulchre, the disciples of the Savior had to turn to the Virgin and say to her, Now, O lady, we must close the sepulchre. Have patience, look upon thy son, and take leave of him for the last time. Then, O my beloved son, must the afflicted mother have said, Then shall I see thee no more? Receive then, this last time that I look upon thee, Receive the last farewell from me, thy dear mother, and receive my heart which I leave buried with thee. The virgin, says St. Fulgentius, earnestly desired that her soul should be buried with the body of Christ. And Mary herself made this revelation to St. Bridget. I can truly say that at the burial of my son, one sepulchre contained, as it were, two hearts. Finally, they take the stone and close up in the holy sepulchre the body of Jesus, that great treasure, greater than any in heaven and on earth. And here let us remark that Mary left her heart buried with Jesus, because Jesus was all her treasure. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And where shall we keep our heart buried? With creatures? In the mire? And why not with Jesus? who, although he has ascended to heaven, has wished to remain, 
not dead but alive, in the most holy sacrament of the altar, precisely in order that he may have with him and possess our hearts? But let us return to Mary. Before quitting the sepulchre, according to St. Bonaventure, she blessed the sacred stone, saying, O oh, happy stone, that doth now enclose that body, which was contained nine months in my womb, I bless thee and envy thee. I leave thee to guard my son for me, who is my only good, my only love. And then turning to the Eternal Father, she said, O oh, Father, to thee I recommend him, who is thy son and mine, and thus bidding a last farewell to her son, and to the sepulchre, she returned to her own house. This poor mother went away so afflicted and sad, according to St. Bernard, that she moved many to tears even against their will. Multos etiam invitos ad lacrimas provocabat, so that wherever she passed, all wept who met her. Omnes plorabant qui abiavant ei, and could not restrain their tears. And he adds, that those holy disciples, and the women who accompanied her, mourned for her even more than for their Lord. St. Bonaventure says, that her two sisters covered her with a mourning cloak. The sisters of Our Lady wrapped her in a veil, as a widow, covering, as it were, her whole countenance. And he also says, that passing, on her return, before the cross, still wet with the blood of her Jesus, she was the first to adore it. O holy cross, she exclaimed, I kiss thee and adore thee, for thou art no longer an infamous wood, but a throne of love, and an altar of mercy, consecrated by the blood of the divine Lamb, who has been sacrificed upon thee, for the salvation of the world. She then leaves the cross and returns to her house. There the afflicted mother casts her eyes around, and no longer sees her Jesus. But instead of the presence of her dear son, all the memorials of his holy life and cruel death are before her. There she is reminded of the embraces she gave her son in the stable of Bethlehem, of the conversations held with him for so many years in the shop of Nazareth. She is reminded of their mutual affection, of his loving looks, of the words of eternal life that came forth from that divine mouth. And then comes before her the fatal scene of that very day. She sees those nails, those thorns, that lacerated flesh of her son, those deep wounds, those uncovered bones, that open mouth, those closed eyes. Alas, what a night of sorrow was that night for Mary. The sorrowful mother turned to St. John and said mournfully, Ah, John, where is thy master? Then she asked of the Magdalene, Daughter, tell me where is thy beloved? O oh God, who has taken him from us? Mary weeps, and all those who are with her weep. And thou, O oh my soul, dost thou not weep? Ah, turn to Mary, and say to her with St. Bonaventure, Let me, O oh my lady, let me weep. Thou art innocent, I am guilty. At least entreat her to permit thee to weep with her. Fac et tecum lugeum. She weeps for love, and thou dost weep through sorrow for thy sins. And thus weeping, thou mayest have the happy lot of him, of whom we read in the following example. Example. Father Englegrave relates that a certain religious was so tormented by scruples that sometimes he was almost driven to despair, but having great devotion to Mary, the mother of sorrows, he had recourse to her in the agony of his spirit, and was much comforted by contemplating her dolors. Death came, and the devil tormented him more than ever with scruples, and tempted him to despair. When, behold, our merciful mother, seeing her poor son so afflicted, appeared to him and said to him, and why, O oh my son, art thou so overcome with sorrow, thou who hast so often consoled me by thy compassion for my sorrows? Be comforted, she said to him. Jesus sends me to thee to console thee. Be comforted, rejoice, and come with me to paradise. And at these words, the devout religious tranquilly expired, full of consolation and confidence. Prayer my afflicted mother, I will not leave thee alone to weep. No, I wish to keep thee company with my tears. This grace I ask of thee today. Obtain for me a continual remembrance of the passion of Jesus, and of thine also, and a tender devotion to them, 
that all the days remaining of my life may be spent in weeping for thy sorrows, O my mother, and for those of my Redeemer. I hope that these dolors will give me the confidence and strength not to despair at the hour of my death, at the sight of the offenses I have committed against my Lord. By these must I obtain pardon, perseverance, paradise, where I hope to rejoice with thee, and sing the infinite mercy of my God through all eternity. Thus I hope, thus may it be. Amen. Amen. Whoever wishes to practice the devotion of reciting the chaplet of the Dolores of Mary will find it at the end of the book. I composed this many years since, and insert it anew here for the convenience of the servants of Mary, whom I pray in their charity to recommend me to her when they meditate upon her dolors. O lady, who doth ravish the heart of men with thy sweetness, hast thou not ravished mine? O ravisher of hearts, when wilt thou restore to me my heart? Do with it as with thine own, and place it in the side of thy son. Then I shall possess what I hope for, because thou art our hope. End of section 39 Section 40 of the Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Virtues of the Most Holy Mary St. Augustine says that in order to obtain more certainly and abundantly the favors of the saints, it is necessary to imitate them, for when they see us practicing the virtues which they practiced, then they are moved to pray for us. The Queen of Saints, and our first advocate, Mary, after she has rescued a soul from the grasp of Lucifer, and has united her to God, wishes her to begin to imitate her example, otherwise she will not be able to enrich her, as she would wish, with her graces, seeing her so opposed to her in conduct. Therefore Mary calls those blessed who diligently imitate her life. Now, therefore, children, hear me. Blessed are they that keep my ways. He who loves is like, or seeks to make himself like, the person beloved, according to the celebrated proverb. Love either finds or makes like. Amor out perez invenit, out fake it. Hence St. Jerome tells us that if we love Mary, we must seek to imitate her, for this is the greatest honor we can pay her. Richard says, Those are, and may call themselves, true children of Mary, who strive to imitate her life. Filii Mariae imitatoris eius. Let the children then endeavor, concludes St. Bernard, to imitate the mother, if he wishes to favor her. For when Mary sees that he honors her as a mother, she will treat and favor him as a child. Although there is little recorded in the Gospels of the virtues of Mary in particular, yet when they tell us that she was full of grace, it is given us to understand that she had all the virtues and all in heroic degree. So much so that, as St. Thomas says, whereas the other saints have excelled, each in some one particular virtue, the Blessed Virgin has excelled in all, and in all the virtues has been given us for an example. And St. Ambrose also says, Such was Mary, that her life alone is the example for all. And he afterwards added, Let the virginity and life of Mary be to you as an image, in which the form of virtue shines forth. From thence obtain the model of your life, what you should correct, what avoid, what retain. And because, as the Holy Fathers teach, humility is the foundation of all the virtues, let us, in the first place, consider how great was the humility of the Mother of God. Section 1 of the Humility of Mary Humility, says St. Bernard, is the foundation and guardian of the virtues, and with reason, for without humility a soul can possess no other virtue. Let her possess all the virtues. They will all depart when humility departs. On the other hand, says St. Francis of Sales, in a letter to St. Jane de Chantal, God so loves humility that he instantly hastens to the soul in which he sees it. This virtue, so lovely and so necessary, 
was unknown in the world. But the Son of God himself came on earth to teach it by his example, and he desired that in this we should especially strive to imitate him. Learn of me, because I am meek and humble of heart. And Mary, as she was the first and most perfect disciple of Jesus Christ in all the virtues, was so in that of humility, by which she merited to be exalted above all creatures. It was revealed to St. Matilda that the first virtue which the Blessed Mother especially practiced from childhood was humility. The first act of humility of the heart is to have a humble opinion of ourselves, and Mary always thought so lowly of herself as was revealed to the same St. Matilda, that although she saw so many more graces bestowed upon her than upon others, she preferred all others before herself. Rupert the abbot, explaining that passage, Thou hast wounded my heart, my sister, my spouse, with one hair of thy neck, says that this hair of the neck of the spouse was precisely that humble opinion which Mary had of herself, with which she wounded the heart of God. Not that the Holy Virgin esteemed herself a sinner, for humility is truth, as St. Teresa says, and Mary knew that she had never offended God, nor that she did not confess having received greater graces from God than any other creature, for a humble heart always acknowledges the special favors of the Lord, that it may humble itself the more. But the Divine Mother, by the greater light she had to see the infinite greatness and goodness of her God, saw still more her own littleness, and therefore, more than all others, did she humiliate herself, and say with the spouse of the canticles, Do not consider that I am brown, because the sun hath altered my color. Approaching him, I find myself black, as St. Bernard explains it. Apropinquans ili me negrum invenio. Yes, adds St. Bernardine, for the Virgin had always present before her eyes the divine majesty and her own nothingness. As a beggar, when she is clothed with a costly garment which has been given her, is not made proud by it, but humbles herself more before the giver, because she is reminded then more of her poverty. Thus Mary, the more she saw herself enriched, the more humble she became, remembering that all was the gift of God. Whence she herself said to St. Elizabeth, a Benedictine nun, Know for certain that I esteem myself most abject and unworthy of the grace of God. And therefore, says St. Bernadine, no creature in the world has been more exalted, because no creature has ever humbled herself more than Mary. Moreover, it is an act of humility to conceal the gifts of heaven. Mary wished to conceal from St. Joseph the grace of having been made the mother of God, although it seemed necessary to make it known to him, in order, at least, to remove from the mind of her poor spouse the suspicions he might have of her virtue when he saw her pregnant, or at least his perplexity, for in fact St. Joseph, on the one side, unwilling to doubt the chastity of Mary, and on the other, ignorant of the mystery, in order to free himself from perplexity, was minded to put her away privately. Voluit occulte dimitirit eum. And if the angel had not revealed to him that his spouse was pregnant by the operation of the Holy Spirit, he would really have left her. Moreover, a humble soul always refuses praise and gives it all to God. Behold, Mary is disturbed at hearing herself praised by St. Gabriel. And when Elizabeth said to her, Blessed art thou among women, and whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Blessed art thou that hast believed, etc. Mary, referring all these praises to God, answered with that humble canticle, My soul doth magnify the Lord. Magnificat anima mea dominum as if she had said, You praise me, O Elizabeth, but I praise the Lord, to whom alone honor is due. You wonder that I come to you, and I wonder at the divine goodness in which alone my spirit exalts. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Et exultavit spiritus meus, in Deo salutari meo. You praise me because I have believed, I praise my God, because he has wished to exalted my nothingness, 
because he hath regarded the humility of his handmaid. Quia respects it, humilitatem ancile sue. Hence Mary said to St. Bridget, Why did I humble myself so far? Or why have I merited so much grace, unless because I thought and knew that of and from myself I was nothing, and had nothing? Therefore I would have no praise for myself, but only for the giver and creator. Wherefore, speaking of the humility of Mary, St. Augustine says, O truly blessed humility, which has brought forth God to men, open paradise, and liberated souls from hell. It is also a part of humility to save others, and Mary did not refuse to go and serve Elizabeth for three months. Wherefore St. Bernard has said, Elizabeth wondered that Mary should come to visit her, but she should wonder still more that she did not come to be ministered unto, but to minister. The humble retire and choose the lowest place, and therefore, as St. Bernard remarks, Mary, when her son was preaching in a certain house, as St. Matthew relates, wished to speak with him, but would not enter the house unbidden. Therefore, when she was in the upper room with the apostles, she wished to take the lowest place, as St. Luke has related. All these were persevering with one mind in prayer, with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Not that St. Luke did not know the merit of the Divine Mother, on account of which he should have given her the first place, but because she had taken the lowest, after the apostles and the other women. Therefore St. Luke describes all, as a certain author remarks, just in the order of their places. Hence St. Bernard says, Justly has the last become first, who, when she was first of all, became last. Finally, the humble love contempt. Therefore we do not find that Mary appeared in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, when her son was received with so much honor by the people. But on the other hand, at the time of the death of her son, she did not shrink from appearing in public on Calvary, through fear of the disgrace of being known as the mother of one, who was condemned as a criminal to die by an infamous death. Therefore she said to St. Bridget, What more contemptible than to be called a fool, to be in want of all things, to believe oneself the most unworthy of all? Such, O oh daughter, was my humility, this was my joy, this was my entire will, with which I thought of nothing but to please my son. The venerable sister Paula of Foligno, was given to understand in an ecstasy how great was the humility of the Holy Virgin. In relating what she had seen to her confessor, she said, scarcely able to utter the words through astonishment, O oh, the humility of the Blessed Virgin! O oh, Father! O oh, the humility of our Blessed Lady! In the world there is no humility, not even the lowest degree of humility, to be compared with the humility of Mary. And our Lord at another time showed St. Bridget two females, one all pomp and vanity. This one, he said, is pride, but the other whom you see with her head bent down, respectful to all, having God alone in her mind, and having no esteem for herself, is humility, and is called Mary. By this God wished to make known to us that his blessed mother is so humble that she was humility itself. It is not to be doubted, as St. Gregory of Nyssa says, that for our nature, corrupted by sin, there is perhaps no virtue more difficult to practice than humility. But there is no escape. We can never be true children of Mary if we are not humble. If, says St. Bernard, you cannot imitate the virginity, imitate the humility of the humble virgin. She abhors the proud. She invites none to come to her but the humble. Whosoever is a little one, let him come to me. Si quis as parvulus, veniat ad me. Mary, says Richard, protects us under the mantle of humility. Maria protegit nos, sub palio humilitatis. The mother of God herself explained this to St. Bridget, saying, Come then, O my daughters, and hide thyself under my mantle. This mantle is my humility. And she then added that the contemplation of her humility was a good mantle that keeps us warm. But as she afterwards said, 
the mantle only warms him who wears it not only in thought but in fact thus my humility does not profit unless every one strives to imitate it therefore my daughter she concludes clothe thyself with this humility oh how dear to mary is the humble soul st bernard writes the virgin recognizes and loves those who love her and she is near to all who invoke her especially to those whom she sees like herself in chastity and humility wherefore the saint then exhorts all those who love mary to be humble emulate this virtue if you love mary marino or martino de alberto of the society of jesus through love of the virgin was accustomed to sweep the house and collect the filth the divine mother once appeared to him as father nirenberg relates in his life and as if thanking him said how dear to me is this humble action done for love of me then o oh my queen i shall never be a true child of thine if i am not humble do you not see that my sins after having rendered me ungrateful to my lord have also made me proud o oh, my mother cure me by thy merits obtain for me that i may be humble and thus become a child of thine amen end of section forty Section 41 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Virtues of the Most Holy Mary. Section 2. Of the Charity of Mary Towards God. St. Anselm says that where there is the greatest purity, there is the greatest charity. Ubi mayor puritas, ibi mayor caritas. The purer and more emptied of self is a heart, the more it will be filled with charity towards God. Most Holy Mary, because she was all humility and entirely emptied of self, was entirely filled with the divine love, so that she surpassed all men and all angels in love to God, as St. Bernadine teaches. Therefore St. Francis of Sales has justly called her the Queen of Love. The Lord indeed has given to men the precept to love him with their whole heart. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart. But, as St. Thomas declares, this precept will never be perfectly fulfilled by men on this earth, but in heaven. And here the blessed Albertus Magnus remarks that in a certain sense, it would be unbecoming for God to give a commandment which none could perfectly fulfill, if the Divine Mother had not perfectly fulfilled it. These are the words of Albertus. Either someone fulfills this precept, or no one. If anyone, it is the Most Blessed Virgin. And this is confirmed by Richard of St. Victor, who says, The Mother of our Emmanuel was perfect in all virtues. Who has ever fulfilled as she did that first commandment, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart? In her the divine love was so ardent that there could be no defect of any kind in her. Divine love, says St. Bernard, so penetrated and pervaded the soul of Mary that no part was left untouched by it, so that she loved with her whole heart, her whole soul, and her whole strength, and was full of grace. Wherefore Mary might well have said, My beloved has given himself wholly to me, and I have given myself wholly to him my beloved to me and i to him delectus meus mihi et ego ili ah says richard well might even the seraphim descend from heaven to learn from the heart of the virgin how to love god god who is love deus caritas est came on earth to kindle in all men the flames of his holy love but he inflamed no heart so much as the heart of his mother who, being entirely pure from every earthly affection, was perfectly ready to be enkindled by this blessed flame. Thus St. Jerome teaches. Hence the heart of Mary became all fire and flames, as we read of her in the sacred canticles. The lamps thereof are fire and flames. Lampadis eus, lampadis ignis, atque flamarum. Fire burning within, through love, as St. Anselm explains, and flames shining forth upon all, by the practice of virtue. 
Mary, therefore, when she bore Jesus in her arms, might indeed have called herself fire-carrying fire. Ignis gestans ignum. More properly than a certain woman who was carrying fire in her hand, was so called by Hippocrates. Yes, for St. Ildelphinus said, As fire heats iron, the Holy Spirit so wholly inflamed Mary, that nothing was seen in her but the fire of the Holy Ghost, Nothing was felt but the fire of the love of God. St. Thomas of Villanova says that the bush which Moses saw entirely in flames without being consumed was really a symbol of the heart of the Virgin. Wherefore, with reason, says St. Bernard, was she seen by St. John, clothed with the sun. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. Et signum apparuit in celo, Mulier amicta sole. For, says the saint, she was so united to God by love, that it seems as if no creature could be more united to him. Mary, then, is justly described as clothed with the sun, for she has penetrated to an incredible depth, the abyss of divine wisdom, so that, as far as it is permitted to a creature not personally united with God, she appears immersed in that inaccessible light. Therefore, St. Bonaventure asserts that the Holy Virgin was never tempted by the spirits of hell. For as flies, he says, are driven away by a great fire, so from the heart of Mary, which was one flame of love, the devils fled and did not dare to approach her. And Richard also says, The Virgin was terrible to the princes of darkness, so that they did not presume to approach and tempt her, for the flame of charity deterred them. Mary herself revealed to St. Bridget that in this world she had no other thought, no other desire, no other joy than God. I thought of nothing but God, nothing pleased me but God. Mihi nisi deum cogitabam, nulla mihi nisi deus plecu erunt. So that her blessed soul being, as it were, on this earth in a continual contemplation of God, the acts of love she made were innumerable. As Father Suarez has declared, the acts of perfect love which the Blessed Virgin made in this life were innumerable, for she passed almost her whole life in contemplation and was very frequently repeating an act of love. But Bernard de Bustis pleases me more when he says that Mary did not so much repeat the acts of love in order as other saints do, but by a singular privilege, always actually love God with one continued act. Like the royal eagle, she kept her eyes always fixed upon the divine son, so that, as St. Peter Damien says, neither did the actions of life prevent her from loving, nor love prevent her from acting. Thus says St. Germanus, Mary was prefigured by the altar of propitiation, on which the fire was never extinguished by day or by night. Neither did sleep interrupt the love of Mary for her God. For if such a privilege was given to our first parents in the state of innocence, as St. Augustine asserts, saying, Their dreams when sleeping were as happy as their life when waking. Tom Felicia errant somnia dormientium quam vita vigilantium. It certainly could not be denied to the Divine Mother, as Suarez and Rupert the Abbot believe with St. Bernardine and St. Ambrose, who has written concerning Mary. While her body rested, her soul watched. Cum quiescerent corpus, vigilaret animus. Thus were verified in her the words of the wise man. Her lamp shall not be put out in the night. Non extinguetur in nocte lucerna eus. Yes, for while her blessed body, with a light sleep, took its needed rest, her soul, says St. Bernadine, freely rose to God, so at that time her contemplation was more perfect than is that of any other person when awake. Therefore could she well say with the spouse in the canticles, I sleep and my heart watcheth. Ego dormio et cor meum vigilat. Happy in sleep as in waking. Tom Felix dormiendo, quam vigilando, as Suarez says. In a word, St. Bernardine asserts that Mary, while she lived on earth, was continually loving God. Mens virginis 
in ardore delictionis, continue tenebatur. And he adds further, that she never did anything that she did not know was pleasing to God, and that she loved him as much as she knew he ought to be loved. Hence, according to blessed Albertus Magnus, it may be said that Mary was filled with so great charity that a greater was not possible in any pure creature on this earth. For this reason St. Thomas of Villanova has said that the Virgin, by her ardent charity, was made so beautiful and so enamored her God, that captivated as it were by love of her, he descended into her womb to become man. Wherefore St. Bernardine exclaims, Behold a virgin who by her virtue has wounded and taken captive the heart of God. But since Mary loves her God so much, she certainly requires from her servants nothing else so much that they should love God as much as they can. And precisely this she said to the blessed Angela de Foligno one day after communion. Angela, may you be blessed by my son. Seek to love him as much as you can. And the Blessed Virgin herself said to St. Bridget, Daughter, if you wish to bind me to you, love my son. Si vis me tecum de vincere, ama filium meum. Mary desires nothing more than to see her beloved, who is God, loved by all. Novarino asks, Why the Holy Virgin, with the spouse of the canticles, begged the angels to make known to her Lord the great love she bore him, saying, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I languish with love. Did not God know how much she loved him? Why does she desire to show the wound to her beloved, who gave the wound? Cur volnus ostendi querit, delecto qui volnus pecit? The same author answers, that the Divine Mother did not wish by this to make known her love to God, but to us that, as she was wounded, she might be able to wound us also with divine love. Ut vulnerata vulnerit. And because she was wholly inflamed with the love of God, she inflames all those who love and approach her, and renders them like herself. For this reason, St. Catherine of Siena called Mary, the bearer of the flame of divine love. Portatrix Ignis. If we also wish to burn with this blessed flame, let us always endeavor to draw near to our mother with prayers and affections. O Queen of Love, Mary the most lovely, the most beloved, and the most loving of all creatures, as St. Francis de Sales said to thee, Ah, my mother, thou wert always wholly inflamed with love to God. Ah, deign to bestow on me at least one spark of it. Thou didst pray thy son for that family whose wine had failed. They have no wine. Venum non habent. And wilt thou not pray for us, who are wanting in love to God, whom we are under such obligations to love? Say to Jesus, they have no love. Amorem non habent. Do thou obtain for us this love. We ask of thee no other favor than this. O oh, mother, by the great love thou hast for Jesus, Graciously hear us and pray for us. Amen. End of section 41. Section 42 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Virtues of the Most Holy Mary, Section 3 of the charity of Mary for her neighbor. Love to God and our neighbor is commanded by the same precept. And this commandment we have from God, that he who loveth God, love also his neighbor. And St. Thomas gives it as a reason for this, that he who loves God, loves all things which God loves. St. Catherine of Genoa one day said to God, O Lord, it is thy will that I love my neighbor, and I can love none but thee. God answered her in these words, He who loves me, loves all things loved by me. But as there never has been and never will be, one who loves God more than Mary, so there never has been and never will be, one who loves his neighbor more than Mary. Cornelius a la Pide, remarking on these words, King Solomon hath made him a litter of wood of Libanus, 
the midst he covered with charity for the daughters of Jerusalem, says that this litter was the womb of Mary, in which the incarnate word dwelt, filling the mother with charity, that she might succor all who had recourse to her. Mary was so full of charity when she was on earth, that she assisted unasked those who were in need, just as she did at the marriage of Cana, when she told her son of the trouble of the family. They have no wine. Vinum non habent, and begged him to give them wine by a miracle. Oh, how she hastened to the relief of her neighbor when she went to the house of Elizabeth on an errand of charity. She went into the hill country in haste. Abiat in Montana, cum festina tioni. She could in no way show greater charity than by offering her son for our salvation. So that St. Bonaventure says, Mary so loved the world as to give her only begotten son. Therefore St. Anselm addresses her in these words. O oh, blessed among women, who dost excel the angels in purity and the saints in pity. Neither does the charity of Mary for us fail, says St. Bonaventure. Now she is in heaven, but is much increased there, because now she sees more clearly the miseries of men. Hence the saint said, Great was the mercy of Mary towards the wretched when she was still an exile on earth, but it is far greater now that she is reigning in heaven. And the angel said to St. Bridget, that there is no one who prays that does not receive graces through the charity of the Virgin. Miserable should we be were Mary not to pray for us. Jesus Christ himself also said to the same saint, If the prayers of my mother do not interpose, there would be no hope of mercy. Blessed is he, says the Divine Mother, who hears my teachings and considers my charity, in order to practice it, towards others in imitation of me. Blessed is the man that heareth me, and that watcheth daily at my gates, and waiteth at the posts of my doors. St. Gregory Nazianzen says, that there is nothing by which we may more surely gain the love of Mary, than by the practice of charity towards our neighbor. Hence, as God commands us, saying, Be ye merciful, as your father also is merciful. So Mary appears to say to all her children, Be ye merciful, as your mother also is merciful. It is certain that God and Mary will show mercy to us, according to the charity we practice towards our neighbor. Give, and it shall be given to you. For with the same measure that you shall meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Saint Methodius said, Give to the poor and receive paradise. Da pauperi, et acipe paradisium. For, according to the apostle, charity towards our neighbor renders us happy in this life and the next. But piety is profitable to all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. St. John Chrysostom, remarking on the words of Proverbs, He that hath mercy on the poor, lendeth to the Lord, says, that he who assists the needy makes God his debtor. O mother of mercy, thou art full of charity for all. Do not forget my miseries. Thou dost even now see them. Recommend me to that God who denies thee nothing. Obtain for me the grace of being able to imitate thee in holy charity towards God and towards my neighbor. Amen. End of section 42. Section 43 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Virtues of the Most Holy Mary, Section 4, Of the Faith of Mary. As the Blessed Virgin is the mother of love and of hope, thus also is she the mother of faith. I am the mother of fair love and of fear and knowledge and of holy hope. And justly, says St. Irenaeus, since Mary repaired by her faith that loss which Eve caused by her incredulity. Eve, Tertullian also says, because she chose to believe the serpent rather than the word of God, brought death into the world. But our queen, believing the words of the angel, that she, remaining a virgin, was to become the mother of the Lord, brought salvation to the world. 
For St. Augustine says that Mary, giving her consent to the incarnation of the word, by means of her faith, opened paradise to men. Also Richard, commenting on the words of St. Paul, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the believing wife, says, This is the believing woman by whose faith the unbelieving Adam and all his posterity are saved. Hence on account of her faith, Elizabeth pronounced the virgin blessed. Blessed art thou that hast believed, because those things shall be accomplished in thee that were spoken by the Lord. And St. Augustine added, Mary is more blessed by receiving the faith of Christ than by conceiving the flesh of Christ. Father Suarez says that the Holy Virgin had more faith than all men and all angels. She saw her son in the stable of Bethlehem and believed him the creator of the world. She saw him flying from Herod and yet believed that he was the king of kings. She saw him born and believed him to be eternal. She saw him poor and in need of food, and believed him to be Lord of the universe, laid on straw, and she believed him omnipotent. She observed that he did not speak, and she believed him to be infinite wisdom. She heard him weeping, and she believed him to be the joy of paradise. Finally, she saw him in death, despised and crucified, but although the faith of others might have wavered, Mary remained firm in the belief that he was God. St. Antonius says, remarking on the words, There stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, Stabat juxta crucem, Jesu mater eius. Mary stood supported by her faith, which she retained firm in the divinity of Christ. And it is for this reason, says the saint, that in the office of Tenebrae, only one candle is left lighted. St. Leo, when treating of this subject, applies to the virgin this passage of Proverbs. Her lamp shall not be put out in the night. On the words of Isaiah, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the Gentiles there is not a man with me. St. Thomas remarks, He says a man, on account of the virgin, in whom faith never failed. Whence the blessed Albertus Magnus says, that Mary practiced then a most perfect faith. She had faith in a most excellent degree who, even when the disciples were doubting, did not doubt. Mary, therefore, by her great faith, merited to become the light of all the faithful, as St. Methodius calls her. Fidelium Fox And by St. Cyril of Alexandria, the queen of the true faith. Spectrum Orthodoxae Fidei And the Holy Church herself attributes to the Virgin, by the merit of her faith, the destruction of all heresies. Rejoice, O Virgin Mary, for thou alone hast destroyed all heresies throughout the world. St. Thomas of Villanova also says, explaining the words of the Holy Spirit, Thou hast wounded my heart, my sister, my spouse, with one of thy eyes. That the eyes signify faith, by which the Virgin gave the greatest pleasure to the Son of God. St. Ildelphinus exhorts us to imitate the faith of Mary. Imita mini signaculum fidei Mariae. But how are we to imitate this faith of Mary? Faith is at the same time a gift and a virtue. It is a gift of God, in so far as it is a light which God infuses into the soul, and it is also a virtue, in so far as it is exercised by the soul. Hence faith is given us not only to serve as a rule of belief, but also of action. Therefore St. Gregory says, he truly believes who, by his works, practices what he believes. And St. Augustine, Thou sayest, I believe, do what you say, and it is faith. And this is to have a lively faith, namely, to live according to our belief. My just man liveth by faith. It was thus the Blessed Virgin lived, very differently from those who do not live according to what they believe, whose faith is dead, as St. James says. Faith without good works is dead. Fide sine operibus, mortua est. Diogenes went about seeking a man upon earth. Hominem quero, but God seems seeking a Christian among the many faithful. Christinium quero. For very few are they who have the works, the greater part have only the name. But to these should be said what Alexander said to that cowardly soldier who was also named Alexander. 
change either your name or your conduct. Out nomen, out mores muta. But, as Father Avila used to say, it would be better if these miserable creatures were put in confinement as madmen, believing as they do, that a happy eternity is prepared for him who lives well, and an unhappy eternity for him who lives ill, and yet living as if they did not believe this. St. Augustine therefore exhorts us to see things with Christian eyes, that is, to see according to faith. Oculos Christianorum habete. For St. Teresa was accustomed to say that all sins arise from a want of faith. Let us therefore implore the Holy Virgin that by the merit of her faith she may obtain for us a lively faith. O Lady, increase our faith. Domina adauge nobis fidem. End of section 43. Section 44 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Virtues of the Most Holy Mary. Section 5. Of the Hope of Mary. From faith springs hope, for God enlightens us by faith with a knowledge of his goodness and his promises, that we may raise by hope to the desire of possessing him. Mary, then, having the virtue of an extraordinary faith, had also the virtue of an extraordinary hope, which made her say to David, But it is good for me to adhere to my God, and to put my hope in the Lord God. Mary was, indeed, that faithful spouse of the Holy Spirit, of whom it was said, Who is this that cometh up from the desert, flowing with delights, leaning on her beloved? For she was always perfectly detached from affection to the world, which to her appeared a desert, and placing no confidence either in creatures or her own merits, but relying entirely on divine grace, in which alone she trusted, she always advanced in the divine love, and thus Ailgrin said of her, She ascended from the desert, that is, from the world, which she deserted and esteemed such a desert, that she turned away from it all her affection. Leaning upon her beloved, for she trusted not in her own merits, but in the grace of him who bestows grace. And the Holy Virgin plainly showed how great was her confidence in God. First, when she saw the trouble of her holy spouse, Joseph, because he knew not the mode of her miraculous pregnancy, and thought of leaving her. But Joseph, minded to put her away privately, Yosem altem voluit occulte dimitere eum. It appeared then necessary, as we have already said, that she should discover to Joseph the hidden mystery. But no, she would not herself reveal the grace she had received. She thought it better to abandon herself to divine providence, trusting that God himself would protect her innocence and her reputation. Cornelius a la Pide makes precisely the same remark, commenting upon these very words of the gospel. The Blessed Virgin was unwilling to make known this secret to Joseph, lest she should seem to boast of her gifts, but resigned herself in perfect confidence to the care of God, trusting that he would protect her innocence and reputation. Moreover, she showed her confidence in God, when, as the time for the birth of Christ approached, she saw herself in Bethlehem, shut out from the lodgings even of the poor, and obliged to bring forth her son in a stable and she laid him in a manger, because there was no room for him in the inn. She did not then utter a single word of complaint, but abandoning herself to God, trusted that he would assist her in her need. The Divine Mother also showed how much she trusted in the Divine Providence, when warned by Joseph that they were obliged to fly into Egypt. She set out the same night on so long a journey to a foreign and unknown country, without preparation, without money, without other company than that of her infant Jesus and her poor spouse, who arose and took the child and his mother by night and retired into Egypt. But much more did Mary make known her confidence when she asked from her son the favor of the miracle of wine at the marriage of Cana, for having said, They have no wine, vinum non habent, Jesus asked her, Woman, what is it to thee and to me? My hour has not yet come. 
but after this answer by which it seemed clearly that he refused her request she trusting in the divine goodness directed the people of the house to do as the son should order because the grace was secure whatsoever he shall say to you do ye quod cum quae dixerit vobis recite and jesus christ did indeed order the vessels should be filled with water and then changed it into wine let us learn then from mary to trust in god as we ought but principally as to what concerns our eternal salvation in which although our cooperation is necessary yet we ought to hope from god alone the grace necessary for obtaining it entirely distrusting our own strength and saying with the apostle i can do all things in him who strengtheneth me omnia possum in eo qui me confortat ah my most holy lady of the ecclesiasticus says that thou art the mother of holy hope mater sancte spe the holy church says of thee that thou art hope itself hail our hope spes nostra salve what other hope then am i seeking thou after christ are all my hope thus saint bernard called thee thus i also wish to call thee the whole reason of my hope tota ratio spes mea and i will always say to thee with saint bonaventure o salvation of those who invoke thee save me o salus te invocantium salva me end of section forty four Section 45 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguori. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Virtues of the Most Holy Mary. Section 6. Of the Chastity of Mary. Since the fall of Adam, the flesh being rebellious against reason, the virtue of chastity is the most difficult for men to practice. Of all combats, says St. Augustine, those of chastity are the most severe, for the battle is daily and the victory rare. But eternal praise to the Lord who has given us in Mary a great example of this virtue. With justice, says blessed Albertus Magnus, is Mary called the Virgin of Virgins, for she being the first who offered her virginity to God, without the counsel or example of others, has brought to him all virgins who imitate her as David had already predicted. After her, virgins shall be brought to the temple of the king. Aducentur virginis, post eum in templum regis. Without counsel or example, yes, for St. Bernard exclaims, O virgin, who has taught thee to please God by virginity, and on earth, to lead the life of an angel? Ah, answers Sophronius, it is for this God has chosen this most pure virgin for his mother, that she may be an example of chastity to all. Hence St. Ambrose has called Mary the standard-bearer of chastity. Que signum virginitatis extolit. By reason of this, her purity, the Blessed Virgin was also called by the Holy Spirit, beautiful as the turtle dove. Thy cheeks are beautiful as the turtle doves. Pulcre sunt, gene tue, sicu terturis. Mary, says St. Aponius, is a most chaste turtle. Tertura pudicissima Maria. And therefore she has also been called a lily. As the lily among the thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Sicu lilium interspinus, sic amica mei interfilias. St. Denis the Carthusian, commenting on this passage, says that she has been called a lily among thorns because all other virgins were thorns either to themselves or others, but the Blessed Virgin has never been one to herself or others. For by her presence alone she infused into all thoughts and affections of purity. Intuentium corda ad castitatem invitabat. And this is confirmed by St. Thomas, who says that the beauty of the Blessed Virgin encouraged chastity in all who beheld her. Pocratudo beata virginis, intuentes ad castitatem excitabat. 
St. Jerome declares himself of the opinion that St. Joseph preserved his virginity by the society of Mary. For the saint thus writes against the heretic Helvidius, who denied the virginity of Mary. Thou sayest that Mary did not remain a virgin. I take it upon myself to maintain more than that, that Joseph himself preserved his virginity through Mary. A certain author says that the Blessed Virgin so loved this virtue that to preserve it, she would have been ready to renounce even the dignity of Mother of God. This we may learn from her own answer to the Archangel. How shall this be done because I know not man? And from the words she afterwards added, Be it done to me according to thy word. Fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum. Signifying by this that she gave her consent on the condition of what the angel had assured her, namely, that she should become a mother by means of the Holy Spirit alone. St. Ambrose says, He who has preserved chastity is an angel. He who has lost it is a devil. According to the words of our Lord, they shall be as the angels of God in heaven. But the unchaste become odious to God as the devils. And St. Remigius said that the greater number of adults are lost through this vice. The victory over this vice is rare, as has been said in the words of St. Augustine at the beginning of this section. But why is it rare? Because the means for conquering it are not put in use. The means are three, according to Bellarmine, and the masters of the spiritual life. Fasting, avoiding dangerous occasions, and prayer. Yeunium periculorum evitatio et oratio. By fasting is meant mortification, particularly of the eyes and of the appetite. The most holy Mary, although she was full of divine grace, was so mortified with her eyes that she kept them always downcast, as St. Epiphanius and St. John Damascene inform us, and never fixed them on any one. They say that from her childhood she was so modest, that she was the wonder of all. And hence St. Luke remarks that in going to visit St. Elizabeth, she went with haste, a be it cum festinatione, that she might not be long seen in public. Philibert relates with regard to her food that it was revealed to a hermit named Felix that the infant Mary took milk only once a day. And St. Gregory of Tours asserts that during her whole life, she fasted always. Nulo tempore Maria non yayunavit. And St. Bonaventure adds that Mary would never have found so much grace unless she had been temperate in food, for grace and gluttony cannot subsist together. In a word, Mary practiced mortification in everything, so that of her it was said, My hands dropped with myrrh. Manus mei still averit murum. The second means is to fly the occasions of sin. He that is aware of the snares shall be secure. Qui altem caveat laqueos, securis erit. Hence St. Philip Neri said that in this warfare cowards conquer, that is, those who avoid dangerous occasions. Mary shunned as much as possible the sight of men, and therefore St. Luke says that in her visit to Elizabeth, she went with haste into the hill country. Abiet in Montana cum festinatione. And a certain author remarks that the virgin left Elizabeth before the birth of the Baptist, as we learn from the gospel itself, in which it is said that Mary abode with her about three months, and she returned to her own house. Now Elizabeth's full time of being delivered was come, and she brought forth a son. And why did she not wait till his birth? In order to avoid the conversation and visits which would follow that event. The third means is prayer. And as I knew, said the wise man, that I could not otherwise be continent except God gave it. I went to the Lord and besought him. And the Blessed Virgin revealed to St. Elizabeth, a Benedictine nun, that she had not acquired any virtue without effort and continual prayer. St. John Damascene says that Mary is pure and a lover of purity. Pura est et puritatem amans, and therefore she cannot endure the impure. 
but whoever has recourse to her will certainly be delivered from this vice by only pronouncing her name with confidence and the venerable john of avila says that many temptations against chastity have been overcome solely by devotion to the immaculate virgin o mary o most pure dove how many are in hell through the vice of impurity o lady obtain for us that always in our temptations we may have recourse to thee and invoke thee saying mary mary help us amen End of section 45. Section 46 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Virtues of the Most Holy Mary, Section 7, Of the Poverty of Mary. Our loving Redeemer chose to be poor on this earth, in order to teach us to despise the goods of this world. Being rich, says St. Paul, he became poor for your sake, that through his poverty you might be rich. For this reason Jesus Christ says to each one who wishes to be his disciple, If thou wilt be perfect, go sell what thou hast and give it to the poor, and come follow me. Behold his most perfect disciple Mary, who indeed imitated his example. Father Canisius proves that the Holy Virgin could have lived in comfort on the inheritance left her by her parents, but she was content to remain poor, reserving to herself a small portion, and giving the rest in alms to the temple and to the poor. Many are of opinion that Mary also made a vow of poverty, and it is known that she herself said to St. Bridget, From the beginning I vowed in my heart never to possess anything in the world. The gifts received from the Holy Magi were certainly not of small value, but St. Bernard attests that she distributed them all to the poor. And we learn that the Divine Mother immediately gave to others the presents above mentioned, from the fact that when she went to the temple, she did not offer the lamb, which was the oblation made by those who were able, as we read in Leviticus. For a son she shall bring a lamb but she offered two turtle doves and two young pigeons, the oblation of the poor. And to offer a sacrifice, according as it is written in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Mary herself said to St. Bridget, All that I had I gave to the poor, and kept nothing for myself but poor food and clothing. Through love of poverty she did not disdain to marry a poor carpenter, like St. Joseph, and afterwards, as St. Bonaventure relates, to support herself by the work of her hands, as sewing or spinning. An angel revealed to St. Bridget, concerning Mary, that worldly riches were in her eyes, vile as dirt. Mundane divite volute, lutum sibi violescabat. In a word, she always lived in poverty, and she died in poverty. For as Metaphrastes and Nesiphorus relate, she left nothing behind her at her death, but two poor garments to two women who had assisted during her life. He who loves riches, said St. Philip Neri, will never become a saint, and St. Teresa also said, It justly follows that he who goes in search of things lost is also lost. On the other hand, the same saint said, that this virtue of poverty is a good that comprises all other goods. I have said the virtue of poverty which, according to St. Bernard, does not consist alone in being poor, but in loving poverty. Non paupertas, sed amor paupertatis, virtus est. Therefore Jesus Christ has said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed because they who wish for nothing but God, in God, find every good, and find in poverty their paradise on earth, as St. Francis found it in saying, My God and my all, Deus meus et omnia. Let us then, according to the exhortation of St. Augustine, love that only good in which is every good. Ama unum bonum, in quo sunt omnia bona. And let us pray our Lord with St. Ignatius. 
Give me only thy love together with thy grace, and I am rich enough. And when poverty afflicts us, let us console ourselves by the thought that Jesus and his mother have also been poor like us. Ah, my most holy mother, thou hast in truth reason to say that in God is thy joy. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For in this world thou didst not desire nor love any other good than God. Draw me after thee. Trahe me poste. O lady, detach me from the world, and draw me after thee to love that one who alone merits to be loved. Amen. End of section 46. Section 47 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Virtues of the Most Holy Mary. Section 8 of The Obedience of Mary. It was through the affection which Mary bore to the virtue of obedience that when the Annunciation was made to her by St. Gabriel, she did not wish to call herself by any other name than that of Handmaid. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Ecce ancilla domini. Indeed, says St. Thomas of Villanova, this faithful handmaid neither in act, word nor thought, ever disobeyed the Lord, but divested of all self-will, she always and in all things lived obedient to the divine will. She herself declared that God was pleased with her obedience when she said, He regarded the humility of his handmaid respects it humilitatem ancile sue, for this is the humility of a servant, to be always prompt to obey. St. Augustine says that the Divine Mother remedied by her obedience the evil that Eve had caused by her disobedience. The obedience of Mary was far more perfect than that of all the other saints, for all men being inclined to evil through original sin, they all feel difficulty in doing right. But not so the Blessed Virgin, for as St. Bernadine says, because she was free from original sin, there was in her no hindrance in obeying God, but she was like a wheel readily moved at every divine breath. Hence her only occupation on this earth, as the same saint expresses it, was to discover and do what was pleasing to God. Of her it was said, My soul melted when he spoke. Anima mea, liquefacta est, ut delectus meus, locutus est. Commenting on this passage, Richard says that the soul of Mary was like metal in a state of fusion, ready to take any form that was pleasing to God. Mary proved indeed the readiness of her obedience, in the first place, when in order to please God, she was willing even to obey the Roman emperor and make the journey fifty miles to Bethlehem, in winter, being pregnant, and so poor that she was obliged to bring forth her son in a stable. She was also ready at the notice of St. Joseph to set out immediately on that very night upon the longer and more difficult journey into Egypt. And Silveria asked why the command to fly into Egypt was given to St. Joseph and not to the Blessed Virgin, who was to suffer the most from the journey. And he answers, Lest the virgin should be deprived of an opportunity for performing an act of obedience, for which she was most ready. But above all, she showed her heroic obedience, when, in order to obey the divine will, she offered her son to death, with so much firmness that, as St. Ildelphinus says, she would have been ready to crucify him, if executioners had been wanting. Hence the venerable Bede, commenting on those words of the Redeemer to that woman in the Gospel who exclaimed, Blessed is the womb that bore thee. Yea, rather, blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Says that Mary was more happy through obedience to the divine will than in being the mother of God himself. For this reason it is that those who love obedience are very pleasing to the Virgin. She appeared once to a religious, a Franciscan named Accorso, in his cell, who, being called by obedience to go and hear the confession of a sick person, went out. When he returned, he found Mary waiting for him, and she greatly praised his obedience. 
as, on the other hand, she greatly blamed another religious, who, when the bell had summoned him to the refectory, delayed in order to finish certain devotions. The virgin, speaking to St. Bridget of the security found in obeying a spiritual father, said, Obedience has brought all the saints to glory. Obedientia omnis introducit ad gloriam. St. Philip Neri also says, that God requires no account of things done in obedience, having himself declared, He that heareth you heareth me, and he that despiseth you despiseth me. The mother of God herself revealed to St. Bridget that through the merit of her obedience, she had obtained from God that all penitent sinners who have recourse to her should be pardoned. Ah, uh, our queen and mother, pray Jesus for us, obtain for us through the merit of thy obedience, that we may be faithful in obeying his will and the commands of our spiritual fathers. Amen. End of section 47. Section 48 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Virtues of the Most Holy Mary, Section 9, Of the Patience of Mary. Since this earth is a place of merit, it is justly called a valley of tears, for we are all placed here to suffer, and by patience to obtain for our souls eternal life. In your patience you shall possess your souls, said the Lord. God gave us the Virgin Mary as an example of all virtues, but especially as an example of patience. St. Francis of Sales, among other things, remarks, that at the nuptials of Cana, Jesus Christ gave an answer to the Most Holy Virgin, by which he seemed to pay but little regard to her prayers. Woman, what is that to thee and to me? Quid mihi et tibi est mulier? Precisely for this reason, that he might give us an example of the patience of his holy mother. But why seek further? The whole life of Mary was a continual exercise of patience. For, as an angel revealed to St. Bridget, the Blessed Virgin lived always in the midst of sufferings. Her compassion alone for the sufferings of the Redeemer was enough to make her a martyr of patience. Wherefore, St. Bonaventure says, the crucified conceived the crucified. Crucifixa, crucifixum concepit. When we spoke of her dolors, we considered all she suffered, as well as in her journey and life in Egypt, as during the whole time she lived with her son in the workshop of Nazareth. But the presence of Mary on Calvary, with her dying Jesus, is alone enough to show us how constant and sublime was her patience. There stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. Sabat yuxet crucem Jesu, mater eius. Then, by the merit of this, her patience, as blessed Albertus Magnus remarks, she became our mother and brought us forth to the life of grace. If we desire then to be the children of Mary, we must seek to imitate her patience. And what, says St. Cyprian, can enrich us more with merit in this life and glory in the other than bearing sufferings with patience. God said by the mouth of the prophet Osei, I will hedge up thy way with thorns. Sepium viam tuum spinis. St. Gregory remarks on this passage that the ways of the elect are hedged with thorns. Electorum vie spinis sepiuntur. For as a hedge of thorns protects the vine, so God encompasses his servants with tribulation, in order that they may not become attached to the earth. Therefore St. Cyprian concludes, Patience delivers us from sin and from hell. Patientia no servat. And it is patience that makes the saints. Patience hath a perfect work, bearing in peace the crosses that come to us directly from God, as sickness poverty, etc., as well as those that come to us from men, such as persecutions, injuries, etc. St. John saw all the saints with palms, the emblem of martyrdom, in their hands. And after this I saw a great multitude, and palms were in their hands, signifying by this that all men must be martyrs by the sword or by patience, 
Be then joyful, exclaimed St. Gregory. We can be martyrs without blood if we preserve patience. If we suffer the afflictions of this life, as St. Bernard says, patiently and joyfully. Patienter et gaudeter. Oh, how much every pain endured by God will obtain for us in heaven. Hence the apostle encourages us in these words. Our tribulation, which is momentary and light, worketh for us an eternal weight of glory. Beautiful are the instructions of St. Teresa on this subject. He who embraces the cross, she says, does not feel it. And again, when a person resolves to suffer, the pain is over. And if we feel our crosses heavy, let us have recourse to Mary, who is called by the church, the comforter of the afflicted. Consolatrix afflictiorum. And by St. John Damascene, the remedy for all sorrows of the heart. Omnium dolorum cordium medicamentum. Ah, most sweet lady, thou, though innocent, did suffer with so much patience, and shall I, who am deserving of hell, refuse to suffer? My mother, to-day I ask of thee the grace not to be exempt from crosses, but to support them with patience. For the love of Jesus I pray thee to obtain for me nothing less than this grace from God. Through you I hope for it. End of section 48《セクション49of the Glories of Mary》by St. Alphonsus Liguri。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Of the Virtues of the Most Holy Mary。Section 10 of the Prayer of Mary。No soul on this earth has ever followed so perfectly as the Blessed Virgin, that great lesson of our Savior. We ought always to pray and not to faint. O portet semper orare, et non defique. From no other, says St. Bonaventure, can we better take example and learn the necessity of persevering in prayer than from Mary. Mary gave an example that we ought to follow and not faint. For the blessed Albertus Magnus asserts that after Jesus Christ, the Divine Mother was the most perfect in the virtue of prayer of all who ever have lived or ever will live. Virtus oratinionis, in beate virgine excellentissima fuit. First, because her prayer was continual and persevering, from the first moment in which she had life, and with life the perfect use of reason, as we have said above in the discourse on her nativity, she began to pray. And moreover, that she might devote herself more to prayer, she wished, when a child of only three years, to shut herself up in the retirement of the temple, where, as she herself revealed to St. Elizabeth, the Virgin, among the hours that she allotted to prayer, she was accustomed to rise at midnight and go to pray before the altar of the temple, and, in order to meditate on the sufferings of Jesus, according to Odilioni, she also frequently visited the places of our Lord's nativity, passion, and burial, Moreover, her prayer, as St. Denis the Carthusian has written, was wholly recollected, free from distractions and every irregular inclination. Therefore the Blessed Virgin, through her love of prayer, had so great a love of solitude, that, as she said to St. Bridget, when she lived in the temple she even abstained from intercourse with her holy parents. St. Jerome, meditating on the words of Isaiah's, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Says that in Hebrew, the word virgin properly signifies a retired virgin. So that Mary's love of solitude was already predicted by the prophet. Richard says that the angel addressed her in the words, The Lord is with thee, Dominus tecum, on account of her great love of solitude. And St. Vincent Ferrer asserts that the Divine Mother never went from home, except to go to the temple, and then she went entirely recollected, having her eyes always cast down. When going to visit St. Elizabeth, she went with haste, abiet cum festina tioni. And from this, St. Ambrose says virgins should learn to shun the public eye. St. Bernard teaches that Mary, through her love of prayer and solitude, 
was always careful to avoid conversation with men. Hence she is called by the Holy Spirit, the turtle dove. Thy cheeks are beautiful as the turtle doves. Pulcre sunt gene tue sicut tu turis. Which words, Virgilus thus explains. The turtle dove is a lover of solitude, and is an emblem of the unitive power of the soul. So the virgin always lives solitary in this world, as in a desert, and therefore it was said of her, Who is this that goeth up by the desert, as a pillar of smoke? Que est ista, que ascendit, per desertum, sicut virgulis fumi. On these words, Rupert the abbot says, Thus thou didst ascend by the desert, having a solitary soul. Talis ascendisi per desertum, animum haben solitarium. Philo said that God speaks to souls only in solitude. Dei sermo amat deserta. And God himself declared this by the prophet Osei, when he said, I will lead her into the wilderness, and I will speak to her heart. Do come eum in solitudinem, et loquor ad cor eus. And hence St. Jerome exclaims, O solitude, in which God familiarly converses with his servants. Yes, says St. Bernard, because the quiet and the silence that is enjoyed in solitude force the soul to leave the earth in thought, and to meditate on things of heaven. O most holy virgin, obtain for us a love of prayer and solitude, that detaching ourselves from the love of creatures, we may aspire only after God in heaven, where we hope one day to see thee, to praise and love thee with thy Son, Jesus, for ever and ever. Amen. Come over to me, all ye that desire me, and be filled with my fruits. The fruits of Mary are her virtues. None has appeared like unto thee in all time before or after thee. Thou alone, O woman without equal, hast been pleasing to Christ. End of section 49「Section 50 of the Glories of Mary » by St. Alphonsus Liguri • This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Various Practices of Devotion to the Divine Mother • The Queen of Heaven is so liberal, as St. Andrew of Crete says, that she makes a large return for the smallest devotions of her servants. But two conditions are necessary for this. First, that we offer her the homage of a soul, pure from sin. For otherwise Mary will say to us what she said to a soldier, a man of vicious habits, who, as St. Peter Celestine relates, offered every day a devotion to the Virgin. One day, when he was suffering greatly from hunger, Our Lady appeared to him, and presented him some exquisite viands, but in a vase so filthy that he did not venture to taste them. I am the mother of God, Mary then said to him, who has come to relieve thy hunger? But I cannot taste from this vase, answered the soldier. And do you wish, replied Mary, that I should accept thy devotions, offered me from a soul so polluted? The soldier at these words was converted, became a hermit, lived thirty years in the desert, and at death the virgin again appeared to him and conducted him to heaven. We have said in the first part of this work that morally speaking it was impossible that a servant of Mary should be lost, but this must be understood with the condition that he lives without sin, or at least he wishes to abandon it, for then Our Lady will assist him. But if any one, on the other hand, should sin, in the hope that Our Lady will save him, he would by his sin render himself unworthy and incapable of the protection of Mary. The second condition is that he perseveres in his devotion to Mary. Perseverance alone shall merit a crown, says St. Bernard. Perseverantia sola meretur coronum. Thomas a Kempis, when a young man, was accustomed daily to have recourse to the Virgin with certain prayers. One day he omitted them, then he omitted them for some weeks, then he gave them up entirely. One night he saw Mary in a dream, who embraced his companions, but having come to him said, What do you expect, who have given up your devotions? Depart, for you are unworthy of my favors. 
Terrified by these words, Thomas awoke and resumed his accustomed prayers. Richard therefore with reason says, He who is perseveringly devoted to Mary will be blessed with hope that all his desires may be gratified. But as no one can be secure of this perseverance, no one can be sure of salvation before his death. It was a very remarkable document, which Brother John Berkmans of the Company of Jesus gave to his companions, when he was requested by them to leave with them in writing what was the most pleasing devotion which they could make to Our Lady, in order to obtain her protection, and he answered, Any small thing, but let it be constant. Quid quid minimum, dum modo sit constans. Finally, however, I add here, simply and in a few words, the different devotions we may offer to our mother, to obtain for us her favor, a thing which I consider the most useful that I have written in this little work. But I do not so much recommend to my reader to practice them all, as to practice those which he selects, with perseverance, and in fear of losing the protection of the Divine Mother, if he neglects to continue them. Oh, how many who are in hell would have been saved if they had continued the devotions which they once commenced to Mary? Devotion 1. Of the Hail Mary. This angelic salutation is very pleasing to the Most Holy Virgin, for it seems to renew, as it were, the joy which she experienced when St. Gabriel announced to her that she was made Mother of God, and therefore we should often salute her with the Hail Mary. Salute her with the angelic salutation, says Thomas Akempis, for gladly does she hear this sound. The Divine Mother herself said to St. Matilda that no one could better salute her than with the Hail Mary. He who salutes Mary will also be saluted by her. St. Bernard heard himself once audibly saluted from a statue of the Virgin, which said to him, Hail Bernard! Ave Bernarde! And the salutation of Mary, says St. Bonaventure, will be some grace, whereby she always responds to those who salute her. And Richard adds, If any one comes to the mother of our Lord, saying, Hail Mary, could she deny him the favor he asks? Mary herself promised St. Gertrude help in death for every Hail Mary, she said. The blessed Alanus asserts, that as all heaven rejoices when a Hail Mary is said, so the devil trembles and flees. Celum gaudet, Satan fuget, cum dico Ave Maria. Which Thomas Akempis also confirms, for a devil who once appeared to him suddenly fled at hearing the Hail Mary. The practice of this devotion is, first, to say every morning on rising and every evening on going to bed, three Hail Marys, prostrate or at least kneeling, adding at each that short prayer. By thy pure and immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. To ask the blessing of Mary as our mother, as St. Stanislaus always did, and place ourselves under the mantle of Our Lady, praying her that during the following day or night she may keep us from sin. And it is a great help to this, to keep near the bed a beautiful image of the Virgin. Second, to say the Angelus, etc., with the three Hail Marys, as usual, in the morning, at noon, and in the evening. John the Twenty-Second was the first Pope, who attached an indulgence to this devotion, on the occasion, as Father Crasset relates, when a criminal who was condemned to be burned, by invoking Mary on the vigil of her Annunciation, remained uninjured, even to his garments, in the midst of the flames. Benedict the Thirteenth, at length, granted a hundred days' indulgence to those who recite it, and at the end of the month, a plenary indulgence, having made their confession and received Holy Communion. Father Crasset also states that there have been other indulgences granted by Clement the Tenth to those who at the end of each Hail Mary add, Thanks be to God and Mary. Deo gratias et Mariae. Formerly, at the sound of the bell, every one knelt to say the Angelus. Now some are ashamed to do so. But St. Charles Borromeo was not ashamed to descend from his carriage or horse, to recite it in the street, and sometimes in the mud. It is related that a certain indolent religious, who would not kneel at the signal for the Hail Mary, saw the belfry bow three times, and a voice spoke from it, which said, 
Behold, thou wilt not do what even senseless creatures do. Let it be remembered that as Benedict the Fourteenth directed in the Paschal season, instead of the Angelus, the Regina Chaley is said, and from Vespers on Saturday through the whole of Sunday, the Angelus Domini is said standing. Third, to salute the Mother of God with a Hail Mary every time the clock strikes. Alphonsus Rodriguez saluted Mary every hour, and in the night when the hour came, the angels woke him, that he might not omit his devotion. Fourth, on quitting or entering the house, to salute the Virgin with a Hail Mary, that at home and abroad she may protect us from sin, and to kiss her feet as the Carthusian fathers are accustomed to do. Fifth, to pay reverence with a Hail Mary to every image of Mary which we meet, and let every one who can do so place some beautiful image of the Virgin in a niche in the walls of his house, that it may be honored by those who are passing by. In Naples, and still more in Rome, there are very beautiful images of Our Lady, by the wayside, placed there by her devout servants. Sixth, the Holy Church directs that the angelic salutation be prefixed to all the canonical hours of the office, and that the office should terminate with it. Hence it is well, at the beginning and end of every action, always to say a Hail Mary. I say of every action, whether it be spiritual, as prayer, confession, communion, spiritual reading, hearing a sermon, etc., or temporal, as study, giving counsel, labor, going to table, to bed, etc. Happy are those actions that are enclosed between two Hail Marys. And thus also on awaking in the morning, on closing the eyes to sleep, in every temptation and peril, in every burst of anger, etc., say always a Hail Mary. My dear reader, practice this, and you will see the advantage to be drawn from it, remembering that for every Hail Mary there are twenty days indulgence. Moreover, Father Ariema relates that the Blessed Virgin promised St. Matilda a good death, if she recited every day three Hail Marys in honor of her power, wisdom, and goodness. And she also said to the Blessed Jane of France, that the Hail Mary was very pleasing to her, especially when said ten times in honor of her ten virtues. Many indulgences are also attached to these ten Hail Marys. Devotion 2 of Novenas the servants of Mary are very attentive and fervent in celebrating the novenas of her feasts, and during these the Holy Virgin, full of love, dispenses to them innumerable and special blessings. One day St. Gertrude saw under the mantle of Mary innumerable souls, whom Our Lady was looking upon with great affection, and she understood them to be those who, on preceding days, had prepared themselves, by devout exercises, for the Feast of the Assumption. The devotions to be used for the novenas are the following. First, mental prayer, morning and evening, with a visit to the Most Holy Sacrament, with the addition of an Our Father, Hail Mary and Glory Be to the Father, etc., repeated nine times. Second, three visits to some image of Mary, thanking the Lord for the graces granted to her, and asking of the Virgin every time some special favor. And at one of these visits, the prayer which is placed at the end of each of her feasts should be read. Third, make many acts of love, at least one hundred, or fifty, to Mary and to Jesus, for we can do nothing more pleasing to her, as she said to St. Bridget, than to love her son. If you wish to become dear to me, love my son Jesus. Cite mihi vis de vincere, ama filium meum Jesu. Fourth, read every day of the novena for a quarter of an hour, some book which treats of her glories. Fifth, make some external mortification of hair cloth, discipline, etc., with fasting or some abstinence at table from fruits or other agreeable food, at least in part, chewing also some bitter herb. And on the vigil of the feast, fast on bread and water. But all this must be done always with the permission of a spiritual father. But better than all others are the practices in these novenas of internal mortifications, as abstaining from the indulgence of curiosity, either through the eye or the ear, remaining retired and silent, obeying, not answering with impatience, 
bearing contradictions, and other things of the sort, which may be used with less danger of vainglory and greater merit, and for these too, the permission of the director is not needed. The most useful exercise is to propose, at the beginning, the amending of some fault into which we are most liable to fall, and to this end it is well, at each of the visits above named, to ask pardon for some past sin, renew the intention of avoiding it in future, and implore the help of Mary in keeping this resolution. The honor most dear to the Virgin is the imitation of her virtues, wherefore it is well in every novena to propose to oneself some special virtue of Mary, particularly adapted to the mystery. As for example, on the Feast of the Conception, purity of intention. Of her nativity, the renewing of the spirit and the awakening from tepidity. Of her presentation, detachment from something to which we are most attached. Of the Annunciation, humility in bearing contempt, etc. Of the Visitation, charity towards the neighbor, almsgiving, etc. Or at least, the praying for sinners. Of the Purification, obedience to superiors. And finally, of the Assumption, the practice of detachment, and doing all things as a preparation for death, living as if every day were to be the last. In this way the novena will prove of great service. Sixth, besides the communion on the day of the feast, it is well to ask it more frequently of the spiritual father on the days of the novena. Father Signeri said that we cannot honor Mary better than with Jesus. For she herself, as Father Crasset relates, revealed to a holy soul that nothing dearer could be offered to her than the Holy Communion, for there Jesus Christ gathers in the soul the fruit of his passion. Hence it appears that the Virgin desires nothing from her servants more than the Holy Communion, saying, Come, eat the bread and drink the wine that I have prepared for you. Finally, on the day of the feast, after communion, we should offer ourselves for the service of this Divine Mother by asking of her the grace of the virtue proposed in the novena, or some other special favor. And it is well every year to set apart among others some feasts of the Virgin, to which we have the greatest devotion and tenderness, and make a particular preparation for this by dedicating ourselves anew, and in a more especial manner, to her service, choosing her for our Lady, Advocate, and Mother." then we should ask pardon for our negligence in her service during the past year, promising her greater fidelity for the year that is to come. In a word, let us pray for her to accept us as her servants and obtain for us a holy death. Devotion 3. Of the Rosary and Office The devotion of the Most Holy Rosary is known to have been revealed to St. Dominic by the Divine Mother herself, when the saint, being in affliction, and bewailing to his lady the conduct of the Albigensian heretics, who at that time were doing great injury to the church, the virgin said to her, This earth will always be barren until the rain falls on it. St. Dominic was then given to understand that this rain was to be the devotion of the rosary, and that he was to publish it. And indeed the saint preached it everywhere, and this devotion was embraced by all Catholics, so that, at the present day, there is no devotion more practiced by the faithful of every condition than that of the Most Holy Rosary. What have not modern heretics, as Calvin, Boucher, and others said, to bring into contempt the use of the Rosary? But the great good is well known, which this noble devotion has brought to the world. How many by its means have been freed from sin? How many led to a holy life? How many have had a good death and are now saved? Let us read the various books which treat of it. It is enough to know that this devotion has been approved by the Holy Church, and the sovereign pontiffs have attached indulgences to it. To him who recites the third part of the rosary, the indulgence of seventy thousand years is granted, and to him who recites it entire, eighty thousand, and yet more to him who recites it in the chapel of the rosary. Benedict the thirteenth at length annexed to the rosary, for him at least who recites the third part of the rosary, which has been blessed by the Dominican fathers, all the indulgences which are attached to the rosaries of St. Bridget, namely, one hundred days for every Hail Mary and Our Father, that is repeated. 
and moreover those who recite the rosary gain the plenary indulgence on all the principal feasts of mary and of the holy church and also of the dominican saints if they visit their churches after confession and communion but let it be remarked that this is understood of those whose names are inscribed in the book of the rosary to whom a plenary indulgence is also granted on the day when their names are inscribed provided they have made their confession and communion and one hundred years if they wear the rosary and to those who make mental prayer once a day seven years each time and a plenary indulgence at the end of the month in order to gain the indulgences attached to the recitation of the rosary it is necessary to meditate on the mysteries which are to be found recorded in many books but it is sufficient for those who do not know them to contemplate any one of the mysteries of the passion of jesus christ as the scourging death etc the rosary must be recited with devotion and here call to mind what the holy virgin said to saint eulalia namely that she was better pleased with five decades said with pauses and devotion than with fifteen in haste and with less devotion on this account it is well to say the rosary kneeling and before some image of mary and at the beginning of every decade to make an act of love to jesus and mary by asking some favor and moreover let it be remarked that it is more efficacious to say the rosary in company with others than to say it alone urban the second attached many indulgences to the recitation of the little office of our lady which is said to have been composed by saint peter damien and the holy virgin has often made known how pleasing to her was this devotion as we learn from father Ariema, the litanies are also very pleasing to her and an indulgence of two hundred days is granted every time they are recited also the hymn hail star of the sea ave maris stella which the divine mother ordered saint bridget to repeat every day and more than that the magnificat for with this we praise her in the very words with which she prays god devotion for of fasting many servants of mary on saturdays and the vigils of her feast are accustomed to honor her by fasting on bread and water it is well known that saturday is a day dedicated by the holy church to the honor of the virgin because on this day says saint bernard she remained constant in the faith after the death of her son for this reason the servants of mary never fail on this day to offer her some special homage and particularly the fast on bread and water as saint charles borromeo cardinal toledo and so many others practiced it retard bishop of bomberg and father joseph ariaga of the society of jesus did not even taste food on saturday the great graces which the mother of god afterwards bestowed upon those who practiced this devotion may be read in the writings of father ariema it is sufficient for us to mention the compassion which she showed to that bandit chief who on account of this devotion was permitted to remain alive although his head had been cut off and although he was under the displeasure of god and was enabled to make his confession before dying he afterwards declared that the holy virgin for this fasting which he had offered had preserved him in life and he then suddenly expired it would not then be a very extraordinary thing if any one especially devoted to mary and particularly if he had already deserved hell should offer to her this fast on saturday he who practices this devotion i may say will hardly be condemned not that our lady will deliver him by a miracle if he dies in mortal sin as happened to the bandit such prodigies of divine mercy seldom take place and it would be madness to expect external salvation by them but i do say that the divine mother will readily obtain perseverance in divine grace and a good death for him who will practice this devotion all the brothers of our little congregation who can do so fast on bread and water on saturday in honor of mary i say those who can do so meaning that if any one is prevented from doing so on account of ill health at least on saturday he may content himself with one dish make a common fast or at least abstain from fruits or other agreeable food it is necessary on saturday to offer special devotions to our lady to receive communion or at least hear mass visit some image of the virgin wear hair cloth and the like 
and at least on the vigils of the seven feasts of Mary, let her servants endeavor to offer this fasting on bread, or any other manner they are able. Devotion 5. Of Visiting the Images of Mary Father Signieri says that the devil could in no better way console himself for the losses he has sustained by the overthrow of idolatry than by attacking sacred images through the heretics but the Holy Church has defended them even by the blood of the martyrs, and the Divine Mother has also made manifest by miracles how much she is pleased by devotion and visits to her images. The hand of St. John of Damascus was cut off because he defended with his pen the images of Mary, but Our Lady restored it to him in a miraculous manner. Father Spinelli relates that in Constantinople, every Friday after Vespers, a veil which hung before the image of Mary was withdrawn of itself, and after Vespers on Saturday it closed of itself. The veil before an image of the Virgin was seen to withdraw itself, in a similar way, by St. John of God, whereupon the sacristan, believing the saint to be a robber, struck him with his foot, but the foot was withered. All the servants of Mary, therefore, are accustomed often to visit her images with great devotion, and also the churches dedicated to her honor. There are, indeed, as John of Damascus teaches, the cities of refuge, where we find safety from temptations, and from the punishments merited by the sins we have committed. St. Henry, the emperor, when he entered a city, always visited, before anything else, some church of Our Lady. Father Thomas Sanchez never returned home until he had visited some church of Mary. Let us not be weary, then, of visiting our queen every day in some church or chapel, or in our own house, where it would be well for that purpose to have in some retired place a little oratory, with her image adorned with drapery, flowers, tapers, or lamps, and before it also the litanies, the rosary, etc., may be said. For this purpose I have published a little book, which has already gone through eight editions, of visits to the Most Holy Sacrament, as well as to the Virgin, for every day in the month. Some devout servant of Mary may cause one of her feasts to be celebrated in some church or chapel, and preceding it by a novena, with the exposition of the sacrament, and also with sermons. But here it is well to notice the fact which Father Spinelli relates in the miracles of the Madonna. In the year 1611, in the celebrated sanctuary of Mary in Monte Virgine, it happened that on the vigil of Pentecost, the people who thronged there profaned that feast with balls, excesses, and immodest conduct, when a fire was suddenly discovered, bursting forth from the house of entertainment where they were feasting, so that in less than an hour and a half it was consumed, and more than 1,500 persons were killed. Five persons who remained alive affirmed upon oath that they had seen the mother of God herself, who with two lighted torches set fire to the inn. After this I entreated the servants of Mary to abstain as far as they can, and to induce others to abstain from going to such sanctuaries of Our Lady in times of feasting, for hell then received much more fruit from it than the Divine Mother received honor. Let him who practices this devotion go and visit them at a time when they are not thronged. Devotion 6. Of the Scapular. As men take pride in having others wear their livery, so the Most Holy Mary is pleased when her servants wear her scapular, as a mark that they have dedicated themselves to her service, and are of the number of the family of the Mother of God. Modern heretics, of course, ridicule this devotion, but the Holy Church has approved it by many bulls and indulgences. And Father Crasset relates, and also Father Lazana, when speaking of the scapular of Mount Carmel, that about the year 1251, the Holy Virgin appeared to the blessed Simon Stock, an Englishman, and giving him her scapular, said to him that those who wore it should be saved from eternal damnation in these words. Receive, O my very beloved son, this scapular of thy order, the badge of my confraternity, a privilege granted to thee and to all other Carmelites, and any one who wears this at death shall be delivered from eternal flames. And Father Crasset still further relates that Mary appeared at another time to Pope John the Twenty-Second, 
and directed him to declare to those who wore the above-mentioned scapular that they should be released from purgatory on the Saturday after their death. This the same pontiff announced in his bull, which was afterwards confirmed by Alexander V, Clement the Seventh, and others, as the above-named Father Crasset relates in the passage above cited. And as we have remarked in the first part, Paul V mentions the same, and appears to explain the bulls of the preceding pontiffs, prescribing in his bull the conditions to be observed, in order to gain the indulgences annexed, namely, the observance of chastity according to the state of life, the recitation of the little office of the Virgin, and for him who cannot recite that, the observance, at least, of the feasts of the church and abstinence from meat on Wednesday. Thus the indulgences that are attached to the scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, as well as the others of the Dolores of Mary, of Mary of Mercy, and particularly to that of the Conception, are innumerable, daily, and plenary in life and at the article of death. For myself, I have taken all the above-mentioned scapulars, and let it be particularly made known that, besides many particular indulgences, there are annexed to the scapular of the Immaculate Conception, which is blessed by the Theatine Fathers, all the indulgences which are granted to any religious order, pious place or person, and particularly by reciting Our Father, Hail Mary, and Glory Be to the Father six times, in honor of the Most Holy Trinity and of the Immaculate Mary, are gained each time all the indulgences of Rome, Portiuncula, Jerusalem, Galatia, which reach the number of 433 plenary indulgences, besides the temporal, which are innumerable. All this is transcribed from a sheet printed by the same Theatine Fathers. Devotion 7. Of Entering into the Confraternities of Mary. Some persons disapprove of confraternities, saying that they give rise to contention, and that many persons join them for human ends. But as the Church and the sacraments are not condemned, because there are many who abuse them, neither should we condemn the confraternities. The sovereign pontiffs, instead of condemning them, have approved and highly commended them, and enriched them with indulgences. St. Francis of Sales earnestly exhorts laymen to enter into the confraternities. What did not St. Charles Borromeo do to establish and multiply these sodalities? And in his synods, he distinctly intimates to confessors that they should endeavor to induce their penitents to join them and with reason, for these confraternities, especially those of Our Lady, are like so many arcs of Noah, in which the poor people of the world may find refuge from the deluge of temptations and sins which inundate them in it. We will learn in the course of our missions the utility of these confraternities. Speaking exactly, there are found more sins in a man who does not belong to the confraternities than in twenty who frequent them. The confraternity may be said to be the Tower of David. The Tower of David, a thousand bucklers hang upon it, all the armor of valiant men. And this is the cause of the good obtained from the confraternities, namely, that their members acquire in them many defenses against hell, and they make use in them of many means to preserve themselves in divine grace, which it is very difficult for persons in the world who are not in confraternities, to practice. In the first place, one of the means of salvation is meditating on eternal truths. Remember thy last end, and thou shalt never sin. And so many are lost because they do not think of it. With desolation is the land made desolate, because there is none that considereth in the heart. But those who belong to the confraternity are led to think by the many meditations, readings and sermons that are made there. My sheep hear my voice. Ovis mei, vocem mei audient. Secondly, in order to be saved, it is necessary to commend oneself to God. Ask and you shall receive. Petite et acipietis. And the brothers of the confraternities do this continually. And God hears them more graciously, because he has himself said, that he will willingly grant great graces to prayers made in common. If two of you shall agree upon earth concerning anything, whatsoever they shall ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. 
concerning which St. Ambrose says, Many who are small, if they unite together, become great, and the prayers of many cannot but be heard. In the third place, in the confraternity, the sacraments are more frequently approached, on account of the rules, as well as on account of the example of other members. And by this means, perseverance in divine grace is more easily obtained, the Holy Council of Trent having declared the communion to be an antidote by which we are freed from daily sins and are preserved from mortal sins. Fourthly, besides the sacraments and the sodalities, there are practiced many exercises of mortification, humility and charity towards infirm and poor members, and it would be well if in every confraternity were introduced the holy custom of assisting the infirm poor of the country. It would be a still greater advantage if there could be introduced into them, in the honor of the Divine Mother, the secret sodality of more fervent members. I will here enumerate the exercises that are usually practiced in these. 1. Half an hour of reading. 2. Vespers and Compline of the Holy Spirit are said. 3. The litanies of the Virgin are repeated, and then some brothers who are designated practice mortification by bearing the cross upon their shoulders, or others of the similar kind. 4. For one quarter of an hour, a meditation is made on the Passion of Jesus Christ. 5. Each one accuses himself of any violation against the rules of which he has been guilty, and receives penance for it from the Father of the Congregation. 6. The little flowers of mortification made during the past week are read by one of the brothers, who is selected, and then the novenas to be said are announced, etc. Finally, the discipline is made for the space of a miserere, and a salve, and every one kisses the feet of the crucifix, which is at the foot of the altar. The rules, then, would be for each brother. 1. To make a meditation every day. 2. A visit to the Most Holy Sacrament and to the Blessed Virgin. 3. In the evening, an examination of conscience. 4. Spiritual reading. 5. To avoid games and the conversation of the world. 6. To frequent the communion and practice some mortification of the chain, discipline, etc. 7. To recommend every day to God, the souls in purgatory, and sinners. 8. If any brother is sick, to visit him. But let us return to our subject. In the fifth place, it has already been said how much more sure is our salvation if we serve the mother of God, and do not the brothers serve her in the congregation? How much do they praise her there? How many prayers do they offer up to her? There they consecrate themselves from the beginning to her service, choosing her in an especial manner for their lady and mother, and they are inscribed in the book of the children of Mary. Hence, as they are distinguished servants and children of the Virgin, she therefore treats them with distinction and protects them in life and in death. Thus a brother of the confraternity would say that, with the confraternity, he has received every blessing. Now all good things come to me together with her. Venerut mihi omnia bona periter cum ila. Every brother should pay particular attention to two things. First, as to the end, that is, to enter the confraternity for no other end, but to serve God and his holy mother, and save his own soul. Two, not to leave the congregation on the appointed days, for affairs of the world, since there the most important business in the world is to be transacted, namely, eternal salvation. Endeavor always to draw as many as you can to the confraternity, and especially to induce those brothers who have left it to return to it again. Oh, what terrible punishments has our Lord caused those to suffer, who have abandoned the confraternity of Our Lady? In Naples, a certain brother left the congregation, and being exhorted to return, he said, I will return when my legs are broken and my head cut off. And he was a prophet, for very soon after, his legs were broken and his head cut off by some of his enemies. On the other hand, the members who persevered are favored by Mary with spiritual and temporal good. All her domestics are clothed with double garments. Omnis domestici eius, vestiti sunt duplicibus. 
we may read in father ariema the special graces granted by mary to the brothers of the confraternity in death and in life but especially in death father crasset relates that in fifteen eighty six there was a youth who being near death fell asleep but afterwards awakening he said to his confessor o oh, father i have been in great danger of hell but my lady has rescued me the devils have presented my sins before the tribunal of the lord and already they were dragging me to hell but the holy virgin came and said to them where are you taking this youth what have you to do with one of my servants who has so long served me in the congregation the devils fled and thus i have been saved from their hands the same author relates soon after that another brother of the congregation also at the point of death had a great conflict with hell but he conquered and full of joy exclaimed oh what blessings come from serving the blessed mother well in her confraternity and thus entirely consoled he died he afterwards adds that the duke of popoli being on his deathbed said to his son my son i know that the little good i have done in life i owe to the congregation and therefore i have no greater good to leave thee than the confraternity of mary i am more proud of having been a brother of the congregation than the duke of popoli devotion eight of alms in honor of mary the servants of mary are accustomed especially on saturday to give alms in honor of the divine mother that holy shoemaker called saint deus did it god gave as saint gregory relates in his dialogues dispensed to the poor on saturday all that he earned during the week and another holy soul saw in a vision a sumptuous palace which god was preparing in heaven for this servant of mary in the building of which nothing was done except on saturday saint gerard never refused anything that was asked of him in the name of mary father martin gutierrez of the society of jesus did the same and he confessed that he had never asked a favor from mary that he had not received and this servant of hers having been slain by the huguenots the divine mother appeared to his companions accompanied by some virgins whom she directed to wrap the body in a sheet and carry it away saint eberard of salisbury practiced the same devotion and on this account a holy monk saw him in the form of a child in the arms of mary who said this is my son eberard who never has refused me anything alexander de hales practiced the same who having been requested by a lay brother of saint francis in the name of mary to become a franciscan left the world and entered into the order let not the servants of the virgin then be weary of giving daily some little alms in her honor and increase it every saturday and if they can do nothing else at least for love of mary perform some other act of charity as visiting the sick praying for sinners and for the souls in purgatory etc works of mercy are very pleasing to this mother of mercy devotion nine of frequent recourse to mary of all devotions none is so pleasing to our mother as recurring often to her intercession by asking help of her in all special necessities as in taking or giving counsel in dangers afflictions and temptations particularly in temptations against purity the divine mother will certainly deliver us if we have recourse to her with the antiphon we fly to thy patronage sub tuum presidium etc or with a hail mary or only invoking the most holy name of mary which has particular power against demons the blessed saint francis in a temptation against purity had recourse to mary and she immediately appeared to him and placing her hand upon his breast delivered him it is useful to kiss or press the rosary or the scapular or even to look on some image of the virgin and be it known that benedict the thirteenth granted fifty days indulgence to those who pronounce the name of jesus and mary tenth and last devotion i unite in this various practices of devotion in honor of mary one to celebrate or cause to be celebrated or at least to hear mass in honor of the holy virgin it is true that the holy sacrifice of the mass can be offered only to god to whom it is offered principally in acknowledgment of his supreme dominion but as the sacred council of trent declares 
This does not prevent it from being offered to God in gratitude for the graces bestowed on the saints and his most holy mother, and in commemoration of them, that they may deign to intercede for us. And therefore it is said in the Mass, that it may avail to their honor, but to our salvation. This offering of the Mass, as also the repeating three Our Fathers, Hail Marys, and Glories, to the Most Holy Trinity, in gratitude for the graces granted to Mary, she herself revealed to a soul, were very pleasing to her. For the Virgin not being able fully to thank the Lord for all the favors bestowed on her, is pleased when her children help her to thank God. Second, to reverence the saints who are most closely united to Mary, as St. Joseph, St. Joachim, and St. Anne. The Virgin herself recommended to a nobleman the devotion to St. Anne, her mother. And we should also honor the saints who had the most special devotion to the Divine Mother. As St. John the Evangelist, St. John the Baptist, St. Bernard, St. John of Damascus, the defender of her images, St. Ildelphinus, the defender of her virginity, etc. Third, to read every day some book which treats of the glories of Mary, to preach, or at least recommend to all, particularly to one's relatives, devotion to the Divine Mother. The Virgin one day said to St. Bridget, Make thy children my children to pray daily for the living and dead, who are most devoted to Mary. Let us here enumerate many other indulgences granted by the pontiffs to those who, in various ways, honor this Queen of Heaven. First, to those who say, Blessed be the holy and immaculate conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, an indulgence of one hundred years is granted. And when after the word immaculate, the word most pure is added, according to Father Crasset, other indulgences are granted, applicable to the souls in purgatory. Second, for the Salve Regina, 40 days. Third, litanies, 200 days. Fourth, to those who bow the head at the names of Jesus and of Mary, 20 days. Fifth, to those who repeat five Our Fathers and Hail Marys in the honor of the Passion of Jesus and the Dolores of Mary, 10,000 years. And for the convenience of devout souls, I will here mention other indulgences attached by the Supreme Pontiffs to other devotions. First, to him who hears Mass, 3,800 years. Second, Benedict the Fourteenth granted seven years indulgence to those who make the Christian acts with the intention of receiving in life and in death the Holy Sacraments. And if they are continued for a month, plenary indulgence applicable to the souls in purgatory, or to themselves at the article of death. Third, to those who recite fifteen Our Fathers and Hail Marys for sinners, remission of the third part of their sins. Fourth, Pope Benedict the Fourteenth has granted more indulgences to those who make mental prayer for half an hour every day, and plenary once a month, after confession and communion. Fifth, to those who recite the prayer, Soul of Christ, Anima Christi, etc., 300 days. Six, those who accompany the Viaticum obtain five years indulgence, and with lights, seven years. And those who cannot do this, if they accompany it, reciting an Our Father and Hail Mary, 100 days. Seventh, those who kneel before the Most Holy Sacrament gain 200 days. Eighth, those who kiss the cross, one year and forty days. Those who bow the head at the glory be to the Father, thirty days. Ninth, to priests who before Mass recite, I wish to celebrate Mass and Ego volo celebrare misum, etc. Fifty days are granted. Tenth, to those who kiss the regular scapular, five years. Other indulgences may be found in the works of Father Viva. Let every one endeavor, when seeking the above named indulgences, to make an act of contrition, that he may be in a disposition to gain them. I omit other devotions, which are to be found in other books, as the seven joys, the twelve privileges of Mary, and the like, and let us terminate this work with the beautiful words of St. Bernadine. O woman, blessed among all women, thou art the honor of the human race, the salvation of our people. Thou hast a merit that has no limits, and an entire power over all creatures. 
Thou art the mother of God, the mistress of the world, the queen of heaven. Thou art the dispenser of all graces, the glory of the holy church. Thou art the example of the just, the consolation of the saints, and the source of our salvation. Thou art the joy of paradise, the gate of heaven, the glory of God. Behold, we have published thy praises. We supplicate thee then, O mother of mercy, to strengthen our weakness, to pardon our boldness, to accept our service, to bless our labors, and impress thy love upon the hearts of all, that after having honored and loved thy son on earth, we may praise and bless him eternally in heaven. Amen. And with this, my dear reader and brother, lover of our mother Mary, I leave you, saying to you, continue joyfully to honor and love this good lady. Endeavor also to promote the love of her wherever you can, and do not doubt, but securely trust that if you persevere in true devotion to Mary, even until death, your salvation will be certain. I finish, not because I have nothing more to say of the glories of this great queen, but that I may not weary you. The little I have written may indeed be enough to charm you with this great treasure of devotion to the mother of God, with which she will correspond with her powerful patronage. Except then the desire I have had by this my work to see you safe and holy, to see you become a loving and ardently devoted child of this most amiable queen. And if you know that this book of mine has aided you somewhat, I pray you of your charity, recommend me to Mary, and ask of her the grace that I ask for you, namely, that we may both meet in paradise at her feet, together with all her other dear children. And last of all, I turn to thee, O mother of my Lord, and my mother Mary. I pray thee to accept these poor labors, and the desire I have had to see thee praised and loved by all. Thou knowest how much I have desired to complete this, my little work, on thy glories, before my life, which is now drawing to a close, should end. I now say that I die content, leaving on the earth this book of mine, which will continue to praise and to preach thee, as I have endeavored always to do, in these years since my conversion, which through thee I have obtained from God. O Immaculate Mary, I recommend to thee all those who love thee, and especially those who will read this, my book, and especially those who will exercise the charity of recommending me to thee. O Lady, give them perseverance, make them all saints, and thus bring us all to praise thee together in heaven. O my most sweet mother, it is true that I am a poor sinner, but I glory in loving thee, and I hope great things from thee, among others, that I may die loving thee. I hope in the sufferings of my death, when the devil will place my sins before me, that first the passion of Jesus, and next thy intercession, may give me comfort to quit this miserable life in the grace of God, to come to love him and thank thee, O my mother, through all eternity. Amen. Thus I hope, thus may it be. O lady, say for us to thy son, they have no wine. How bright and clear is the intoxicating cup of this wine! The love of God inebriates us even to contempt of the world. It warms and strengthens us, renders us insensible to temporal things, and inclined to heavenly things. Thou art a fruitful field, full of virtues, full of graces. Thou didst come forth as a bright and ruddy dawn, for original sin being destroyed in the womb of thy mother, thou wast born bright in the knowledge of truth, and ruddy with the love of virtue. No enemy has power against thee, for a thousand bucklers hang upon thee, all the armor of the valiant men. For there is no virtue which does not shine in thee, and thou in thyself dost possess all that belongs to every saint. O our lady, our mediatrix, our advocate, commend us to thy son. O blessed one, obtain by the grace which thou didst merit, that he who, through thy means, has deigned to become a partaker of our infirmity and misery, thou also interceding, may make us partakers of his blessedness and glory. Live Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. End of section 50.
Section 51 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Various additional examples appertaining to the Most Holy Mary, meditations for various festivals, and different devotions in her honor. Part 1. Some persons, boasting of being free from prejudices, take great credit to themselves for believing no miracles but those recorded in the Holy Scriptures, esteeming all others as tales and fables for foolish women. But it will be well to repeat here a just remark of the learned and pious Father John Crasset, who says that the bad are as ready to deride miracles as the good are to believe them, adding that as it is a weakness to give credit to all things, so on the other hand, to reject miracles which come to us attested by grave and pious men, either savors of infidelity, which supposes them impossible to God, or of presumption, which refuses belief to such a class of authors. We give credit to a Tacitus or a Suetonius, and can we deny it without presumption, to Christian authors of learning and probity? There is less risk, says Father Canisius, in believing and receiving what is related with some probability by honest persons, and not rejected by the learned, and which serves for the edification of our neighbor, than in rejecting it with a disdainful and presumptuous spirit. First example. A certain man in Germany had committed a great sin, and was ashamed to confess it, yet on the other hand, he could not endure the remorse which he felt, and went to cast himself into the river. But just as he was on the point of doing so, he stopped, and bursting into tears, prayed God to pardon him without confession. One night in his sleep, he felt someone waking him, and heard a voice saying, Go and make your confession. He went to the church, but yet did not make his confession. He heard the same voice a second night. Again he went to the church, but after he had entered it, said that he would rather die than confess that sin. He was about to return home, when he thought he would go and recommend himself to the Most Holy Mary, before her image which was in the church. He had hardly kneeled before it, when he felt himself entirely changed. He immediately arose, called for a confessor, and weeping bitterly, through grace received from the Virgin, made a sincere confession, and he afterwards said that he felt greater satisfaction than if he had gained all the gold in the world. 2. A young nobleman was reading one day, while at sea, an obscene book, in which he took great pleasure. A religious said to him, Now come, would you give something to Our Lady? Yes, he answered, and the other said, I wish that, for the love of the Holy Virgin, you would tear that book into pieces and cast it into the sea. Here it is, Father, said the young man. No, said the religious, I wish that you yourself would make this offering to Mary. He did so, and when he returned to Genoa, his native place, the mother of God so inflamed his heart with the love of God that he became a religious. 3. A hermit of Mount Olivet had in his cell a holy image of Mary, and frequently offered up prayers before it. The devil could not endure such devotion to the Holy Virgin, and tormented him continually, with temptations against purity, and the poor old hermit finding himself still pursued by them, notwithstanding all his prayers and mortifications, said one day to the enemy, What have I done to you that you will not leave me in peace? And the demon appeared to him and answered, You torment me more than I torment you. And then he added, now come and swear secrecy to me, and I will tell you what you must cease to do if you wish me not to molest you any more. The hermit took the oath, and then the devil said to him, I wish you never again to approach that image that you have in your cell. The hermit was greatly perplexed, and went to take counsel of the abbot Theodore, who told him that he was not bound by his oath, and that he must not cease to recommend himself to Mary before that image, as he had done before. The hermit obeyed, and the devil was put to shame and conquered. 4. A woman who had been guilty of a criminal connection with two men, one of whom had killed the other, came one day in great terror to Father Onefrio Donna, 
a pious missionary in the kingdom of Naples, to make her confession. She told the father that in the same hour in which that wretched youth had died, he appeared to her clothed in black, loaded with chains, and cast fire on every side. He had a sword in his hand, and raised it to cut her throat. In terror, she exclaimed, What have I done to you that you wish to kill me? And in rage, he answered, Wretch, do you ask what you have done to me? You have caused me to lose God. Then she invoked the Blessed Virgin, and that specter, on hearing the most holy name of Mary pronounced, disappeared and was seen no more. 5. When St. Dominic was preaching at Carcassonne, in France, an Albigensian heretic, who was possessed by demons, was brought to him, because he had publicly spoken against the devotion of the Most Holy Rosary. The saint then ordered the demons, in the name of God, to declare whether those things which he had said concerning the Most Holy Rosary were true, and howling with rage they said, Hear, O Christians, all that this our enemy has said of Mary and of the Most Holy Rosary is entirely true. They added, moreover, that they had no power against the servants of Mary, and that many who at death invoked Mary were saved, contrary to their deserts. And finally they said, We are constrained to declare that no one is lost who perseveres in devotion to Mary and in the devotion of the Most Holy Rosary, for Mary obtains for sinners a true repentance before death. St. Dominic made the people immediately repeat the rosary, and, O oh miracle, at every Hail Mary, many devils went out from that wretched man, in the shape of burning coals, so that when the rosary was finished, he was entirely freed from them, and many heretics became converted. 6. The daughter of a certain prince had entered a monastery where the discipline was so relaxed that, although she was a young person of good dispositions, she advanced but little in virtue. By the advice of a good confessor, she began to say the rosary with the mysteries, and became so changed that she was an example to all. The other religious, taking offense at her for withdrawing from them, attacked her on all sides, to induce her to abandon her newly begun way of life. One day, while she was repeating the rosary, and praying Mary to assist her in that persecution, she saw a letter fall from above. On the outside were written these words, Mary, Mother of God, to her daughter Jane, greeting, and within, My child, continue to say my rosary. Withdraw from intercourse from those who do not help you to live well, Beware of idleness and vanity. Take from thy cell two superfluous things, and I will be your protectress with God. The abbot of that monastery soon after visited it, and attempted to reform it, but he did not succeed. And one day he saw a great number of demons entering the cells of all the nuns except that of Jane, for the Divine Mother, before whose image he saw her praying, banished them from that. When he heard from her of the devotion of the rosary which she practiced, and the letter she had received, he ordered all the others to repeat it, and it is related that this monastery became a paradise. 7. There lived in Rome a woman, called Catherine the Beautiful, who led a very sinful life. Hearing St. Dominic once preach on the devotion of the Most Holy Rosary, she had her name inscribed in the book of the Confraternity, and began to recite it, but did not abandon her sinful life. One evening a youth, apparently a noble, came to her house, whom she received courteously. When they were at supper, she saw drops of blood falling from his hands, while he was breaking a piece of bread, and then she observed that all the food he took was tinged with blood. She asked him what that blood meant, and the youth answered, that a Christian should take no food that was not tinged with the blood of Jesus Christ, seasoned with the memory of his passion. Amazed at this, she asked him who he was. Soon, he answered, I will show you. And when they had withdrawn into another apartment, the appearance of the youth changed, and he showed himself crowned with thorns, his flesh torn, and he said to her, do you wish to know who I am? Do you not know me? I am thy Redeemer, Catherine. When will you cease to offend me? See how much I have suffered for you. You have grieved me enough. Change your life. 
Catherine began to weep bitterly, and Jesus, encouraging her, said, Now begin to love me as much as you have offended me, and know that you have received this grace from me, on account of the rosary you have been accustomed to recite in honor of my mother. And then he disappeared. Catherine went in the morning to make her confession to St. Dominic, and giving to the poor all she possessed, led so holy a life that she attained a great perfection. The Virgin often appeared to her, and Jesus himself revealed to St. Dominic that this penitent had become very dear to him. 8. The Blessed Alanus relates of a lady named Dominica, who was accustomed to recite the rosary, that she gave up this devotion, and afterwards became so poor, that in desperation she stabbed herself in three different places. But just as she was breathing her last, and the devils came to take her to hell, the Most Holy Mary appeared to her, and said to her, My daughter, you have forgotten me, but I have not been willing to forget you, on account of that rosary which you have for a time recited in my honor. And now, she added, if you will continue to recite it, I will restore life to you, and also the possessions you have lost. Dominica was restored to health, and continuing the practice of reciting the rosary, recovered her possessions, and at her death was again visited by Mary, who commended her fidelity, and she died a holy death. 9. There lived in Saragossa a certain noble, a very bad man, his name was Peter, and he was a relation of St. Dominic. One day when the saint was preaching, he saw Peter enter the church, and he prayed the Lord that he would make known to the audience the condition of that miserable sinner. And behold, Peter then appeared like a monster from hell, surrounded and dragged along by many devils. The congregation fled, even his wife who was in the church, and the servants who accompanied him. Then St. Dominic directed him, through one of his companions, to recommend himself to Mary, and to begin to recite the rosary which he sent him. Peter received the message, humbled himself, sent to thank the saint, and received himself the grace to see the demons that surrounded him. He afterwards went to make his confession to the saint himself, from whom he received the assurance that he was already pardoned, and continuing to recite the rosary, he attained to so happy a state that one day the Lord made him appear in church in the presence of the whole congregation, crowned with three crowns of roses. 10. In the mountains of Trent lived a notorious robber who, when he was one day admonished by a religious to change his course of life, answered that for him there was no remedy. Do not say so, said the religious. Do what I tell you. Fast on Saturday in honor of Mary, and on that day do no harm to anyone, and she will obtain for you the grace of not dying under the displeasure of God. The obedient robber followed this advice, and made a vow to continue to do so. That he might not break it, he from that time went unarmed on Saturdays. It happened that on a Saturday he was found by the officers of justice, and that he might not break his oath, he allowed himself to be taken without resistance. The judge, when he saw that he was a gray-haired old man, wished to pardon him, but, through the grace of compunction, which he had received from Mary, he said that he wished to die in punishment of his sins. He also made a public confession of all the sins of his life in that same judgment hall, weeping so bitterly that all present wept for him. He was beheaded and buried with but little ceremony in a grave dug nearby. But afterwards the mother of God appeared with four holy virgins who took the dead body from that place, wrapped it in a rich cloth embroidered with gold and bore it themselves to the gate of the city. There the blessed virgin said to the guards, Tell the bishop from me to give an honorable burial in such a church to this dead person, for he was my faithful servant. And this was done. All the people of the place thronged to the spot, where they found the corpse with the rich pall, and the bier on which it was placed. And from that time, says Cesarius, all persons in that region began to fast on Saturdays. 11. A devout servant of Mary, who lived in Portugal, fasted on bread and water every Saturday of his life, in honor of Mary, and chose for his advocates with the Blessed Virgin, St. Michael, and St. John the Evangelist. 
at the hour of his death the queen of heaven appeared to him with those saints who were praying for him and the holy virgin looking upon her servant with a joyful countenance said to those saints i will not depart hence without taking this soul with me twelve in one of our missions after the sermon on mary which it was our custom to preach a very old man came to one of the fathers of our congregation to make his confession he was full of consolation and said our lady has done me a favor and what favor has she done you asked the confessor for thirty-five years father i have made sacrilegious confessions because i was ashamed of one sin and yet i have passed through many dangers and have been several times at the point of death and if i had died then i certainly should have been lost and now our lady has done me the favor to touch my heart and when he said this he wept so bitterly that he seemed to be all tenderness after the father had heard his confession he asked him what devotion he had practiced and he answered that he had never failed on saturday to keep a strict fast in honor of mary and therefore the virgin had taken pity on him and he gave the father permission to publish the fact in his sermons thirteen in the country of normandy a certain robber was beheaded and his head was thrown into a trench but afterwards it was heard crying mary give me confession a priest went to him and heard his confession and questioning him as to his practices of devotion the robber answered that he had no other except that of fasting one day of the week in honor of the holy virgin and that for this our lady had obtained for him the grace to be delivered from hell by that confession fourteen there were two young noblemen living in the city of madrid who encouraged each other in their sinful life one of them saw one night in a dream his companion seized by some moors and carried to the shore of a stormy sea they were about to do the same with him but he had recourse to mary and made a vow that he would become a religious at once and thus he was rescued from these moors then he saw jesus seated on a throne and as if in anger and the holy virgin supplicating and obtaining mercy for him when his friend came to visit him he related to him the vision but he laughed at it and shortly after was stabbed with a poignard and died when the other youth saw the vision verified he made his confession and was strengthened in his resolution of becoming a religious in view of that he sold all that he had but instead of giving the money to the poor as he had intended he expended it in debauchery he afterwards fell ill and had another vision he thought he saw hell opened and the divine judge in the act of condemning him again he had recourse to mary and mary again delivered him he was restored to health and led a worse life than before he went to lima in south america where he fell ill and in the hospital of that place was again touched by the grace of god he confessed to father francis perlino a jesuit to whom he promised to change his life but went back to his evil courses at length the same father visiting one day another hospital in a distant place saw that wretched man extended on the earth and heard him exclaim ah i am lost and for my greater torment this father has come here to witness my punishment i came here from lima and am brought to this end by my vices and now i am going to hell with these words on his lips he died before the father had time to give him any assistance 15. There was once in Germany a certain criminal condemned to death, but he was obstinate and refused to make his confession, though a Jesuit father did his utmost to convert him. He entreated him, he wept, he cast himself at his feet, but seeing that all was in vain, he finally said, Let us recite a Hail Mary. No sooner had the criminal recited it than he began to cry bitterly, made his confession with much compunction and wished to die clasping the image of mary sixteen in a city of spain there lived a sinful man who had given himself to the devil and had never been to confession he did nothing good but say a hail mary every day father eusebius nuremberg relates that when this man was at the point of death the most holy virgin appeared to him in a dream and looked on him 
her kind eyes so changed him that he immediately sent for a confessor made his confession with a voice broken by sobs made a vow to become a religious if he should live and then died seventeen a devout servant of mary always inculcated upon her daughter that she should often recite the hail mary especially when she was in any danger one day when this girl was resting after a ball she was attacked by a demon who in visible form bore her off with him he had already seized her but she began hail mary and the enemy disappeared eighteen a woman of cologne who had criminal intercourse with an ecclesiastic found him one day hanging in her room dead after this she entered into a monastery where the devil assailed her in a bodily form so that she knew not what to do in order to be delivered from him a companion suggested to her to say the hail mary and when she did so the demon said a curse may she be who has taught thee this and appeared no more nineteen a certain baron who led a very sinful life was accidentally visited in his castle by a religious who enlightened by god begged him to assemble together all his servants they all came except the chamberlain he at last was forced to come in and the father said to him now i command thee in the name of jesus christ to tell who you are and he answered i am a devil from hell who for fourteen years have served this villain waiting until some day he should omit those seven hail marys which he is in the habit of reciting that i might then strangle him and take him to the flames of hell the religious then commanded the devil to depart he obeyed and disappeared the baron then threw himself at his feet was converted and led a holy life twenty the blessed francis patrizzi who greatly loved the devotion of the hail marys recited five hundred every day mary made known to him the hour of his death he died as a saint and after forty years a most beautiful lily sprung from his mouth which was then transported into france and on the leaves of it were written the hail mary in gold letters twenty one caesarius relates that a cistercian lay brother could say no other prayer but the hail mary and recited it continually with the greatest devotion after his death there sprung up from the place where he was buried a tree on whose leaves were written these words hail mary full of grace ave maria gratia plena twenty two three devout virgins by the advice of their confessor recited one year for forty days the whole rosary as a preparation for the feast of the purification of mary on the vigil the divine mother appeared to the first of these three sisters with a rich garment embroidered with gold thanked her and blessed her then she appeared to the second with a simple garment and also thanked her but she said to her o oh, lady why have you brought my sister a richer garment because she has clothed me said mary more richly than you have done she afterwards appeared to the third with a canvas garment and she at once asked pardon for her tepidity in honoring her the next year all three fervently prepared for the same feast saying the rosary with great devotion when behold on the evening preceding the festival mary appeared to them in glory and said to them be prepared for to-morrow you shall come to paradise and in fact the next day they went to church related to the confessor what had occurred and received communion in the morning at the hour of compline they saw again the most holy virgin who came to take them with her and amid the songs of angels one after the other sweetly expired twenty three father crasset relates that a certain military officer told him that after a battle he found a soldier on the battleground who held in his hand a rosary and the scapular of mary and asked for a confessor his forehead had been pierced by a musket ball which had passed through the head and came out behind so that the brain was visible and protruded through each opening and he could not live without a miracle he however raised himself made his confession to the chaplain with great compunction and after receiving absolution expired twenty four the same author adds that this very captain told him of being present when a trumpeter of his company 
received a pistol shot from someone near, and when he examined his breast, where he said he had been hit, he found that the ball had been stopped by the scapular of the virgin, which the man wore, and that it had not even touched the flesh. He took it, and exhibited it to the whole company. 25. A noble youth, named Aeschylus, being sent by the prince his father to Hildesheim, a city of Saxony, to study, abandoned himself to a dissolute life. He fell ill and was near dying, and while in that state he had a vision. He saw himself shut up in a furnace of fire, and believed himself to be already in hell, and then he escaped from it through a hole, and took refuge in a great place, where he found the most holy Mary in the hall, and she said to him, Rash man, dost thou dare to appear before me? Depart from here, and go to the flames which thou dost merit. The young man besought the virgin to have mercy on him, and turned to some persons who were near, and implored them to recommend him to Mary. They did so, and the Divine Mother answered, You do not know the sinful life he has led, and that he had not even thought of saying a Hail Mary in my honor. But his advocates answered, O oh, lady, he will change his life. And the youth added, Yes, I promise really to amend, and I will be thy servant. Then the virgin's anger was appeased, and she said to him, Well, I accept thy promise, be faithful to me, and meanwhile with my blessing, be delivered from hell and death. When she had said this, the virgin disappeared. Aeschylus came to himself, and blessing Mary, related to others the grace he had received. He led ever after a holy life, always preserving a great affection towards the Blessed Virgin, and was made Archbishop of the Church of Luda, in Denmark, where he converted many to the faith. Towards the close of his life, being old, he resigned the Archbishopric, and became a monk of Clairvaux, where he lived four years, and died a holy death. Hence he has been numbered by some writers among the saints of the Cistercian Order. 26. A member of the Brothers of the Confraternity of Mary was invited one morning by a friend to dine with him. He promised to go, but went first to the meeting of the Confraternity, and after that he forgot his promise. His friend was so much offended by this, that one day when he met him, he attempted to kill him. But by a just judgment of God, he killed himself. His friend was immediately taken before the court, found guilty of the murder, and was condemned to death. He recommended himself to the Virgin, and inspired by her, begged to be led into the presence of the dead body, and then asked him how he had died. He confessed that he died by his own hands, and his friend was set at liberty. 27. In the year 1604, at Dola, a member of the same confraternity was very ill. On a feast day he said to himself, at this hour my brothers are assembled, and occupied in praising Mary, and am I here? He rose from his bed and went to the assembly, when suddenly the fever left him, and he was restored to health. 28. A fisherman, belonging to the same confraternity in Naples, had been ill for several days through the severe discipline he had practiced in the meeting of the confraternity. Being somewhat better, as he was poor and had a family, he returned to his fishing, saying to the Most Holy Virgin, O oh, my lady, for thee I have suffered this evil, do thou help me. And our blessed lady allowed him to take as many fish as he would have taken in all the time he had lost. 29. Another member was going to be imprisoned for debt. He recommended himself to Mary, and the Most Holy Virgin inspired his creditors to release him from his debt, and so they did. 30. A young man who had been a member of the confraternity of the Virgin, left it, and abandoned himself to a dissolute life. One night, the devil appeared to him in a frightful form. He began to invoke the Blessed Virgin. In vain, said his enemy to him, do you invoke her whom you have abandoned? Your sins have made thee mine. The youth in terror fell on his knees, and began to recite the formula of the brothers. O most holy virgin mother, etc. Then the mother of God appeared to him, at whose presence the demon fled, leaving behind him a great stench, and an opening in the wall. And Mary then turned to the youth, and said, 
Thou didst not merit my help, but I wish to take pity on thee, that thou mayest change, and return to the confraternity. 31. In Braganza there lived another youth, who left the confraternity, and abandoned himself to such vicious courses, that one day in despair he was going to throw himself into a river. But first he turned to Our Lady and said, O oh Mary, I have served thee in the confraternity, wilt thou help me? The most holy virgin appeared to him and said, What art thou doing? Dost thou wish to destroy both soul and body? Go, make thy confession, and return to the confraternity. The youth, encouraged by this, thanked the virgin and amended his life. 32. There was once a religious in Spain, who in a fit of passion killed his superior. After committing this crime, he fled into Barbary, where he renounced his faith and married, leading afterwards so bad a life, that he did nothing good but say a, Hail, O Queen, daily. One day being alone, he repeated this devotion, and behold, Mary appeared to him, rebuked him, and encouraged him to amend his life, promising him her assistance. He then returned to his house, and was so sorrowful that his wife questioned him as to the cause, and he, in tears, told her his condition, and the vision he had seen. She took compassion on him, gave him money to enable him to return to his own country, and also consented that he should take one of their children with him. He returned to the monastery, where he shed many tears of compunction, that he was again received, together with his son. He persevered in his holy life, and died with the reputation of a saint. 33. A pupil had been instructed by his master to salute the Most Holy Virgin in these words, Hail, O Mother of Mercy! When he was at the point of death, Mary appeared to him and said, My son, do you not know me? I am that Mother of Mercy whom you have saluted so many times. Then the servant of the Virgin extended his arms as if to follow her, and gently breathed his last. 34. There was once a sinner who was so abandoned that he practiced no other devotion than that of reciting daily to thy patronage. Sub tuum presidium. The virgin one day so greatly enlightened him that he abandoned his sins, entered religion, led for fifty years an exemplary life, and thus died. 35. In the year 1610, there lived in Turin an obstinate heretic, who even on his deathbed would not be converted by all that was said to him by the various priests who were with him for eight successive days. At length one of them, almost by force, brought him to have recourse to Mary with these words, Mother of Jesus, help me. Mater Jesu, assiste mihi. And the heretic, as if awakening from sleep, exclaimed, I will die a Catholic and indeed he became reconciled to the church, and died in two hours. 36. Another infidel, who was living in India, was about to die, abandoned by all, but as he had heard the Christians so much extol the power of Mary, he had recourse to her, and the Blessed Virgin appeared to him and said, Behold, I am she whom you invoke, become a Christian. He was immediately restored to health, and baptized, and many were converted by the prodigy. 37. There lived in Madrid, in the year 1610, a very devout servant of Mary, who had an especial devotion to an image of her called Mary of Antioch. He married a woman, who through suspicion and jealousy left him no rest. Every Saturday he went barefoot, and early in the morning, to visit that image. But his wife, who suspected him of going elsewhere, once in particular attacked him so violently that blinded by impatience, he took a rope and hung himself. But just as his soul was departing, when he could no more help himself, he invoked the help of Mary, and behold, a most beautiful lady appeared, who approached him and cut the rope. The people without saw this, and then he narrated the fact. By this the wife was so filled with compunction, that ever afterwards they lived in peace, and devoted to the Divine Mother. 38. Another person, of Valentia, in 1613, committed a great crime, which he was ashamed to confess, 
and therefore made sacrilegious confessions. But being troubled with great remorse of conscience, he went one day to visit the altar of Our Lady of Hale, that he might obtain relief. When he arrived at the door of the church, which stood open, he felt himself thrust back by an invisible power. Then he determined to make his confession, and immediately entered. After making a general confession, he went home entirely consoled. 39. The blessed Adam, a Cistercian, went one evening to visit an altar of the most blessed virgin in a church, but finding the doors closed, he knelt outside to make his devotions. He was hardly on his knees when he saw the door opening of itself, and he entered. There he beheld the queen of heaven, in the midst of great splendor, and she said to him, Adam, approach, do you know who I am? Adam answered, No, lady, who art thou? I am, she said, the mother of God. Know that as a reward for thy devotion to me, I will always take care of thee. And then she placed her blessed hand upon his head, and cured him of the great pain he was suffering there. 40. A servant of Mary went one day to visit a church of our blessed lady, without the knowledge of her husband, and was prevented by a severe storm from returning that night to her own house. She felt a great fear lest her husband should be very angry with her, but she recommended herself to Mary, and when she returned home, her husband was very kind and gracious to her. Upon questioning him, she found that the evening before, the Divine Mother had taken her form, and attended to all the little affairs of the household like a servant. She then related the occurrence to her husband, and both afterwards practiced great devotion to the Blessed Virgin. 41. A certain cavalier of the city of Duel, in France, named Ansaldo, received in the battle a wound from an arrow, which entered so deep into the jawbone that it was not possible to extract the iron. After four years of suffering, the afflicted man could endure the pain no longer, and being besides very ill, he thought he would again try to have the iron extracted. He recommended himself to the Blessed Virgin, and made a vow to visit every year a sacred image of her which was in that place, and make an offering of a certain sum of money upon her altar if she granted this request. He had no sooner made the vow than the iron, without being touched, fell into his mouth. The next day, ill as he was, he went to visit the image, and scarcely had he placed the promised gift upon the altar, when he felt himself entirely restored to health. End of section 51「Section 52 of the Glories of Mary」by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Various Additional Examples Appertaining to the Most Holy Mary Part 2 42. There was once a Spaniard who held a sinful intercourse with a relative. A devout virgin, while she was at prayer, saw Jesus on his throne, who was on the point of sending that criminal to hell. But his holy mother obtained thirty days' grace for him, because he once had honored her. By command of the Divine Mother herself, his female companion told the whole to her confessor, who made it known to the young man, and he at once made his confession, with many tears and promises of amendment. But because he did not remove the temptation from him, he fell again into sin, went again to confession, again made a resolution, and again relapsed. As he did not go to see the father again, the father went to his house to find him, but was very rudely dismissed. The last of the thirty days had arrived. The father went to the house again, but in vain. He desired the servant, however, to give him notice if there was any accident, and indeed at night that miserable sinner was attacked with violent pains. The father was called and endeavored to relieve him, but the unhappy man exclaimed, My heart has been pierced with a lance, and I am dying. Then giving a groan of despair, he expired. 43. There once lived in Milan a man named Masaccio, so addicted to gambling, that one day he lost at play the very clothes he wore. 
In a violent rage at his loss, he took a knife and struck an image of the Blessed Virgin, and blood burst forth from it into his face. He was so much moved that he burst into tears, and offered thanks to the Virgin that she had obtained for him time for repentance. He afterwards entered a Cistercian monastery, and led such a holy life, that he even received the gift of prophecy. After being forty years a religious, he died a holy death. 44. A very sinful man, once kneeling in tears at the foot of the cross, prayed that he might receive a sign of pardon, but when he found that his prayer was not granted, he turned to an image of the sorrowful Mary, who then appeared to him, and he saw her present his tears to her son, saying, My son, shall these tears be lost? Fili, iste lacrimae peribunt? And then he was given to understand that Christ had already pardoned him, and from that time he led a holy life. 45. A man of advanced age, during one of our missions, after the usual sermon on the powerful intercession of Mary, which is our custom always to preach in the missions, came to make his confession to one of our fathers, named D. Cesar Sportelli who lately died in the fame of sanctity, and was found uncorrupted many months after his death. Kneeling at the foot of his confessor, he said, Father, our lady has had pity on me. This is her office, answered the father. But you cannot give me absolution, said the other, for I have never made my confession. And in fact, although he was a Catholic, he had never made his confession. The father encouraged him, heard his confession, and gave him absolution with great consolation. 46. The Blessed Bernard Ptolemeo, founder of the Olivetan Fathers, who, from his childhood, had a great devotion to Mary, was one day greatly tormented in his hermitage at Acona, called Mount Olivet, with the fear that he should not be saved, and that God had not yet pardoned him. But the Divine Mother appeared to him and said, what do you fear, my son? Take courage. God has already pardoned you, and is pleased with the life you lead. Go on, and I will help and save you. The blessed religious continued to lead a holy life, till he died a happy death in the arms of Mary. 47. There lived in Germany a young girl called Agnes, who had been guilty of incest in the first degree. She fled into a desert, and there gave birth to a child. The devil, in the form of a religious, appeared to her, and persuaded her to throw the child into a pond. But afterwards, when he proposed to her to throw herself in also, she said, Mary, help me, and the devil disappeared. 48. A soldier once made a compact with the devil, that he would sell his wife to him for a certain sum of money. He was taking her to a wood to fulfill his promise, when he passed before a church dedicated to the Virgin. His wife begged him to allow her to pay her devotion to Mary in that church. But as she entered it, Mary came forth from it, and taking the form of the woman, accompanied the husband. When they reached the wood, the demon said to the man, Traitor, why have you brought me, instead of your wife, my enemy, the mother of God? And thou, said Mary, how hast thou dared to think of injuring my servant? Go, flee to hell. And then turning to the man, she said, Amend your life, and I will aid you. She disappeared, and that wretched man repented, and amended his life. 49. A very sinful woman who lived in Mexico, having fallen ill, repented of her life, and made a vow to Mary, that if she would restore her to health, she would present her with her hair. She was cured, and she cut off her hair, making an offering of it to the statue of the Virgin. But the woman again fell into sin, again fell ill, and died impenitent. Then Mary one day afterwards spoke from that statue to Father Gia Maria Salvaterra, and said, Take those locks from my head, for they belong to a lost and sinful soul, and are not befitting the head of the mother of purity." The father obeyed her, and threw them himself instantly into the flames. 50. A Saracen named Petron made captive several Christians in Spain, who recommended themselves to the Holy Virgin. Mary appeared to the Saracen and said to him, 
Petron, how dare you to hold my servants slaves? Release them immediately. Obey. And the Moor answered, Who are you whom I am to obey? I am, she said, the mother of God, and because they have had recourse to me, I wish you to give them their liberty. Then the heart of Petron was changed. He set the Christians free and presented himself to the virgin. She first instructed him, and then she herself baptized him in a fountain, near which a church was built, and a Benedictine monastery. 51. A certain canon, while he was repeating some devotions in honor of the Divine Mother, fell into the river Seine and was drowned, and being in mortal sin, the devils came to take him to hell. But Mary appeared at the same time, and said to them, how have you dared to take possession of one who died praising me? Then turning to the sinner, she said, Repent, and be particularly devout to my conception. He was restored to life, became a religious, and never ceased to thank his deliverer, and everywhere to propagate the devotion to her immaculate conception. 52. Whilst the monks of Clairvaux were reaping in the fields, and praising the Queen of Heaven, most Holy Mary was seen caressing them, and two other saints wiping their sweat. 53. The brother of the King of Hungary recited every day the office of Mary. Once when he was very ill, he made a vow of chastity to the Virgin, if she would restore him to health, and he immediately recovered. But his brother having died, he was about to be married, and just as the nuptials were to be celebrated, he retired apart to recite his accustomed office. When he came to the words, Thou art fair and comely, etc., quam pulcra est decora, etc., he saw Mary, who said to him, If I am fair as you say, why do you leave me for another spouse? Know that if you leave her, you shall have me for a spouse, and the kingdom of heaven instead of the kingdom of Hungary. After this, the prince withdrew into a desert near Aquileia, where he lived a holy life. 54. St. John Climacus relates that there was a devout religious named Carcerio, who was accustomed often to repeat little songs in praise of Mary, and always saluted her images with a Hail Mary. He was once afflicted with so painful a malady, that in the paroxysms of his suffering, he bit his lips and tongue. He lost his speech and was at the point of death. Whilst the religious were recommending his soul to God, the mother of God appeared to him and said, I have come to cure thee, for I do not wish that mouth should suffer, with which thou hast so often praised me. Arise, thou art healed, continue to praise me. Having said this, she sprinkled him with some drops of her milk, and immediately he was cured, and never ceased to praise her until, visited again by his lady at his death, he sweetly expired in her arms. 55. When St. Francis Borgia was in Rome, an ecclesiastic came to speak with him, but the saint being much occupied, sent Father Acosta to him. The ecclesiastic said to him, Father, I am a priest and a preacher, but I live in sin, and distrust the divine mercy. After preaching a sermon one day against the obstinate, who afterwards despaired of pardon, a person came to me to make his confession, who narrated to me all my sins, and at length told me that he despaired of the divine mercy. In order to do my duty, I told him that he must change his life and trust in God. Then that penitent rose to his feet, and reproached me, saying, And you, who preach thus to others, why do you not amend, and why do you distrust? No, said he, that I am an angel come to your aid, amend and you will be pardoned. And when he had said this, he disappeared. I abstained for several days from my sinful practices, but when temptation came, I again returned to my sins. On another day, as I was celebrating Mass, Jesus Christ sensibly spoke to me from the host and said, Why dost thou thus maltreat me, when I treat thee so well? After this I resolved to amend, but at the next temptation fell again into sin. A few hours ago, a youth came to me in my apartment, and drew from under his mantle a chalice, and from this a consecrated host, saying, Do you know this Lord whom I hold in my hand? Do you remember how many favors he has done you? 
Now behold the punishment of your ingratitude. And saying this, he drew a sword to kill me. I then cried, For the love of Mary do not kill me, for I will indeed amend. And then he said, This was the only thing that could save you. Make a good use of this grace, for this is the last mercy for you. When he had said this, he left me, and I came immediately here, praying you to receive me among you. Father Acosta consoled him, and the priest, by the advice also of St. Francis, entered another order of strict observance, where he persevered in holiness till his death. 56. In the year 1228, while a priest was celebrating Mass on a Saturday, in the honor of the Most Holy Mary, some Albigensian heretics came and cruelly cut out his tongue. In this condition, he went to the monastery of Cluny, where the good religious received him with much charity, greatly compassionating the suffering he endured from the loss of his tongue. But what caused the greatest suffering to this devout priest was that he could no longer say Mass and recite the Divine Office, and that of the Blessed Virgin, as he had been accustomed to do. The Feast of Epiphany having arrived, he begged to be carried into the church, and before the altar of the Holy Virgin, prayed her to restore the tongue which he had lost through love of her, that he might sing her praises as he did before. Then Mary appeared to him with a tongue in her hand, and said to him, Since thou hast lost the tongue for the faith, and for the honor thou hast paid me, I give thee in return a new one. Having said this, with her own hands she placed the tongue in his mouth, and immediately the priest, raising his voice, recited the Hail Mary. The religious quickly assembled, and the priest wished to remain with them, and to become himself a religious, that there he might always praise his benefactress. The mark of the scar was always seen on his tongue. 57. It was in 589 that the famous plague prevailed in Rome, when men were attacked with sneezing and fell down dead. St. Gregory the Great, when he was carrying in procession through the city an image belonging to the church of St. Mary Major, in the place now called the Castle of St. Angelo, saw an angel in the air, who was replacing in its scabbard a sword dripping with blood. Then he heard the angel singing, O Queen of Heaven rejoice, Alleluia, for he whom thou didst deserve to bear, Alleluia, is risen again, as he said, Alleluia. Regina Celi Latere, Alleluia, Quia quam meruiste portere, Alleluia, Resurrexit, sicut dixit, Alleluia. And St. Gregory responded, Ora pro nobis Deum, Alleluia. Immediately the plague ceased, and they then began to celebrate the greater litanies every year on the 25th of April. 58. A city in France, called Avignon, was once besieged by enemies. The citizens prayed to Mary to defend them, and placed an image of her which they had taken from the church at the gate of the city. One of the citizens having concealed himself behind the image, a soldier shot an arrow at him, saying, This image shall not save you from death. But the image presented her knee, and the arrow remained fixed in it, and may be seen there even to this day and thus she saved the life of her servant, and the enemy, moved by this prodigy, raised the siege. 59. There was in Naples a Moor, a slave of Don Octavius del Monaco, who, although he had often been exhorted to leave his Mohammedan sect, remained obstinate, but yet never failed every evening to keep lighted, at his own expense, a lamp before an image of Mary, which was in the house, and he said, I hope that this lady will grant me some great favor. One night the Blessed Virgin appeared to him and told him he must become a Christian. Still the Turk resisted, but she placed her hand upon his shoulder and said to him, Now no longer resist, Abel, be baptized and called Joseph. In the morning he immediately went to be instructed and was baptized August 10th, 1648, with eleven other Turks. Let it be observed that when the Divine Mother appeared to him, after she had converted him, she was about to depart, but the Moor seized her mantle and said, O oh lady, when I find myself afflicted, I pray thee to let me see thee. In fact, she one day promised him this, 
and when he was in affliction he invoked her, and Mary appeared again to him, saying, Have patience, and he was consoled. 60. A certain parish priest of Asella, named Baldwin, became a Dominican, and when he was in his novitiate, there came to him the temptation that he could do greater good in the world in his parish, and he resolved to return. But going to take his leave of the altar of the rosary, Mary appeared to him with two vessels of wine. She gave him to drink of the first, but the novice had hardly tasted it when he turned away his mouth, for although the wine was good, yet it was full of dregs. The second he pronounced good and free from dregs. Now, said the most holy virgin, there is the same difference between the life in the world and the life in religion, which is under obedience. Baldwin persevered and died a good religious. 61. Another novice, also overcome by temptation, was about to leave his monastery, but stopping to say a Hail Mary before an image of the Virgin, he felt himself nailed, as it were, to the floor, from which he could not rise. He repented and made a vow of perseverance. He then recovered his liberty, asked pardon of the master of novices, and persevered. 62. The blessed Clement, a Franciscan, one morning delayed going to the common table, that he might stop and recite certain accustomed devotions to the Most Holy Virgin. But she spoke from her image, and directed him to go with the others, because obedience pleased her more than all other devotions. 63. Whilst Angela, a daughter of the King of Bohemia, was in a monastery, Mary appeared to her, and an angel said to her, Arise, Angela, and fly to Jerusalem, for thy father wishes to give thee in marriage to the prince of Hungary. The devout virgin immediately set on her journey, and again the divine mother appeared to her, and encouraged her to continue her journey. She was received in Jerusalem among the Carmelites, and afterwards was commanded by the blessed virgin herself to return to her own country, where she lived a holy life until her death. 64. St. Gregory relates that there was a young woman named Musa, who had great devotion to the mother of God, but being, through the evil example of her companions, in danger of losing her innocence, one day Mary appeared to her with many saints, and said to her, Musa, do you too wish to be one of these? Musa answered, yes, and Mary added, withdraw from your companions, and prepare, for in one month from this you shall come with me. Musa retired from her companions and related the vision. On the thirtieth day she was at the point of death, and the most holy virgin again appeared to her and called her. She answered, Behold, lady, I come, and sweetly expired. 65. Anna Caterina Gonzaga was married to Ferdinand I, Archduke of Austria, but her husband dying, she entered the religious order of the Servites, and had a crown made, on the globes of which were carved the dolors of Mary. She said that for this crown, she renounced all the other crowns of earth, and in fact, refused marriage with the Emperor Rudolph II. When she heard that her younger sister had been crowned empress, she said, Let my sister enjoy her imperial crown, for these garments with which Mary, my queen, has clothed me, are to me a thousandfold dearer. The Most Holy Virgin appeared to her many times during her life, and at last, this good religious died a holy death. 66. A young clerical student, playing one day at ball with other young men, and fearing he should lose a ring in his play, which had been given him by a lady, he placed it on the finger of an image of Mary, which was near, and he immediately felt compelled to make a promise to the Virgin, to quit the world and choose her for his spouse. He made the promise, and Mary pressed his finger in token that she accepted it. But after some time he wished to marry another, and Mary appeared to him and reproached him for his infidelity. Wherefore he fled into a desert, and led to the last a holy life. 67. About the year 850, Berengarius, Bishop of Verdun in Lorraine, having entered a church where a certain priest named Bernario, was saying the office of Mary, prostrate before the choir, stumbled against him, and in his vexation struck him with his foot. 
In the night the most holy virgin appeared to him and said, How is it that you struck with your foot my servant who was engaged in praising me? Because I love you, she added, you must pay the penalty. Then his leg became withered, but he lived and died a saint, and after many years his body, except that leg, remained uncorrupted. 68. A young man, who was left wealthy at the death of his parents, by play and dissipation with his friends, lost all that he had, but always preserved his chastity. An uncle, who found him reduced to such poverty by his vices, exhorted him to say every day a part of the rosary, promising him that if he would persevere in this devotion, he would procure for him a good marriage. The youth persevered, and having amended his life, he was married. On the evening of his nuptials, he rose from the table to go and recite his rosary, and when he had finished it, Mary appeared to him and said, Now I will reward thee for the honor thou hast paid me. I do not wish that thou shouldest lose thy chastity. In three days thou shalt die, and shalt come to me in paradise. And this really happened, for immediately a fever attacked him. He related the vision, and on the third day died in perfect peace. 69. The devout author of the book in honor of the Most Holy Rosary, entitled The Secret of Every Grace, relates that St. Vincent Ferrer once said to a man dying in despair, why will you ruin yourself when Jesus Christ wishes to save you? And he answered, that in spite of Christ, he would be damned. The saint replied, and you, in spite of yourself, shall be saved. He began to recite the rosary with the persons of the house, and behold, the sick man asked to make his confession, made it weeping, and then died. 70. The same author also relates that a poor woman, who was buried by an earthquake under the ruins of a house, was found alive and uninjured, with her children in her arms, by some persons who were employed by a priest to remove the stones. When she was asked what devotion she had practiced, she said she had never failed to say the rosary and visit a chapel of the Most Holy Mary. 71. He also relates that another woman who led a wicked life, because she thought it the only means by which she could gain a livelihood, was counseled to recommend herself to Mary by saying the rosary. She did so, and behold, one night, the Divine Mother appeared and said to her, Quit your sinful life. As for your support, trust in me, and I will think of that. The next morning she went to confession, and Mary Most Holy provided for her wants. 72. A person of impure life, who had not the courage to quit his sins, began to say the rosary, and was delivered from his vices. 73. Another person who maintained a sinful friendship, was seized with abhorrence of his sin, by saying the rosary. He yielded again to temptation, but by means of the rosary, finally freed himself from it. 74. A good priest who was attending a woman on her deathbed, who bitterly hated her husband, not knowing by what means to convert her, withdrew to say the rosary, and at the last moment the woman saw her sinfulness, repented, and forgave her husband. 75. Finally, the same author relates that once making a mission to the convicts in the galleys of Naples, he found some who obstinately refused to make their confession, he suggested to them that at least they should have themselves enrolled in the confraternity of the rosary and begin to recite it. They consented to do so, and they had no sooner recited one than they desired to make their confession and did so, the first time for many years. These modern examples serve to revive our confidence in Mary, seeing that she is at the present time the same that she always has been towards those who have recourse to her. 76. St. Gregory relates that a holy prelate, Bishop of Ferrento, was from childhood devoted to relieving the poor. It happened one day that a certain priest, his nephew, sold a horse for ten crowns of gold, and took the money and locked it up. The bishop, not having anything to give when some poor persons came to beg of him, broke open the chest and distributed the money to them. His nephew made such a disturbance when he discovered it, that the holy prelate, 
not knowing what to do, went for help to a church dedicated to Mary, when, behold, he saw ten crowns lying on the drapery of the statue. He took them and gave them to his nephew. 77. A Lutheran lady of Osberg in Germany, who was a very obstinate heretic, happening to pass one day a small Catholic chapel, went in through curiosity. She saw there an image of Mary with the infant Jesus in her arms, and felt moved to make an offering to it. She accordingly went home, took a silk cloth, and brought it to the altar of the Virgin. When she had returned home, the Most Holy Virgin enlightened her to see the errors of her sect, and she went immediately to seek some Catholics, abjured heresy, and was converted to God. 78. In the city of Sassena, there lived two very bad men who were friends, one of them named Bartholomew. In the midst of all his vices, practiced the devotion of reciting every day the Stabat Mater in honor of the sorrowful Mary. Once when he was repeating this hymn, Bartholomew had a vision, in which he seemed to stand with his sinful companion in a lake of fire, and saw the most holy virgin, moved to pity, offer her hand and take him from the flames. She directed him to seek pardon from Jesus Christ, who showed himself willing to pardon him through the prayers of his mother. The vision ended, and Bartholomew at the moment heard the intelligence that his friend had been mortally wounded and was dead. Then he knew the truth of the vision, and quitting the world, entered the order of the Capuchins, where he led a most austere life, and died in the fame of sanctity. 79. The Blessed Jerome, founder of the Somoskian Fathers, being governor of a certain place, was taken by the enemy, and confined in the dungeon of a tower. He recommended himself to Mary, and made a vow to make a pilgrimage to Treviso in her honor, if she would rescue him. Then the Most Holy Virgin appeared to him surrounded by a great light, and with her own hands, loosed his chains, and gave him the keys of the prison. He fled from the prison, and, setting out for Treviso, to fulfill his vow, he found himself immediately surrounded by the enemy. Again he had recourse to his deliverer, and she again appeared to him, took him by the hand, and led him safely through the midst of his enemies, accompanying him even to the gates of Treviso, where she disappeared. He made the visit, deposited his chains at the foot of the altar of Mary, and then devoted himself to a holy life, by which he has merited recently to be ranked by the Holy Church among the number of the blessed. 80. A priest who had a special devotion to the sorrows of Mary, often remained alone in a chapel to commiserate the dolors of his lady, and moved by compassion, was accustomed with a little cloth to wipe, as it were, the tears of a statue of the sorrowful virgin, which was in that place. Now this good priest, in a severe illness, when he was given up by his physicians, and was going to breathe his last, saw a beautiful lady by his side, who consoled him with her words, and with a handkerchief, gently wiped the sweat from his brow, and with this, cured him. When he found himself well, he said, But my lady, who art thou who dost practice such charity towards me? I am she, answered Mary, whose tears thou hast so often dried, and she disappeared. 81. A noble lady, who had an only son, was informed one day that he was killed, and that his murderer had by chance taken refuge in her own palace, but when she called to mind that Mary pardoned the executioners of her son, she wished also to pardon that criminal for love of the sorrowful Mary, and not only did she pardon him, but provided him with a horse, money, and clothes, that he might make his escape. Then her son appeared to her, and told her that he was saved, and that for her generous act done towards his enemy, the Divine Mother had delivered him from purgatory, where he should otherwise have had to suffer for a long time, but that he was already entering paradise. 82. The Blessed Bayona performed a similar heroic act. Some enemies also killed her only son, though he was innocent, solely by reason of the hatred they bore to his father, who was dead, and with unheard of cruelty gave the heart of the murdered youth to his mother to eat. Now she, according to the example of the Most Holy Mary, began to pray for her murderers, and to do them all the good she could. These acts so pleased the Divine Mother, that she called her to join the third order of the Servites, 
where she merited to lead so holy a life, that both before and after her death, many miracles were wrought through her. 83. St. Thomas of Canterbury, when he was a young man, found himself one day in conversation with several other youths, each of whom boasted of some foolish love affair. The holy youth declared that he too loved a great lady, and was beloved by her, meaning the most holy virgin. Afterwards he felt some remorse at having made this boast, but behold, Mary appeared to him in his trouble, and with a gracious sweetness said to him, Thomas, what do you fear? You have reason to say that you loved me, and that you are beloved by me. Assure your companions of this, and as a pledge of the love I bear you, show them this gift that I make you. The gift was a small box, containing a chasuble, of a blood-red color, as a sign that Mary, for the love she bore him, had obtained for him the grace to be a priest and a martyr, which indeed happened, for he was first made priest, and afterwards bishop of Canterbury, in England, where he was at one time persecuted by the king, and fled to the Cistercian Monastery at Pontignac in France. While he was there, wishing one day to mend his haircloth shirt that he usually wore, which was ripped, and not being able to do so, his beloved queen appeared to him, and with a special kindness, took the haircloth from his hand, and repaired it as it should be done. After this he returned to Canterbury, and died a martyr, having been put to death on account of his zeal for the church. 84. A young woman in the papal states, who was very devout towards Mary, met in a certain place a chief of banditti. Fearing some outrage, she implored him, for love of the most holy virgin, not to molest her. Do not fear, he answered, for you have prayed me in the name of the mother of God, and I only ask you to recommend me to her. And in fact, he accompanied her himself along the road to a place of safety. The following night, Mary appeared in a dream to the bandit, and thanking him for the act he had performed for love of her, told him she would remember it, and one day reward him. The robber, at length, was arrested and condemned to death. But behold, the night previous to his execution, the Blessed Virgin visited him again in a dream, and first asked him, Do you know who I am? He answered, It seems to me I have seen you before. I am the Virgin Mary, she continued, who have come to reward you for what you have done for me. You will die tomorrow, but you will die with so much contrition that you will come at once to paradise. The convict awoke and felt such contrition for his sins that he began to weep bitterly, all the while giving thanks aloud to our blessed lady. He sent immediately for a confessor, to whom he made his confession with many tears, relating the vision he had seen, and begged him to make public this grace that had been bestowed on him by Mary. He went joyfully to execution, after which, as it is related, his countenance was so peaceful and happy, that all who saw him believed that the promise of the Divine Mother was fulfilled. 85. The blessed Joachim Piccolomini, who had a very great devotion to Mary, even from childhood, used to visit three times a day an image of the sorrowful mother, which was in a neighboring church, and abstained from all food on Saturday in her honor. Moreover, he rose at midnight to meditate upon her dolors but let us see how Mary rewarded him. At first she appeared to him when he was young, and directed him to enter into religion in the order of her servants, which he did. Towards the close of his life, she again appeared to him with two crowns in her hand, one of rubies as the reward of the compassion he had cherished for her sorrows, and the other of pearls as the reward of his chastity which he had consecrated to her. Finally at death, she appeared to him again, when he asked her of the favor to die on the day on which Jesus Christ died, and the Most Holy Virgin consoled him by telling him, Make ready now, for tomorrow, Friday, you will die suddenly, as you desire, and tomorrow you shall be with me in paradise. And thus it happened, for while they were chanting in the church, the Passion according to St. John, at the words, there stood near the cross of Jesus, his mother. Stabat juxta crucem, Jesu mater eus. He was attacked with the faintness of death. At the words, 
and bowing his head, he gave up the ghost. At inclinato capite, traditit spiritum, this blessed one also gave up his spirit to God, and at the same moment the church was filled with a great splendor, and the most sweet fragrance. 86. Father Alfonso Salmeroni, of the Society of Jesus, being a most devout servant of the Blessed Virgin, died saying, To paradise, to paradise, blessed be the hour that I have served Mary, bless the sermons, the toils, the thoughts that I have had for thee, O my lady, to paradise. 87. A youth named Guido, who wished to join the order of Camaldoli, was presented to St. Rumald by the prince, his father, whose name was Farnolf. The holy founder received him with pleasure. One day Mary appeared to this good youth, her servant, with the infant Jesus in her arms. Esteeming himself unworthy of such a favor, he stood trembling, but the divine mother drawing near to him said, Why do you doubt? What do you fear, Guido? I am the mother of God. This is my son Jesus, who wishes to come to you. And saying this, she placed him in her arms. Guido had not been three years in religion when he fell dangerously ill. St. Romald saw the poor youth writhing and trembling and heard him saying, O oh, father, do you see all the moors in this cell? My son, said the saint to him, do you remember anything you have not confessed? Yes, father, he answered, I remember having disobeyed the prior by not picking up certain brooms, and now I confess it. St. Romald absolved him, and then the scene changed. The devils fled, and the virgin again appeared with Jesus, at the sight of whom Guido died in perfect peace. 88. A Cistercian nun in Toledo, called Mary, being at the point of death, the Divine Mother appeared to her, and Mary said to her, O oh, lady, the favor you do me of visiting me, emboldens me to ask you another favor, namely, that I may die at the same hour that you died and entered into heaven. Yes, answered Mary, I will satisfy you. You shall die at that hour, and you shall hear the songs and praises with which the blessed accompanied my entrance into heaven, and now prepare. When she had said this, she disappeared. The religious who heard the nun talking to herself believed her wandering in mind, but related to them the vision and the promised grace and awaited the desired hour. And when she knew it had arrived by the striking of the clock, the writer does not tell us what hour it was. She said, Behold, the predicted hour has come. I hear the music of the angels. At this hour, my queen ascended into heaven. Rest in peace for I am going now to see her. And saying this, she expired, while her eyes became bright as stars, and her face glowed with a beautiful color. 89. In the city of Sens, in France, there lived towards the 8th century Saint Opportuna, the daughter of a prince of royal blood. This holy virgin, who had a great devotion to Mary, became a religious in a neighboring monastery, and being at the point of death, she saw St. Cecilia and St. Lucia standing beside her in the dawn of the morning. My sisters, be welcome, she said to them. What message do you bring me from my queen? And they answered, She is waiting for thee in paradise. After this, the devil appeared to her, and the saint boldly sent him away, saying, Brute beast, what hast thou to do with me, who am the servant of Jesus? The hour of her death, which she herself had predicted, having arrived, after receiving the holy viaticum, she turned towards the door and said, Behold, the mother of God who comes to take me. Sisters, I commend you to her. Adieu, we shall see each other no more. Thus saying, she raised her arms as if to embrace her lady and gently expired. End of section 52 Section 53 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Novena of Meditations for the nine days preceding the Feast of the Purification of Mary, which commences on the 24th of January. 
The above-mentioned meditations are upon the litany of Loretto, and can be used for all the novenas preceding the principal festivals of the Divine Mother. First Day First, Santa Maria, ora pro nobis. Holy Mary, pray for us. Since in the litanies of Our Lady, the Church instructs us to repeat so many times the petition that she will pray for us. Ora pro nobis. It is well before meditating upon the titles by which the Holy Virgin is invoked, to consider of how great value with God are the prayers of Mary. Blessed is that person for whom Mary prays. Jesus is pleased when his most beloved mother prays to him and grants all she asks. One day, St. Bridget heard Jesus speaking with Mary and thus saying to her, my mother, ask what thou wilt of me, for thy petition cannot be in vain. And then he added, Thou didst deny me nothing on earth, I will deny thee nothing in heaven. St. Bernard says, To be heard by this son is to be graciously heard. A filio audiri est ex audiri. It is enough that Mary speaks, her son grants whatever she asks. Therefore let us always pray to this Divine Mother, if we wish to obtain eternal salvation, and let us say with St. Andrew of Candia, or perhaps of Jerusalem. We then supplicate thee, O Most Holy Virgin, to grant us the aid of thy prayers with God, prayers that are more precious than all the treasures of the earth, prayers that obtain for us a great abundance of graces, prayers that confound our enemies and triumph over their forces. Second, Santa Maria, Holy Mary. The name of Mary is a name of salvation. This name came not from earth, but from heaven. And therefore St. Epiphanius says that it was not given to Mary by her parents, but was bestowed upon her by the express will of God. Hence it is that after the name of Jesus, the name of Mary is superior to every name, for God has filled it with grace and sweetness, in order that through it, every blessing may be obtained by him who names it. St. Bernard said, O oh Mary, thy name cannot be pronounced without inflaming the heart of him who utters it with love to thee. And the blessed Henry Suso exclaimed, O oh Mary, what must thou thyself be if thy name is so amiable and gracious? Name full of blessings. St. Bonaventure said that the name of Mary cannot be invoked without profit to him who invokes it. But more than all, this name has the power to overcome the temptations of hell. Ah, my lady, if I had always invoked thee in my temptations, I should never have fallen. For the future I shall never cease to invoke thee, saying, Mary, help me, Mary, succor me. And do thou obtain for me the grace always to invoke thee in the perils of my soul. Third, Santa Dei Genetrix, Holy Mother of God. If the prayers of the saints avail much with God, how much more will the prayers of Mary avail? The former are the prayers of servants, but the latter are the prayers of a mother. St. Antonius says that the prayer of Mary has the force of a command with Jesus Christ. Oratio virginis, habet rationem imperii. And hence he adds, that it is impossible for this mother to ask a favor of the son, that the son will not grant her. Impossible est dia parum non ex audiri. Therefore St. Bernard exhorts us to ask through Mary for every grace that we wish from God. Queramus gratiam, et per Mariam queramus for she is the mother and is always graciously heard. Quia mater est, et frustrari non potest. O great mother of God, pray to Jesus for me. Look upon the miseries of my soul and have pity on me. Pray and never cease to pray for me until thou seest me safe in paradise. O Mary, thou art my hope. Do not abandon me. Holy mother of God, pray for us. Santa Dei Genetrix, Ora pro nobis. Second day. First, Mater Divine Gratiae, Mother of Divine Grace. Mary is called by Saint Anselm, Mother of all graces, Mater Omnium Gratiarum, and by the idiot, Treasurer of Divine Grace, Thessararia Gratiarum. 
Hence St. Bernardine of Siena writes, All the graces which we receive from God are dispensed by the hand of Mary, and are dispensed to whom Mary will, when she will, and as she will. This she herself says, With me are riches and glory, that I may enrich them that love me. The Lord has placed in my hands all the riches of his graces, that I may enrich those who love me. Then, O oh my queen, if I love thee, I shall be no longer poor as I am now. After God, I love thee above all things. Do thou obtain for me greater tenderness and love for thy goodness. St. Bonaventure tells me that every one will be saved if thou wilt have him saved. Quem ipsa vis salvus erit. And therefore I will say to thee with the same saint, O salvation of those who invoke thee, save me. O salus te invocantium, salva me. Save me from hell, and first save me from sin, which alone can bring me to hell. Second, Mater Purissima, Mother Most Pure. This fair and pure virgin mother renders all her servants chaste and pure. St. Ambrose writes that even when Mary was on the earth, by her presence, she inspired with the love of purity all those who looked upon her. She was called the lily among thorns. Sicut lilium interspinus, sic amica mei interfilias. All other virgins, says St. Denis the Carthusian, are thorns either to themselves or to others. But the Blessed Virgin was neither a thorn to herself nor to others. For she inspired with pure and holy affection all those who beheld her. Moreover, Phrygenius, author of the life of St. Thomas Aquinas, writes, that this saint said that even the image of this chaste turtle dove extinguishes the sensual emotions of him who looks upon it with devotion. And the venerable John of Avila relates that many persons who are suffering from temptations against purity were preserved pure through the devotion to Our Lady. Oh, how especially powerful is the name of Mary in conquering all temptations to this vice. O oh, Mary most pure, free me from this vice. Make me always to have recourse to thee in temptations, and invoke thee so long as the temptation continues. Third, Mater Inviolata, Mother Inviolate. Mary was that immaculate woman who appeared in the eyes of God, all pure and spotless. Tota pulcra es, amica mei, et macula non est in te. Wherefore she was called the reconciler of sinners, as St. Ephraim salutes her. Hail conciliatrix of the world, ave conciliatrix orbis. And as she herself said in the canticles, since I am become in his presence as one finding peace. St. Gregory says that if a rebel should appear before the offended king to appease him, it would only provoke him the more to anger. But Mary being destined to treat of peace between God and men, it was not fitting that she should appear as a partaker in the crime of Adam, and therefore the Lord preserved Mary from every stain of sin. Ah, my immaculate queen, O oh, spotless dove, so dear to God, ah, do not disdain to look upon the many stains and wounds of my soul. Look on me and help me, that God who loves thee so much denies thee nothing, neither dost thou know how to deny thyself to him who invokes thee. O oh Mary, to thee I have recourse, have pity on me. Mother inviolate, pray for us. Mater inviolata, ora pro nobis. Third day. First. Mater amabilis, amiable mother. Richard of St. Lawrence says that the Blessed Virgin was amiable in the eyes of God himself. Fuit beata virgo, amabilis oculis, ipsius dei. Mary was so beautiful in the eyes of God, that God was enamored of her beauty. How beautiful art thou, my love, how beautiful art thou. Quam pulcra es, amica mei, quam pulcra es. Hence he called her his only dove, his only perfect one. One is my dove, my perfect one is but one. Una es columba mei, una es perfecta mei. It is certain, as Father Suarez says, that God loves Mary more than all the other saints together, and justly, for
for she alone loves God more than all men, and all the angels. O Mary most pure, O Mary most lovely, thou didst gain the heart of God. Take possession of my poor heart also, and make me holy. I love thee, and I confide in thee. Amiable mother, pray for us. Mater amabilis, ora pro nobis. Second, Mater Salvatoris, mother of the Savior. St. Bonaventure calls Mary the mediatrix of our salvation. Maria mediatrix, nostre salutis. And St. John Damascene, the deliverer of the world. Salvatrix mundi, suo modo. For two reasons, Mary may be called the deliverer of the world and our mediatrix, that is, mediatrix of grace, as Jesus Christ is the mediator of justice. First by the consent she gave to the incarnation of the word, for by such a consent, says St. Bernardine, she procured for us salvation. Per whom consensum, omnium salutem, procuravit. Secondly, by the consent which Mary gave to the death of her son, being willing that for our salvation he should be sacrificed on the cross. I will say to thee then, O mother of my Savior, thou who once did offer to God the life of thy son, save me now by thy intercession. Third, Virgo Venerata, Virgin Most Venerable. St. Anselm declares, that when we say of Mary that she is the mother of God, we say that she surpasses in greatness, after God, everything that can be conceived or expressed, whence he says to her, O oh lady, nothing is equal to thee, for everything is either above thee, and that is God, or it is beneath thee, and that is everything that is not God. In a word, St. Bernadine says that God alone can know the greatness of Mary, and the blessed Albertus Magnus affirms that Mary could not be more united to God except by becoming God. Magis Deu coniungi non puit, nisi fiera Deus. Truly worthy then of our veneration is this great mother of God, for God himself could not make her greater than he has done by making her his mother. O mother of God and my mother, Mary, I adore thee and would wish thee to be adored by all hearts, as that exalted lady thou art. Have mercy on a poor sinner, who loves thee and trusts in thee. Virgin most venerable, pray for us. Virgo venerata, ora pro nobis. Fourth day. First, Virgo pre deconda, virgin to be praised. The Holy Church sings that this divine mother is worthy of all praise. Omni laude dignissima. For according to St. Ildelphinus, all praise that is given to the Blessed Virgin is an honor paid to her son. Refunditur in filium, quad impenditur matri. With reason, then, did St. George of Nicomedia declare that the praises given to Mary God accepts, as if offered to himself. The Holy Virgin promises paradise to him, who endeavors to make her known and loved. Richard of St. Lawrence says that Mary will honor in eternity those who honor her in this life. St. Anselm says that as Mary, by being mother of God, was the means of saving sinners, so sinners receive salvation by proclaiming the praises of Mary. Not all can be preachers, but all can praise her and tell others, when speaking familiarly with relatives and friends, of the merits of Mary of her power and her mercy, and thus induce them to become servants of this divine mother. O Queen of Heaven, from this day I wish to do all that I can, to make thee venerated and loved by all. Accept this my desire, and help me to fulfill it. In the meantime, admit me among the number of thy servants, and no longer permit me to be a slave of Lucifer. Second, Virgo Potens, Virgin Most Powerful. And who among the saints is so powerful with God as his most holy mother? She obtains whatever she wishes, as St. Bernard has said. It is enough that thou dost wish, and all things are done. Velis too, et omnia fient. St. Peter Damien even says that when Mary asks graces from God, she does not pray, but in a certain manner commands. Thus the son honors this mother, whom he loves so much, by granting her whatever she asks, 
even favors for sinners. Hence St. Germanus says, Thou art the mother of God, omnipotent to save sinners, and thou hast no need of any other recommendation with God, for thou art the mother of true life. O Mary, thou canst make me holy, in thee I trust. Third, Virgo Clemens, most clement virgin. As Mary is powerful with God, so is she clement and merciful towards those who have recourse to her intercession. Neither the power nor the will is wanting to her, as St. Bernard says. Nec facultas, nec volantes ili, dei se potest. The power to save us cannot be wanting to Mary, for she is mother of God. Neither can the will be wanting to aid us, for she is our mother. And who has ever had recourse to Mary and been abandoned? Let him cease to praise thy mercy, says again St. Bernard. Who remembers having ever invoked thee without being heard? St. Bonaventure asserts that the desire of Mary to be invoked by us, in order that she may dispense to us her favors more abundantly, is so great that she not only considers herself offended by those who injure her, but also by those who do not ask favors of her. Thus it is not needful to pray long to this mother of mercy, in order to obtain her aid. It is enough to ask it of her with confidence. Her clemency comes to our aid before we invoke it, as Richard of St. Victor says. Velocius occurrit eius piatus, quam invocatur. And he gives us the reason, saying, She cannot see our miseries and not be moved by them. Non potest miseria sciere, et non subvenere. Behold then, O Mary, behold my miseries and succor me. Virgo Clemens, Ora pro nobis. Fifth day. First, Virgo Fidelis, Virgin most faithful. Blessed is he who with his prayers watches at the gates of Mary, as the poor wait at the gates of the rich to obtain relief. Blessed is the man, as she herself says, that heareth me and that watches daily at my gates. O oh, that we were faithful in serving this Divine Mother, as she is faithful in succoring us when we pray to her. Mary promises to those who serve and honor her, that they shall be free from sins, and shall obtain eternal salvation. They that work by me shall not sin, they that explain me shall have life everlasting. She invites all to come to her, and promises them every grace that they hope for. In me is all grace of the way and of the truth. In me is all hope of life and of virtue. Come over to me all. St. Lawrence Justinian applies to Mary that other text of Ecclesiasticus. Her bands are a healthful binding. Vincula ilius allegatara salutaris. And then adds, Wherefore bands, unless to bind her servants, that they may not go astray into unlawful fields. Mary binds her servants, that they may not take too much liberty, and thus cause their ruin. O Mother of God, in thee I place all my hopes. Thou must save me from falling again into sin. O my Lady, do not abandon me. Obtain for me the grace to die, rather than to lose the grace of God. Second, Causa Nostri Latitie, Cause of Our Joy. As after the darkness and gloom of night, the dawn is the cause of joy, thus after the darkness of sin, which for four thousand years before the coming of Jesus Christ had prevailed on earth, the birth of Mary, our Aurora, brought joy to the world. When Mary was born, the morning rose, says a holy father. Nata Maria surrexit Aurora. The dawn is the precursor of the sun, and Mary was the precursor of the incarnate word, the son of justice and our redeemer, who by his death freed us from eternal death. With reason does the church sing of the nativity of Mary. Thy birth, O holy mother of God, announce joy to the whole world. And as Mary was the beginning of our joy, so is she also the completion of it. For St. Bernard says, that Jesus Christ has placed the whole treasure of his merits in the hands of his mother, so that every good we receive, we may receive through Mary. O mother of God, thou art my joy and my hope. 
for thou dost refuse thy favor to none, and thou dost obtain from God whatever thou dost wish. Third, vas insigne devotionis, vessel of singular devotion. Devotion, as St. Thomas teaches, consists in the readiness of our will to conform to the will of God. This readiness was the principal virtue that rendered his most holy mother so dear to God. And this we are given to understand by the answer of our Lord to the woman who called blessed the womb that bore him. Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. By this, according to Bede, the Lord intended to say that Mary was happy by the union of her will with that of God than by being his mother. That flower which always turns toward the sun is a true type of Mary. The divine will alone was the only aim and satisfaction of the heart of Mary, as she herself sang. My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. O oh, blessed art thou, my lady, who was always and entirely united to the divine will. Obtain for me the grace to live for the remainder of my life, always in uniformity with the will of God. Sixth day. First, Rosa Mystica, Mystical Rose. It is said of Mary, in the Holy Canticles, that she was the enclosed garden of God. Hortus conclusus, Soror mea sponsa. And St. Bernard explaining this passage, says that the Lord planted in this garden all the flowers that adorn the church, and among others, the violet of humility, the lily of purity, and the rose of charity. The rose is red, and therefore Mary is called the rose, according to the idiot, on account of the ardent charity with which her heart was always inflamed towards God and towards us. And where can we find an advocate who is more occupied with our salvation, and who loves us more than Mary? We acknowledge that one alone in heaven is solicitous for us, as St. Augustine says of her. O oh, my dear mother, if I could love as thou lovest me, I will not, however, fail of doing what I can to honor and love thee. My sweet lady, obtain for me the grace to be faithful to thee. Second, Turis of Vitica, Tower of David. Mary is called, in the Holy Canticles, Tower of David. Thy neck is as the Tower of David. A thousand bucklers hang upon it all the armor of valiant men. St. Bernadine says that the tower of David stood on high, that is, on Sion, and therefore Mary is called the tower of David, to denote the elevation of this great creature. As Sion was a most lofty place, so the Blessed Virgin was most exalted. Hence of Mary it is said in the Psalms that her sanctity in the beginning was more exalted than the mountains. Fundamenta eius in montibus sanctis. St. Gregory explains it by saying that the Divine Mother was more holy in the first moments of her life than the saints have been at the moment of their death. O oh, my Queen and Mother, I rejoice in thy greatness, and am ready to give my life that thy glory should not be diminished in the least degree, if it were possible that it could be diminished. Oh, that I might give all my blood to cause all the nations of the earth to honor and love thee as the lady thou art. Third, Turis Eberne, Tower of Ivory. Thus Mary is also called, Thy neck is a tower of ivory. Colum tuum, Sicu Turis Eberne. Mary is called the neck, for she is the mystic neck through whom from the head, Jesus Christ, are transmitted to us the faithful, who are the members of the mystic body of the church, the vital spirits, namely, the divine help which preserves in us the life of grace. In the words of St. Bernadine, through the Virgin, the life-giving graces flow from Christ, the head, into his mystical body. The saint adds, that from the time when Mary conceived in her womb the incarnate word, she received from God such honor, that no one could receive any grace except through her hands. Ivory, in a word, is smooth and strong. Hence Rupert the Abbot writes of Mary. As a tower of ivory, beautiful in the eye of God, terrible to the devil. 
Thou then, O my lady, because thou art so beloved by God, canst obtain for us every blessing. And because thou art terrible to demons, thou canst liberate us from all their snares. Have pity on us, for we glory in living under thy protection. Seventh day. First, Domus Aura, House of Gold. Gold is the symbol of love. Hence the blessed Albertus Magnus calls Mary, the golden temple of charity. Templum Aurum Caritatis. And with reason, for St. Thomas says, that as everything in the temple was covered with gold, so the beautiful soul of Mary was filled with sanctity. Mary was the house of gold which the eternal wisdom, that is the divine word, chose for his habitation on this earth. Wisdom hath built herself a house. Sapienta edificavit sibi domum. Now this house of God, says Richard of St. Lawrence, is so rich that it can relieve all our miseries. O Mary, thou dost love God so much that thou dost desire to see him beloved by all. This is the grace that above all others I ask of thee and hope from thee. Obtain from me a great love to God. Second, Fideris Arca, Ark of the Covenant. Ischio calls Mary an ark more spacious than that of Noah. Arca Noah Largio, for in that only two animals of each kind were received, but under the mantle of Mary all find room, both just and sinners. This was one day revealed to St. Gertrude, who saw a multitude of wild beasts, lions, leopards, etc., who took refuge under the mantle of Mary, and she did not drive them away, but with kind hand caressed them, so that they might not fly away. The brutes who entered into the ark remain brutes, but sinners, who take shelter under the mantle of Mary, do not remain sinners. She will certainly change their hearts and render them dear to God. The Virgin herself revealed to St. Bridget, However a man may have sinned, if with a true purpose of amendment he returns to me, I am ready at once to receive him. Neither do I look upon the sins with which he is laden, but only whether he comes with good dispositions, and then I do not disdain to bind up and heal his wounds, for I am called, and truly am, the Mother of Mercy. O oh, Mother of Mercy, I will then say to thee with St. Augustine, Remember that it has never been known that a sinner was rejected by thee, who had recourse to thee for help. I, a miserable sinner, invoke and trust in thee. Third, Yanua Chele, Gate of Heaven. Mary is called the Gate of Heaven, because no one can enter into heaven, as St. Bonaventure declares, except through Mary. In Jerusalem is my power. In Jerusalem, Potestas mea, says our queen. And Richard of St. Lawrence adds, Commanding what I will, and introducing whom I will. In perando quad bolo, et quos bolo introducido. I can obtain whatever I wish for my servants, and introduce whom I will into paradise. Therefore St. Bonaventure says, Those who enjoy the favor of Mary are recognized as citizens of paradise, and those who are like her, that is, have the grace to be her servants, are written in the book of life. For this reason St. Bernardine de Bustis calls Mary the book of life, and says that he, who through devotion, to find her himself written in this book, will certainly be saved. Ah, my mother, in thee I place the hopes of my eternal salvation. I love thee, save thou me. Do not permit a servant of thine who loves thee to go to blaspheme thee in hell. Eighth day. First, Stella Matutina morning star. Mary is called by St. John Damascene, the star that precedes the sun. Stella de Monstron Solem. As the morning star precedes the sun, so devotion to the Holy Virgin precedes the sun of divine grace. And St. Germanus says that devotion towards Mary in a soul is a sign that it is, or soon will be, in the state of grace. By the church Our Lady is also called star of the sea, for, as St. Thomas explains it, as in the time of the tempest, mariners are guided into port by the star, 
so by Mary we are guided over the sea of this world to paradise. Therefore St. Bernard gives us this advice. If you do not wish to be overwhelmed by the tempests of temptations, do not turn your eyes from this star of salvation. And then he adds, Following Mary, you cannot go astray. If Mary protects you, you cannot fear being lost. If Mary favors you, you will arrive in paradise. Second, Salus Informorium, Health of the Weak. Mary is called by St. Simon Stock, the medicine of sinners. Peccatorum Medicina, and by St. Ephraim, not only medicine, but health itself. Firm health is for those who have recourse to her. Salus firma, recurrentium ad eum. For he who has recourse to Mary, not only finds medicine, but he finds health, as she herself promises to him who seeks her. He that shall find me shall find life, and shall have salvation from the Lord. Neither should we fear that on account of the loathsomeness of our wounds, she will refuse to take care of us, she is our mother, and as a mother does not shrink from taking care of a child covered with wounds, so this celestial physician does not refuse to cure her servants who have recourse to her. Wherefore St. Bernard says, O mother of God, thou hast no horror of a sinner, however loathsome he may be. If he sighs for thee, thou wilt rescue him with thine own hand from despair. Third, Refugium peccatorum, refuge of sinners. Thus Mary is called by St. Germanus, the refuge ever ready for all sinners. Refugium peritissimum peccatorum. For the idiot says that she cannot reject any sinner, but as soon as he has recourse to her, Mary receives him. Hence St. John Damascene calls Mary not only the refuge of the innocent, but also of the bad who implore her protection. And St. Anselm also says, Thou dost embrace with maternal love the sinner who is despised by the whole world. Neither dost thou leave the wretched until thou hast reconciled them to their God. By which he gives us to understand that the sinner, being hated by God, is rendered odious and abominable in the eyes of all creatures. But if he has recourse to the refuge of sinners... Mary not only does not despise him, but affectionately embraces him, and does not abandon him until he is pardoned by her son and our judge, Jesus Christ. Then, O oh my lady, if thou art the refuge of all sinners, thou art also my refuge. Thou who dost not despise any one who has recourse to thee, do not despise me, for to thee I recommend myself. Refugium peccatorum, ora pro nobis. O oh Mary, pray for us and save us. Ninth day. First, Consolatrix Afflictiorum, Comforter of the Afflicted. St. Germanus writes, O oh Mary, who has so great care of our welfare as thou hast? Is there any one who relieves us in our afflictions as thou dost? No, replies St. Antonius. There is none among the saints who compassionates our miseries as this most pious lady. And because the miseries which most afflict us are the maladies of the soul, the blessed Henry Suso calls Mary the most faithful consoler of sinners. Consolatrix Fidelissima Peccatorum. We need only show to Mary the wounds of our souls, and she immediately comes to our aid with her prayers and consoles us. Even as Richard of St. Victor teaches, her piety prevents us and relieves us before we invoke her. Belosius occurrit quam invocitur. Let us say to her then, with St. Bonaventure, O oh Mary, always console us, but especially at the hour of our death. Come then and take our souls and present them to thy son, who is to be our judge. Second, Auxilium Christianorum, help of Christians. St. John of Damascus calls her, aid prepared and ready to free us from all dangers. The help of Mary is, as St. Cosmas of Jerusalem declares, omnipotent to save us from sin and from hell. St. Bernard addresses her in these words, thou art invisible in the defense of thy servants. To Bellatrix Egregia, 
doing battle with the demons who assail them. And for this reason Mary is called in the sacred canticles, Terrible as an army set in array. Terribilis, u castrorum achias, or donata. Ah, my queen, if I had always had recourse to thee, I should never have been conquered by my enemies. From henceforth thou must be my strength. In my temptations I will always invoke thee, and from thee I hope for victory. Third, Regina Martyrum, Queen of Martyrs. Mary is justly called Queen of Martyrs, for her martyrdom on the death of her son on the cross exceeded the sufferings of all the martyrs, and there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. Stabat juxta crucem, mater eius. Mothers fly from their children when they see them dying before their eyes and cannot help them. Mary does not fly, but remains with Jesus until she sees him expire. Stabat juxta crucem. And while Jesus is in his agony, she is offering to the eternal father the life of her son for our salvation. But in offering it, she also endures the agony of death and experiences a suffering greater than that of every death. O oh, my afflicted mother, by the merits of the sufferings thou didst endure at the foot of the cross, obtain for me a true sorrow for my sins and love for Jesus my Redeemer. And by that sword which pierced thy heart, when thou didst see him bow his head and expire, I pray thee to assist me at the moment of my death, and obtain for me then eternal salvation, that I may come to love thee forever with thy son Jesus. End of section 53「Meditations for various feasts of Mary」for the day of the purification of Mary and the presentation of Jesus. First, the time having arrived when Mary was to go, according to the law, to be purified in the temple and to present Jesus to the Divine Father, she departed with Joseph. Joseph took the two turtle doves that were to be offered, and Mary takes her dear infant. She takes the divine lamb to offer him to God, as a sign of that great sacrifice which this son was one day to complete upon the cross. O oh my God, I also unite my offering to that of Mary. I offer thee thy son made man, and by his merits I pray thee to give me thy grace. I do not merit it, but Jesus, to obtain it for me, has sacrificed himself to thee. For love then of Jesus, have pity on me. Second, behold, Mary enters into the temple and makes the oblation of her son in the name of the whole human race. But especially on this day does Jesus offer himself to his eternal father. Behold me, he says, O oh my father, to thee I consecrate my whole life. Thou hast sent me into the world to save it. Behold my blood and my life. I offer all to thee for the salvation of the world. Unhappy should I be, my dear Redeemer, if thou hast not satisfied for me the divine justice. I thank thee for it with my whole soul, and I love thee with my whole heart. And whom should I love if I do not love a God who has sacrificed his life for me? Third, this sacrifice was more dear to God than if all men and all angels had offered to him their lives. Yes, because of this offering alone of Jesus, the Eternal Father received an infinite honor and an infinite satisfaction. Jesus Christ once said to the blessed Angela of Foligno, I have offered myself to thee that thou mayest offer thyself to me. Yes, my Jesus, as thou didst offer to the Father thy life for me, I offer to thee my life and my whole self. Hitherto I have with so great ingratitude slighted thee, but thou hast promised to forget the offenses of a sinner who repents of having offended thee. My Jesus, I grieve for it, and I wish to die of grief. I was dead in sin, from thee I hope for life, and my life will be to love thee, O infinite good. Grant that I may love thee, and I will ask of thee nothing more. 
dispense the goods of this earth to those who desire them. I desire nothing but the treasure of thy love. My Jesus, thou art alone enough for me. O oh, my Queen and Mother Mary, through thee I hope for every good. Meditation for the Day of the Annunciation to Mary First, when God wished to send his Son to make himself man, that he might redeem lost man, he chose for him a virgin mother, among all virgins the most pure, the most holy, and the most humble. And behold, whilst Mary was in her poor dwelling, praying to God for the coming of the Redeemer, an angel appears and salutes her, and says to her, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And what does the humble virgin, when she hears such words in her honor? She is not elated, but is silent and troubled, esteeming herself too unworthy of these praises. She was troubled at his saying, Turbata est in sermone eus. O Mary, thou so humble and I so proud, obtain for me holy humility. Second, do not those praises at least cause Mary to suspect that she was the destined mother of the Redeemer? No, they only caused her to conceive a great fear of herself. Wherefore it was necessary that he should encourage her not to be afraid. Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found grace with God. And then he announced to her that she was chosen to be the mother of the Savior of the world. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Blessed art thou, O Mary, how dear thou wast, and art to thy God. Have pity on me. Third, take courage, says St. Bernard, addressing her. Why delay, holy virgin, in giving thy consent? The eternal word awaits it, in order to clothe himself with flesh and become thy son. We who are all condemned to eternal death are waiting for it in misery. If thou dost accept and consent to be his mother, we shall all be delivered. Quickly, O lady, answer. Do not delay giving to the world that salvation which depends on thy consent. But rejoice, for Mary already answers to the angel. Behold, she says, the servant of the Lord, bound to do whatever her Lord commands. If he chooses a servant for his mother, the servant is not to be praised, but only the goodness of God, who wishes thus to honor her. O Mary most humble, thou by thy humility hast so enamored thy God, that thou hast constrained him to make himself thy son and our redeemer. I know that thy son denies thee nothing that thou dost ask. Ask of him to give me his holy love. Ask of him to pardon me all the offenses which I have committed against him. Ask of him to give me perseverance until death. In a word, recommend to him my soul, for thy recommendations are never rejected by a son who loves thee so much. O oh Mary, thou must save me. Thou art my hope. Meditation for the Second Day of July On the Feast of the Visitation of Mary First, Mary set out from Nazareth to go to the city of Hebron, distant, according to Brocardo, seventy miles. That is to say, at least seven days' journey over rough mountains and with no other companion than her spouse Joseph. The Holy Virgin hastens, as St. Luke informs us. She went into the mountainous country in haste. Abiet in Montana cum festinatione. Tell us, O holy lady, why thou didst undertake this long and difficult journey, and why thou did thus hasten on thy way. I am going, she answers, to exercise my office of charity. I am going to console a family. If then, O great mother of God, thy office is to console and dispense graces to souls, ah, come to console and visit my soul. Thy visit then sanctify the house of Elizabeth. Come, O Mary, and sanctify me also. Second, and now the Holy Virgin has arrived at the house of Elizabeth. She had been made mother of God, but she is the first to salute her relation. She entered and saluted Elizabeth. Intravit et salutavit Elizabeth. Elizabeth, enlightened by the Lord, already knows that the divine word has become man and the son of Mary. 
hence she calls her blessed among women and blesses that divine fruit that was in her womb blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb and filled at the same time with confusion and joy she exclaims and whence is this to me that the mother of my lord should come to me but what does the humble mary answer to these words she answers my soul doth magnify the lord magnificat anima mea dominum as if she would say o oh, elizabeth you praise me but i praise my god that he has chosen to exalt me his poor servant to be his mother he hath regarded the humility of his servant respects it humilitatem ancile sue o oh, most holy mary since thou dost dispense so many graces to those who ask them of thee i pray thee to give me thy humility thou dost esteem thyself as nothing before god but i am worse than nothing for i am at the same time nothing and a sinner thou canst make me humble make me so through love of that god who has made thee his mother third but at the first words of mary when she salutes elizabeth what happens the child john exults with joy on account of the divine grace given him before his birth elizabeth is filled with the holy spirit and zachary the father of the baptist not long after is consoled by recovering his speech so that it is indeed true o oh my queen and mother that through thee the divine graces are dispensed and souls are sanctified do not forget then o oh my most dear lady me thy poor servant who loves thee and has placed in thee all my hopes thy prayers are all graciously heard by that god who loves thee so much pray then for me o oh my mother and make me holy meditation for the fifteenth day of august on the feast of the assumption of mary into heaven first mary dies but how does she die she dies entirely detached from any affection for created things and dies consumed with that divine love with which her most holy heart was always and entirely inflamed o holy mother thou hast already left the earth do not forget us miserable pilgrims who remained in this valley of tears struggling against so many enemies who desire to see us lost in hell ah by the merits of thy precious death obtain for us detachment from earthly things pardon of our sins love to god and holy perseverance and when the hour of our death shall arrive assist us from heaven with thy prayers and obtain for us to come and kiss thy feet in paradise second mary dies and her most pure body is carried by the holy apostles and placed in the sepulchre and is guarded by angels for three days after which it is transported to paradise but her beautiful soul entered as soon as she expired the kingdom of the blessed accompanied by innumerable angels and by her son himself having entered heaven she humbly presents herself to god adores him and with unbounded love thanks him for all the graces which she has received from him god embraces her blesses her and constitutes her queen of the universe exalting her above all the angels and saints now if the human mind as the apostle says cannot arrive at the comprehension of the great glory that god is preparing in heaven for his servants who have loved him on this earth what must be the glory that he gave to this his most holy mother who on earth has loved him more than all the saints and angels and has loved him with all her power so that mary alone when she entered heaven could say to god o oh my lord if i have not loved thee on earth as thou dost merit at least i have loved thee as much as i could third let us rejoice with mary in the glory with which her god has enriched her and let us also rejoice for ourselves for mary at the same time was made queen of the world and appointed our advocate she is so merciful an advocate that she consents to defend all sinners who recommend themselves to her and she is so powerful with our judge that she gains all the causes which she defends o oh, our queen and advocate in thy hand is our salvation if thou dost pray for us we shall be saved 
Say to thy son, that thou dost wish us with thee in paradise. He denies thee nothing, that thou dost ask. O oh, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Mary, pray Jesus for us. Meditation for the Eighth Day of September On the Feast of the Nativity of Mary First, before the birth of Mary, the world was lost in the darkness of sin. Mary was born, and the morning arose. Nata Maria, surrexit auroro, says a holy father. Already it had been said of Mary, Who is she that cometh forth as the morning rising? As the earth rejoices when the day dawns, for the dawn is the precursor of the sun, so Mary at her birth gave joy to the whole world, for she was the precursor of the Son of Justice, Jesus Christ, who being made her son, came to save us by his death. Therefore the church sings, Thy nativity, O Virgin Mother of God, announce joy to the whole world, for from thee the Son of Justice has arisen, who has given us eternal life. Thus, when Mary was born, we received our remedy, our consolation, and our salvation, for through Mary we have received the Savior. Second, this child being then destined for the mother of the eternal word, God bestowed on her so much grace, that even from her immaculate conception, her sanctity excelled the sanctity of all the saints and angels united, for she received a grace of a superior order, corresponding to the dignity of mother of God. O holy infant, O full of grace, I, a miserable sinner, salute thee and adore thee. Thou art the beloved, the delight of God. Have pity on me, who through my sins have been hateful and abominable in the eyes of God. Thou, O most pure virgin, hast so well known even from thy infancy how to gain the heart of God, that he denies thee nothing, and grants all that thou dost ask of him. In thee, then, I place my hopes. Recommend me to thy son, and I shall be saved. Third, at the same time that Mary was destined to be the mother of our Redeemer, she was also destined to be the mediatrix between God and us sinners. Hence the angelic doctor, St. Thomas, says, that Mary received grace sufficient to save all men. And therefore, St. Bernard calls Mary a channel so full that we can all partake of its fullness. O oh, my queen, O oh, mediatrix of sinners, perform thy office and intercede for me. Let not my sins prevent me from confiding in thee, O oh, great mother of God. No, I trust in thee, and trust in thee so much, that if my salvation were in my own hands, yet I would place it all in thine. O oh, Mary, receive me under thy protection, and this is enough for me. Meditation for the 21st day of November, on the Feast of the Presentation of Mary. First, the Holy Child Mary, having hardly arrived at the age of three years, entreated her parents that she might be placed in the temple according to the promise which they had made. The day appointed having arrived, the Immaculate Young Virgin leaves Nazareth with St. Joachim and St. Anne, accompanied by a host of angels who attend that Holy Child, who was destined for the mother of their Creator. Go, says St. Germanus, go, O blessed Virgin, to the house of the Lord, to await the Holy Spirit, who is to come to render thee mother of the eternal word. Second, the holy company having arrived at the temple in Jerusalem, the holy child turns to her parents, and kneeling, kisses their hands, asks their blessing, and then, without looking back, ascends the steps of the temple. There renouncing entirely the world and all things that the world could give her, she offers and consecrates herself wholly to God. Henceforth, the life of Mary in the temple was but one continual exercise of love and the offering of her whole self to her Lord. She increased from hour to hour, nay, from moment to moment, in holy virtues, sustained indeed by divine grace, but always endeavoring, with all her powers, to correspond with grace. Mary herself revealed this to St. Elizabeth, the Virgin, saying, Do you think that I obtain the graces and virtues without an effort? Know that I receive from God no grace without great effort, continual prayer, an ardent desire, and many tears and penances. 
Third, thus Mary, a young virgin in the temple, did nothing but pray. And seeing the human race lost and hateful to God, she especially prayed for the coming of the Messiah, desiring then to be the servant of that happy virgin, who was to be the mother of God. Oh, who would have said to her then? O oh, holy lady, know that already through thy prayers, the Son of God is hastening to come and redeem the world, and know that thou art the blessed one chosen to be the mother of thy creator. O oh, beloved of God, most holy child, thou prayest for all, pray also for me. Thou hast consecrated thyself wholly, even from infancy, to the love of thy God. Ah, uh, obtain for me at least, that during the remaining years of my life I may live for God alone. Today together with thee I renounce all creatures, and consecrate myself to the love of my Lord. I also offer myself to thee, O my Queen, to serve thee for ever. Accept me for thy special servant, and obtain for me the grace to be faithful to thee and to thy Son, that I may come one day to praise thee and love thee eternally in paradise. Meditation for the Eighth Day of December on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. First, it was indeed befitting the three divine persons to preserve Mary from original sin. It was befitting the Father, for Mary was his firstborn daughter. As Jesus was the firstborn of God, primogenitus omnius creatore, so Mary, being destined to become the mother of Jesus, God always considered her as his adopted firstborn daughter, and therefore always possessed her by his grace. Dominus possedit me, initio viarum suarum. It was, then, befitting the honor of the Son, that the Father should preserve the mother from every stain of sin. It was also fitting, because he destined this, his daughter, to crush the head of the infernal serpent, which had seduced man, as we read, Ipsa conterit, caput tuum. How could he then permit that she should first be his slave? Moreover, Mary was also destined to be the advocate of sinners, and for this reason also, it was meet that God should preserve her from sin, that she might not appear guilty of the very sin of those for whom she was to intercede. Second, it was befitting the son that his mother should be immaculate. He chose her himself for his mother, and it cannot be believed that a son who has it in his power to choose a queen for his mother would choose a slave. How then could we believe that the eternal word would wish his mother once defiled by sin and once an enemy of God, when it was in his power to have an immaculate mother and one always the friend of God? Moreover, St. Augustine says, The flesh of Christ is the flesh of Mary. Caro Christi, caro est Mariae. The Son of God would have felt horror at taking flesh from St. Agnes, St. Gertrude, or St. Teresa, because those holy virgins, before baptism, were stained by sin, and the devil would have been able to reproach him for being clothed with a flesh which once had been subject to him. But he felt no horror at becoming man in the womb of Mary. Non harusti virginis uterum. Mary having always been pure and immaculate. Besides, St. Thomas says that Mary was preserved from every actual sin, even venial, for otherwise she would not have been a fitting mother of God, but how much less fit would she have been if she had been defiled by original sin, which renders the soul odious to God? Third, it was befitting the Holy Spirit that this, his most beloved spouse, should be immaculate. The redemption of men who had already fallen into sin being decreed, he wished that this, his spouse, should be redeemed in the most noble manner, namely, by being preserved from falling into sin. And if God preserved the body of Mary after her death, how much more ought we to believe that he would preserve her soul from the corruption of guilt? For this reason, the divine spouse called her an enclosed garden, a sealed fountain in the canticles, for the enemies never entered the blessed soul of Mary. Therefore he praised her, calling her all fair, always beloved, and spotless. Ah, my most lovely lady, it is my delight to see thee so dear to thy God, through thy purity and love. 
I thank God for having preserved thee from every sin. Ah, my queen, since thou art so loved by the most holy trinity, do not disdain to cast thy eyes upon my soul, so defiled by sin, that thou mayest obtain for me from God pardon and eternal salvation. Look upon me and change me. Thou by thy sweetness hast drawn so many hearts to love thee. Draw also my heart, that henceforth I may love no other than God and thee. Thou knowest that in thee I have placed all my hopes. My dear mother, do not abandon me. Assist me always by thy intercession, in life and especially in death. Make me then to die invoking thee, and loving thee, that I may come to love thee forever in paradise. End of section 54 Section 55 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Prayers to the Divine Mother for Every Day of the Week Sunday Prayer to the Most Holy Mary to Obtain the Pardon of Sins Behold, O Mother of God, at thy feet a miserable sinner, the slave of hell, who has recourse to thee and trusts in thee. I do not even merit that thou shouldest look upon me, but I know that having seen thy son die to save sinners, thou hast the greatest desire to aid them. O mother of mercy, look on my miseries, and have pity on me. I hear thee called by all, the refuge of sinners, the hope of the desperate, the help of the abandoned. Then thou art my refuge, my hope, my help. Thou must save me by thy intercession. Succor me for the love of Jesus Christ. Give thy hand to a poor fallen sinner who recommends himself to thee. I know that thou dost find consolation in helping the sinner when thou canst. Help me then, for thou canst help me. I, by my sins, have lost the grace of God and my soul. Now I place myself in thy hands. Tell me what I must do to return to the favor of my Lord, for I will do it without delay. He sends me to thee that thou mayest succor me, and he wishes me to have recourse to thy mercy, that not only the merits of thy son, but also thy prayers, may aid in my salvation. To thee then I have recourse, thou who dost pray for so many others, pray also to Jesus for me. Ask him to pardon me, and he will pardon me. Tell him that thou dost desire my salvation, and he will save me. Make known the good that thou canst do to help those who confide in thee. Amen. Thus I hope, thus may it be. Monday. Prayer to the Most Holy Mary to Obtain Holy Perseverance. O Queen of Heaven, I who once had been a miserable slave of Lucifer, now dedicate myself to thee as thy servant forever, and offer myself to honor and serve thee for the whole life. Accept me, do not refuse me as I merit. O oh, my mother, I have placed in thee all my hopes, from thee I hope all blessings. I thank and bless God, who in his mercy has given me this confidence in thee, which I consider as the great earnest of my salvation. Ah, how I have fallen in my past life, I a miserable sinner, because I have not had recourse to thee. Now I hope to be pardoned through the merits of Jesus Christ and through thy prayers. But I may again lose the divine grace. The danger is not over. My enemies do not sleep. How many new temptations remain for me to conquer? Ah, my most sweet lady, protect me, and do not permit me again to be their slave. Help me always. I know that thou wilt help me, and with thy help I shall conquer, if I recommend myself to thee. But this I fear, that in occasions of falling into sin, I may neglect to call on thee, and thus may be lost. This grace I ask of thee, obtain for me, that in the assaults of hell, I may always have recourse to thee, saying, Mary, aid me. My good mother, do not permit me to lose my God. Tuesday. Prayer to Mary Most Holy to Obtain a Good Death. O oh Mary, what will be my death? I tremble and am confounded when I now consider my sins and think of that great, decisive moment of my salvation or eternal damnation when I shall die and be judged. 
O oh, my most sweet mother, my hopes are in the blood of Jesus Christ, and in thy intercession. O oh, consoler of the afflicted, do not abandon me then. Do not cease consoling me in that great affliction. If now I am tormented with remorse, on account of past sins, the uncertainty of pardon, the danger of relapse, and the rigor of divine justice, what will become of me then? If thou dost not aid me, I am lost. Ah, my lady, before my death arrives, obtain for me a great sorrow for my sins, a true amendment, and fidelity to God, for the life that remains to me. And when the last moment of my life comes, O oh Mary, my hope, aid me then in my great distress, and encourage me then that I may not despair at the sight of my sins, which the demon will present to me. Obtain for me the grace to invoke thee then more constantly, that I may expire with thy sweet name, and that of thy most holy Son, upon my lips. And now, O oh lady, pardon my boldness. Before I expire, come thyself to console me by thy presence. This grace thou hast granted to so many of thy servants, I also wish and hope for it. I am indeed a sinner, and I do not merit it. But I am thy servant, who loves thee, and has great confidence in thee. O oh Mary, I wait for thee. Do not leave me disconsolate. At least, if I am not worthy of so great a favor, assist me from heaven, that I may die in the love of God and of thee, and come to love God and thee eternally in paradise. Wednesday. Prayer to Mary Most Holy to Obtain Deliverance from Hell. O oh, my dearest lady, I thank thee that thou hast so often rescued me from hell, as often as I have deserved it through my sins. O oh, miserable sinner, I was already condemned to that prison, and that sentence would perhaps have been executed upon me after my first sin, if thou hast not in thy mercy helped me. Thou wast not even invoked by me, but by thy mercy alone, thou hast restrained the divine justice, and then subduing my hard-heartedness, hast drawn me to take confidence in thee. And, oh, into how many sins I should have fallen in the dangers to which I have been exposed, if thou, my most loving mother, hadst not preserved me by the graces which thou hast obtained for me. Ah, my queen, still preserve me from hell. But of what avail will be thy mercy, and the favors that thou hast bestowed on me, if I should be condemned? If once I love thee not, now after God, I love thee above everything. Ah, do not permit that I should turn my back upon thee, and upon God, who, through thee, hath dispensed to me so many mercies. My most amiable lady, do not permit that I should hate and curse thee in hell, Wilt thou suffer a servant of thine, who loves thee, to be lost? O oh Mary, what dost thou say to me? I shall be lost if I leave thee. But who can have the heart to leave thee? How could I forget the love thou hast borne me? My mother, since thou hast done so much to save me, complete the work, continue to aid me. Dost thou wish to help me? But what do I say? If thou didst show me so much favor when I lived, forgetful of thee, how much more ought I now to hope, when I love thee and recommend myself to thee? No, he who has recourse to thee is never lost, only he who does not recommend himself to thee. Ah, my mother, do not leave me in my own hands, for I shall be lost. Make me always to have recourse to thee. Save me, my hope. Save me from hell, but first from sin, which alone can condemn me to hell. Thursday. Prayer to the Most Holy Mary to Obtain Paradise. O Queen of Paradise, who sittest above the choirs of angels, nearest to God, from this veil of misery I, a miserable sinner, salute thee, and pray thee to turn towards me those kind eyes of thine, that dispense graces to all those they look upon. See, O oh Mary, in how much danger I now find myself, and must find myself, while I live on this earth, of losing my soul, paradise, and God. In thee, O oh Lady, I have placed all hopes. I love thee, and long to come to thee, see thee, and praise thee in paradise. Ah, Mary, when will the day come that I shall see myself safe at thy feet, 
and shall behold the mother of my Lord and my mother, who has been so occupied with my salvation? When shall I kiss that hand which has so many times delivered me from hell, and bestowed on me so many graces, when, by my sins, I merited to be hated and abandoned by all? O oh, lady, I have been very ungrateful to thee in my life, but if I come to paradise, I will be no more ungrateful. There I will love thee as much as I can, every moment through all eternity, and I will make amends for my ingratitude by blessing thee and thanking thee for ever. Above all, I thank God who gives me such confidence in the blood of Jesus Christ and in thee, namely, that thou wilt save me, that thou wilt free me from my sins, and obtain for me light and strength to execute the divine will, and finally conduct me to the port of paradise. All this have thy servants hoped, and none have been deceived. Neither shall I be deceived. Mary, I wish nothing else. Thou must save me. Pray thy son Jesus, as I also pray him, through the merits of his passion, to preserve me, and always more increase this confidence, and I shall be saved. Friday Prayer to the Most Holy Mary to obtain love towards her and Jesus Christ. O oh Mary, I know that thou art the creature the most noble, the most sublime, the most pure, the most beautiful, the most merciful, the most holy, in a word, the most lovely of all creatures. O oh, if all knew thee, O oh my lady, and loved thee as thou dost merit, but I console myself that so many happy souls in heaven and on earth live enamored of thy goodness and beauty. Above all, I rejoice that God himself loves thee alone, more than all men and angels united. My most amiable queen, I, a miserable sinner, also love thee, but I love thee too little. I desire a love greater and more tender towards thee, and this thou must obtain for me. For to love thee is a great sign of predestination, and a grace that God does not grant, except to those whom he wishes to be saved. I see myself then, O oh my mother, greatly indebted to thy son. I see that he merits an infinite love. Thou who desires nothing but to see him loved, this is the grace that above all others thou must obtain for me. Obtain for me a great love for Jesus Christ. Thou dost obtain from God whatever thou dost wish. Ah, obtain for me this grace to be so united with the divine will, that I may never more be separated from it. I do not ask of thee the goods of earth, neither honors nor riches. I ask of thee what thy heart most desires. I wish to love my God. Is it possible that thou wilt not aid me in this my desire, which pleases thee so much? No, for thou dost even now help me. Already thou art praying for me. Pray, Pray, and never cease to pray, until thou seest me in paradise, beyond the danger of being able any more to lose my Lord, and certain of loving him forever, together with thee, my dearest mother. Saturday. Prayer to the Most Holy Mary to obtain her patronage. O oh, my Most Holy Mother, I know what graces thou hast obtained for me, and I see the ingratitude of which I have been guilty towards thee. The ungrateful are no longer worthy of favors, but I will not on this account distrust thy mercy, which is greater than my ingratitude. O oh, my great advocate, have pity on me. Thou art the dispenser of all the graces which God grants to us miserable sinners, and for this end he has made thee so powerful, so rich and so merciful, that thou mightest succor us in our miseries. Ah, mother of mercy, do not leave me in my poverty. Thou art the advocate of the most wretched and abandoned sinners who have recourse to thee. Defend me also, who recommend myself to thee. Do not tell me that it is difficult to gain my cause, for the most desperate causes are all gained when they are defended by thee. In thy hands, then, I place my eternal salvation, and to thee I commit my soul. I was lost, thou by thy intercession must save it. I wish to be enrolled among thy most devout servants. Do not cast me out. Thou dost go in search of the wretched to relieve them. Do not abandon a miserable sinner who has recourse to thee. Speak for me. Thy son does whatever thou dost ask of him. Take me under thy protection, and that will be enough. 
Yes, for if thou dost protect me, I fear nothing, nothing from my sins, for thou wilt obtain for me the remedy for the injury I have inflicted upon myself, nor from the demons, for thou art more powerful than all hell united, nor from Jesus my judge himself, for by one prayer of thine he is appeased. I only fear that through my negligence I may cease to invoke thee, and shall thus be lost. My mother, obtain for me the pardon of all my sins, love to Jesus, holy perseverance, a good death, and finally paradise. Especially obtain for me the grace always to recommend myself to thee. It is true that these graces are too much for me, who does not merit them, but they are not too much for thee, who art so beloved by God, that he grants thee whatever thou dost ask of him. It is enough that thou dost begin to speak, and he denies thee nothing. Pray then to Jesus for me, tell him that thou dost protect me, and he will not fail to have pity on me. My mother, I trust in thee, in this hope I repose and live, and in this I wish to die. Amen. Live always, Jesus our love, and Mary our hope. End of section 55《セクション56 of the Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguori。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Little Rosary of the Seven Dolors of Mary and of the Immaculate Mary。Incline unto mine aid, O God, etc. My mother, enable my heart to share thy sorrow for the death of thy son。First Dolor。I pity thee, O my afflicted mother, on account of the first sword of sorrow that pierced thee, when in the temple, by the prophecy of Simeon, all the cruel sufferings that men would inflict on thy beloved Jesus were represented to thee, which thou hast already learned from the holy scriptures, even to his death before thy eyes, upon the infamous wood of the cross, exhausted of blood and abandoned by all, and thou without the power to defend or relieve him. By that bitter memory, then, which for so many years afflicted thy heart, I pray thee, O my queen, to obtain for me the grace that always in life and in death I may keep impressed upon my heart the passion of Jesus and thy sorrows. Our Father, hail Mary, glory be to God, etc., O my mother, etc., as above, which strophe must always be repeated at the end of each dolor. Second Dolor, I pity thee, O my afflicted mother, on account of the second sword that pierced thee, when thou didst behold thy innocent son, so soon after his birth, threatened with death by those very men, for whom he had come into the world, so that thou wast obliged to flee with him by night, secretly into Egypt. By the many hardships, then, that thou, a delicate young virgin, in company with thy exiled infant, didst endure in the long and wearisome journey through rough and desert countries and in thy sojourn in egypt where being unknown and a stranger thou didst live all those years poor and despised i pray thee o my beloved lady to obtain for me the grace to suffer with patience in thy company till death the trials of this miserable life that i may be able in the next to be preserved from the eternal sufferings of hell deserved by me our Father, etc. Third Dolor. I pity thee, O my afflicted mother, on account of the third sword that pierced thy heart at the loss of thy dear son Jesus, who remained absent from thee in Jerusalem for three days, when not seeing thy beloved one by thy side, and not knowing the cause of his absence. I conceive, my loving queen, how in those nights thou didst not repose, and did not but sigh for him who was thy only good. By the sighs, then, of those three days, for thee so long and bitter, I pray thee to obtain for me the grace never to lose my God, that I may always live closely united to God, and thus united with him, departed from this world. Our Father, etc. Fourth Dolor I pity thee, my afflicted mother, on account of the fourth sword that pierced thy heart, in seeing thy Jesus condemned to death, bound with ropes and chains, covered with blood and wounds, 
crowned with thorns, and falling under the weight of the heavy cross, which he bore on his bleeding back, when going like an innocent lamb to die for love of us. Thine eye then met his eye, and your glances were so many cruel arrows, with which each wounded the loving heart of the other. By this great grief, then, I pray thee to obtain for me the grace to live wholly resigned to the will of my God, joyfully bearing my cross with Jesus to the last moment of my life. Our Father, etc. Fifth Dolor I pity thee, O my afflicted mother, on account of the fifth sword that pierced thy heart, when on Mount Calvary thou didst behold thy beloved son, Jesus, dying slowly before thy eyes, amid so many insults and in anguish, on that hard bed of the cross, without being able to give him even the least of those comforts which the greatest criminals receive at the hour of death. And I pray thee by the anguish which thou, O my most loving mother, didst suffer together with thy dying son, and by the tenderness thou didst feel, when for the last time he spoke to thee from the cross, and taking leave of thee, left all of us to thee in the person of St. John, as thy children, and thou, still constant, didst behold him bow his head and expire. I pray thee to obtain for me the grace, by thy crucified love, to live and die crucified to everything in this world, in order to live only to God through my whole life, and thus enter one day paradise, to enjoy him face to face. Our Father, etc. Sixth Dolor I pity thee, O my afflicted mother, on account of the sixth sword which pierced thy heart, when thou didst see the kind heart of thy son pierced through and through after his death, a death endured for those ungrateful men, who, even after his death, were not satisfied with the tortures they had inflicted upon him. By this cruel sorrow, then, which was wholly thine, I pray thee to obtain for me the grace to abide in the heart of Jesus, who was wounded and opened for me, in that heart, I say, which is the beautiful abode of love, where all the souls who love God repose, and that living there, I will never love or think of anything but God. Most holy virgin, thou canst do it, from thee I hope for it. Our Father, etc. Seventh Dolor I pity thee, O my afflicted mother, on account of the seventh sword that pierced thy heart, on seeing in thy arms thy son, who had just expired, no longer fair and beautiful as thou didst once receive him in the stable of Bethlehem, but covered with blood, livid, and lacerated by wounds, which exposed his very bones. My son, thou saidest, my son, to what hast love brought thee? And when he was born to the sepulchre, thou didst wish to accompany him thyself, and help to put him in the tomb with thy own hands and bidding him a last farewell, thou hast left thy loving heart, buried with thy son. By all the anguish of thy pure soul, obtain for me, O mother of fair love, pardon for the offenses that I have committed against God, whom I love, and of which I repent with my whole heart. Wilt thou defend me in temptations? Assist me at the hour of my death, that, being saved by the merits of Jesus and thine, I may come one day with thy aid, after this miserable exile, to sing in paradise the praises of Jesus and thine through all eternity. Amen. Our Father, etc. Pray for us, O most sorrowful Virgin, that we may be worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. O God, at whose passion, according to the prophecy of Simeon, the sword of sorrow pierced through the most sweet soul of the glorious Virgin and Mother, Mary. Grant that we, who commemorate and reverence her dolors, may experience the blessed effect of thy passion, who livest and reignest, world without end. Amen. Benedict Thirteenth granted two hundred days indulgence for every Our Father and every Hail Mary, to those who recite this little crown in the churches of the Servites of Mary, and has granted the same favor to those who recite it, in any place whatever, on Fridays, or any day during Lent, and on other days, one hundred days for every Our Father and Hail Mary, to those who recite it entire, seven years, to those who recite it for a year, plenary indulgence, applicable to the souls in purgatory. 
Moreover, let it be observed that there are seven hundred years of indulgence for the dead, granted by Clement the Twelfth, to those who say, kneeling, the De Profundis, at the ringing of the bell. A little rosary of the Immaculate Mary, which is recited in some churches. Incline unto mine aid, O God, etc., glory, etc., after this, an Our Father is recited in honor of the Eternal Father, in thanksgiving for all the graces bestowed on Mary, with four Hail Marys. The same is repeated in honor of the Son, and again in honor of the Holy Ghost. After each Hail Mary is recited, the following verse. As mid the thorns thy lily fair, art thou, Virgin Immaculate, from sin preserved, by him whose care, did thee his mother bless create. At the end, pray for us, O Immaculate Virgin, ora pro nobis, Virgo Immaculata, that we may be worthy of the promises of Christ. Ut digni officiatmor promissionibus Christi. Let us pray. Grant to thy servants, we pray thee, O Lord, the gift of divine grace, that to us, for whom the maternity of the Blessed Virgin was the beginning of salvation, the votive commemoration of her conception may bring an increase of peace. By our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. End of section 56. Section 57 of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Various Prayers to Mary. Dedication of oneself to Mary. O most holy Virgin Mother of God, Mary, I, blank, although most unworthy of being thy servant, yet moved by thy wonderful mercy and by the desire to serve thee, choose thee today, in presence of my guardian angel, and of the whole celestial court, for my especial lady, advocate, and mother, and make the firm resolution that I always will love and serve thee, for the future, and do whatever I can to induce also others to love and serve thee. I pray thee, mother, of God, and my most kind and amiable mother, by the blood of thy divine Son, which was shed for me, that thou wilt receive me into the number of thy servants, for thy child and servant forever. Assist me in all my thoughts, words, and actions, at every moment of my life, that every step and breath may be directed to the greater glory of my God, and through thy most powerful intercession, obtain for me, that I may never more offend my beloved Jesus, that I may glorify and love him in this life, and that I may also love thee, my most beloved and dear mother, that I may love thee and enjoy thee through eternity in holy paradise. Amen. My mother Mary, I recommend to thee my soul, especially at the hour of my death. Dedication of a Family to Mary O blessed and immaculate Virgin, our Queen and Mother, refuge and consolation of all those who are in misery, I, prostrate before thy throne with all my family, choose thee for my Lady, Mother and Advocate with God, I, with all who belong to me, dedicate myself forever to thy service, and pray thee, O Mother of God, to receive us into the number of thy servants, taking us all under thy protection, aiding us in life, and still more, at the hour of our death. O Mother of mercy, I choose thee, Lady and Ruler of my whole house, of my relatives, of my interests, and all my affairs. Do not disdain to take care of them, Dispose of them all as it pleases thee. Bless me, then, and all my family, and do not permit that any of us should offend thy son. Do thou defend us in temptations, deliver us from dangers, provide for us in our necessities, counsel us in our doubts, console us in afflictions, be with us in sickness, and especially in the agonies of death. Do not permit the devil to glory in having in his chains any of us who are now consecrated to thee, but grant that we may come to thee in heaven to thank thee, and together with thee to praise and love our Redeemer Jesus for all eternity. Amen. Thus may it be. Prayer of St. Ephraim to Mary, abbreviated. 
O Immaculate and Holy Pure Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Queen of the World, Hope of the Despairing, Thou art the Joy of the Saints, Thou art the Reconciler of Sinners to God, Thou art the Advocate of the Abandoned, the Secure Haven of the Shipwrecked, Thou art the Consolation of the World, the Ransom of Captives, the Comforter of the Afflicted, the Salvation of the World. O Great Queen, we take refuge in Thy protection. We confide in none but thee, O most pure virgin. Non nobis es alia, quam in te fiducia, O Virgo sincerissima. O Lady, after God we have no other hope but in thee. We bear the name of thy servants. Do not permit the enemy to bear us away to hell. Hail, best mediatrix of God and men. Ave, Dei et hominem mediatrix optima. I salute thee, O great mediatrix of peace between man and God, O mother of Jesus our Lord, the love of all men and of God, to thee be honor and blessing with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Prayer of St. Thomas of Aquine O most blessed and sweet Virgin Mary, full of compassion, I recommend to thy mercy my soul and my body, my thoughts, my works, my life and my death. O oh, my lady, help me and make me strong against the snares of the devil. Obtain for me a true and perfect love, with which I may love with all my heart thy most beloved Son, and my Lord Jesus Christ. And after him may I love thee above all things. O oh, my queen and mother, with thy most powerful intercession, make this love to remain with me until death, after which I may be conducted by thee to the country of the blessed. Prayer of St. Blosius to the Blessed Virgin Hail Mary, hope of the despairing, help of the destitute, to whom thy son pays so great honor, that whatever thou dost ask, thou dost at once obtain. Whatever thou dost wish is at once done. To thee are committed the treasures of the celestial kingdom. Grant, O Lady, that amid the storms of this life, I may always turn my eyes to thee. To thy mercy I commend my soul and my body. Direct and protect me at every hour and at every moment, O my sweet protectress. Another Prayer Hail, most compassionate Mother of Mercy, hail consolation and pardon, Mary most desired. Who shall not love thee? Thou our light in doubt, our consolation in sorrow, our relief in distress, our refuge in perils and temptations. Thou, after thy only begotten Son, art our secure salvation. Blessed are those who love thee, O Lady. Incline, I pray thee, thy ear of mercy to the prayers of this thy servant, this miserable sinner, and dissipate the darkness of my vices by the rays of thy sanctity, that I may please thee. Ejaculations to the Most Holy Mary Mother of God, remember me, St. Francis Xavier. Virgin and Mother, make me always to remember thee. St. Philip Neri. Virgin Mary, Mother of God, pray to Jesus for me. The same saint. O Lady, obtain that Jesus may not cast me from him. St. Ephraim. O Mary, may my heart never cease to love thee, nor my tongue to praise thee. St. Bonaventure. O Lady, by the love which thou dost bear to Jesus, help me to love him. St. Bridget. O Mary, deign to make me thy servant. Blessed Jane of France. O Mary, I give myself wholly to thee. Do thou accept and preserve me. St. Mary Magdalene of Pazzi. O Lady, do not abandon me until death. Padre Spinelli. Hail Mary, my mother. Padre Francis Brancaccio. Holy Mary, my advocate, pray for me. Padre Sotorio Caputi. How sweet, O oh my mother, is thy name Mary. It gives me peace and so much pleasure that I wish always to repeat it. The most holy Mary revealed to a soul devoted to her that it pleased her much to be honored by her servants with the following devotions. I thank thee, O oh eternal Father, for the power given to Mary thy daughter. Our Father, hail Mary, glory be to God. I thank thee, O Eternal Son, for the wisdom given to Mary thy mother. Our Father, hail Mary, glory be to God. I thank thee, O Eternal Spirit, 
for the love given to Mary thy spouse. Our Father, hail Mary, glory be to God. To thee we cry, O Queen of Mercy, turn towards us, and let us behold thy dispensing favors, bestowing remedies, giving strength. Show us thy compassionate countenance, and we shall be safe. O Mistress of all things, Saint of saints, our strength and refuge, God, as it were, of the world, glory of heaven, except those who love thee. Hear us, for thy son honors thee and denies thee nothing. St. Bernard Come, hasten, O lady, and aid with thy mercy, thy most sinful servant, who invokes thee, and deliver him from the hands of the enemy. The same saint Who will not sigh to thee? With love and grief we sigh. How then shall we not sigh to thee, O solace of the miserable, refuge of outcasts, deliverer of captives? We are secure that if thou dost see our miseries, thy compassion will not be slow to relieve us. The same saint. O our lady and our advocate, recommend us to thy son. Obtain, O blessed one, by the grace thou hast merited, that he who did condescend with thy mediation to become a participator of our infirmity and misery may also by thy intercession make us to share in his blessedness and glory. The same saint. In thee I have placed the hope of my whole heart. St. John Damascene. It is not possible, O lady, that thou shouldest abandon him who places his hope in thee. St. Bernard. If thou dost only wish for our salvation, it will be impossible that we should not be saved. St. Anselm Hail, daughter of God the Father! Hail, mother of God the Son! Hail, spouse of God the Holy Ghost! Hail, temple of the Holy Trinity! Simon Garcia O Virgin, how beautiful thou art! The mother of my God, my heart is enamored with thy goodness. Thanks be to God and to Mary! May all things be to the eternal glory of the Most Holy Trinity and of the Immaculate Mary. Live always, Jesus our love, and Mary our hope, with Joseph and Teresa our advocates. Acclamations in Praise of Mary O Most Holy Virgin, O Queen of Angels, how complete and perfect heaven has created thee! O oh, that I might appear in the eyes of God, as thou dost appear to me! Thou art so beautiful and lovely, that with thy beauty thou dost ravish hearts. When thou dost appear, everything appears deformed, every beauty is eclipsed, every grace disappears, precisely as the stars disappear at the rising of the sun. Thy great servant, St. John Damascene, contemplated thee, and when he saw thee so lovely, it appeared to him, thou hast taken the flower and the best of every creature, and therefore he called thee, the comeliness of nature, naturae venustatem, the grace and comeliness of all creatures. St. Augustine, the brightest light of the doctors, gazed on thee, and thou didst appear to him so beautiful and lovely, that he called thee the form and countenance of God, and it did not seem to him adulation. Thou art worthy of being called the form of God. Si forma dei, te appella digna, existis. Thy devout servant, Albertus Magnus, contemplated thee, and it seemed to him that all the graces and gifts that were found in the most celebrated women of the ancient dispensation were all surpassed in thee. The golden mouth of Sarah, when with thy smile thou makest heaven and earth joyful. The tender and sweet glance of the fruitful Leah, with which thou dost soften the heart of God, inexorable to sinners. The splendor of the countenance of the beautiful Rachel, as thou dost obscure the sun by thy radiant beauty. The grace and the comeliness of the discreet Abigail, with which thou dost appease the wrath of an angry God. The fire and strength of the brave Judith, when thou dost powerfully and graciously subdue the proudest hearts. In a word, sovereign princess, from the vast ocean of thy beauty flow forth, like streams, the beauty and grace of all creatures, the sea learned to curl its waves and wave its crystals from the golden locks of thy head, which, curling gracefully, floated upon thy shoulders and ivory neck. The crystal fountains and their clear depths learn their quiet and steady flow from the serenity of thy beautiful brow and thy placid countenance. 
The graceful bow, when it is most beautiful, has carefully learned from thy eyebrow to arch itself gracefully, that it may better dart forth its rays of light. The morning Diane and the gentle Hesperus are flashes from thy radiant eyes. The white lily and the ruddy rose have stolen their colors from thy cheeks. The envious purple and coral sigh for the ruby of thy lips. The purest milk and sweetest honey are distillations from the sweet honeycomb of thy mouth. The odorous jasmine and the fragrant rose of Damascus have stolen their perfumes from thy breath. The loftiest cedar and the finest and most erect cypress esteem themselves happy when they see that they are the image of thy straight and lofty neck, and the palm tree enviously, and in emulation imitates thy stately stature. And thus, O lady, every created beauty is the shadow and copy of thy beauty. Therefore I do not wonder, O sovereign princess, that heaven and earth are placed under thy feet, for they are so small and thou so great, that when thy feet only rest upon them, they are enriched, and they deem themselves happy and blessed when they can kiss them. So the moon, when St. John the Evangelist saw her at thy feet, and the splendor of the sun was increased, when thou didst clothe thyself with his rays. The evangelist, blinded by the greatness of thy light, was lost in wonder, and beside himself, at the sight of so stupendous a miracle of beauty, in which the beauty of heaven and earth was contained, and he said, And there appeared a great sign in heaven, Signum magnum appiruit in celo. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, that amazed the angels and terrified the earth, and that miracle was a woman clothed from head to foot with light and splendor, whom the resplendent son chose for his mother, and he placed himself in her womb, and to her the fair moon serves as a robe encircled with silver, and innumerable stars crown her temples, and are emulous of encircling her locks, and adorn her head with a wreath of precious gems, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Et in capite eus, Corona duodecim stellarum. And thus the saints, O most sacred virgin, marveling at so great splendor, which surpasses the brightness of the sun, and the graceful loveliness of the moon, though they be the perfect flower and ideal of all beauty, and considering the acclamations that burst forth from the heavens, never cease to admire thy beauty, and do nothing but exclaim and extol thee also, with acclamations of wonder and amazement. St. Peter Damien, paying to thee his homage, says, O holy and most holy of all the saints, and the richest treasure of all sanctity. And St. Bernard, O admirable virgin, O woman, the glory of all other women, the best and greatest that the world has ever possessed. St. Epiphanius, O heaven, more vast and extended than the Empyrean, virgin truly full of grace. And the Catholic Church, in the name of all, sings, O most clement, most merciful, O always sweet Virgin Mary, and I also, O heavenly princess, with thy leave, although I am the least of thy servants, I also wish to make my acclamations of wonder and amazement. O gracious and beautiful heaven, more vast than the Empyrean, since in this the immensity of God is not contained, but he was even concealed in thy womb. O greatest treasure, in which was deposited the most rich jewel of our redemption. O mother of sinners, beneath thy mantle we are protected. O consolation of the world, in whom all the afflicted, infirm and disconsolate, find comfort. O beautiful eyes that ravish hearts. O coral lips that take souls captive. O beneficent hands, filled with hyacinths, that are always dispensing graces. O pure creature, who dost appear so like God, and whom I should have esteemed God, if faith had not taught me that thou art not God, although thou hast the splendor, and I know not what, of supreme deity. O great lady, empress of heaven, enjoy for a thousand eternities the grandeur of thy state, the immensity of thy graces, and the felicity of thy glory. Only I supplicate thee, O compassionate mother, that thou wilt not forget us, who beg to be thy servants and children. And because thou art the depositary of all graces, and the best and most privileged of all created things, obtain for us thy servants, O lady, that we may be favored far more than any others in the world. And may all the world know that the dear children of Mary 
are the best of heaven and earth, the beloved children who are tenderly cared for, and enjoy the best that such a mother has to give, the well-beloved, who are caressed in the bosom of the queen of heaven, and are doubly favored and doubly caressed by thy majesty. Thus I hope, O most beautiful Rachel, and thus I trust thou wilt do, O sovereign princess, in the name of what thou art, do it, for all heaven prostrate at thy feet, is supplicating and praying thee for this. Consent, utter but one loving fiat, 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 be it done, be it done. O oh man, what art thou doing? How dost thou love the creatures of the earth, deceitful and lying creatures, who betray and make thee lose thy soul and body, paradise and God? And why not love Mary, the most loving, the most amiable, the most faithful, who, after enriching thee with consolations and graces in this life, will obtain for thee, from her divine Son, the eternal glory of paradise? O oh Mary, Mary, beautiful above all creatures, lovely next to Jesus, above all loves, dearer than all created things, more graceful than all graces, have pity on my miserable heart, miserable because it ought to love thee, and does not love thee, thou canst kindle it with thy holy love, turn, O Mary, thy loving eyes upon me, look upon me, draw me to thyself, and obtain that, next to God, I may love none but thee, O most gracious, most amiable Mary, mother of Jesus, and my mother. End of section 57. End of The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri.